Oh, I see. Okay. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Okay, so welcome back everyone. So today the first uh, speaker of the day is a uh, professor um, Jurek Lewandowski from Warsaw University and he will tell us about uh, Yang-Mills theory of the conformal Cartan connection. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, let me express how much I like this environment and this fantastic institute. Uh, this is the, uh, this uh, uh, title is a little discouraging because you may think, why should I consider some young Mills theory for some Cartan connection? Uh, however, one could formulate this lecture in, in, in opposite order. So we could just start from gravity and consider <coughs> conformal transformations that in the case of asymptotically de Sitter space-time we have to make in order to describe the, the sky. And then we could, uh, uh, and then I could tell you in what way we can, uh, in what way we can write the action for gravitational field such that it's still equivalent to the Hilbert Einstein action. However, it gives a nice behavior on the sky. So if we read my transparencies backwards, in time, then we will see this <laughs> this uh, uh, message. So don't be impatient, impatient if you at the beginning if you see some some completely irrelevant geometry, which which is not uh, doesn't seem to lead anywhere. Uh, okay, so I will first in tell you what are Cartan connections. Uh, next, I will introduce the Cartan connection which we define for conformal geometry. And uh, uh, then we will uh, focus on four-dimensional space-time case and on a certain equation which is, a, uh, which is the conformal condition, conformal invariant condition for Einstein equations to be satisfied. And Finally, we will apply this framework uh, and calculate uh, sort of new currents and new symplectic potential. However, it's still within the, the allowed ambiguities which we, which we know uh, for gravitational field. Okay, so now, it, uh, this talk is not about principal fiber bundles. We will very quickly go back to space-time and work on space-time as all relativities. However, if any of you uh, happens to, to, to know about principal fiber bundles, this will be very helpful to, to understand. However, if it's not helpful, then just wait two, trans two slides and, and those bundles will, will disappear. Okay, so uh, uh, now, Cartan uh, we are used to, to regular connections. And Cartan connection is, is a little different different structure, although <coughs> although very similar. So uh, for Cartan connection, we need a principal fiber bundle. Uh, however, now we need two Lie groups. One is the structure group of the principal fiber bundle. And the other group is a bigger group, which contains the structure group, such that the dimension of this bigger group equals the dimension of the principal fiber bundle. Uh, maybe let me start from example. 
So the simplest example, that, because actually this was the way Cartan defined his structures. He first started with some trivial example, and then he would ask, how can we generalize it? So the trivial example is the following. Consider, uh, let, consider just a Lie group, a closed subgroup, and the corresponding principal fiber bundle. Now on the group, we have the maurer cartan form, and we know that the maurer cartan form uh, satisfies, satisfies this equation dA plus A wedge A equals zero. That just, just identity. So the idea is, ah, okay, so we have, so, so A is the Cartan connection. Well, it happens to be flat, F is zero, but let us generalize it in such a way that, uh, that we admit also cases when F is not zero. So here is the generalization. So uh, on P, we consider a one form which takes values in this al Lie algebra of this bigger group. Uh, the first condition is the same as for the, the usual connection, which means that if we consider on this um, uh, principal fiber bundle, we have the action of, of uh, structure groups. So, so in particular, every generator of the group here generates a vector field. And now we want this connection to map those vector fields to the corresponding generators in the Lie group, so in the Lie algebra. So, so it acts like, in a sense, identity for, uh, for, for, for those vector fields. Uh, well, it transforms also as connection should transform. So if we uh, 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 use the right action of the, of the structure group uh, on this bundle, then it transforms according to the adjoint representation. And here is the difference. The difference is that this one form is a it defines a one-to-one -one map between the space tangent to the bundle and the space tangent to the group, to this bigger group G. So this is departure from the uh, uh, definition of the usual, uh, what we usually call a connection. So it doesn't define horizontal spaces. Instead, it defines this one-to-one -one map between a tangent vector, a vector's tangent to a bundle and vector's tangent to the group. Uh, for this kind of one form, we can also define a curvature. And the curvature has nice, uh, nice properties. Namely, it also transforms according to this tra uh, adjoint representation uh, when we act with, um, with the structure group. And it is also uh, horizontal in the sense that contracted with direction generated by the action of the group, it is zero. So due to this property, if we consider, we'll next consider slices, uh, local sections of the bundle, well, uh, up, up on the local section, this curvature defines an object which transforms in a nice way in, in the base of the, of the manifold. Uh, so what, what are examples? So the examples which are known when you learn, uh, learn geometry is uh, a fine connection. So for <clears throat> a fine connection, as a smaller group, we take the group of just linear transformations in n-dimensional space, and we consider the bundle of frames. So this is the usual the quite familiar starting point even for relativists. And then the bigger group is the group of linear transformations extended for translations in the tangent space. Uh, so this is group of affine transformations. And, and then we define here, I'm not bringing up in details the definition of this, of this Cartan connection. However, we define this Cartan connection in such a way that it encodes information both n about n uh, torsion of the connection and about the curvature. We can do something similar, replacing the, uh, the bundle of frames by bundle of orthonormal frames. 
And then one of the groups is just the groups of orthonormal transformations. It can be also Lorentz transformations for some for, for <coughs> suitable P and Q. And then the bigger group G is the group of all the uh, uh, Poincaré transformations of symmetries of the tangent space, in this case endowed with metric tensor. And well, again, this uh, uh, corresponding Cartan connection encodes both uh, the, the metric connection, the Levi-Civita connection, if, I, I mean, uh, uh, not Levi-Civita necessarily, it encodes the, 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 metri the metric connection and torsion. And very often in physics, this connection is called Witten connection because I think this is the connection Witten used some long time ago to quantize two plus one, two plus one gravity. Okay, so what about our case? In our case, I could tell you what the group is, but it would be a little confusing, so maybe I will explain first what is, um, um, uh, heuristically, what is the motivation. So uh, the motivation uh, before, uh, the motivation for this, oh, maybe I go, go to the other manifold. So the motivation is the following. Consider our, a manifold with and a conformal class of metrics which have some signature P, P and Q. And now the idea is let us uh, think of this space as sections of a nalcon in some two more dimensional space time. So introduce now a space time which has signature P plus one, Q plus one. But however, importantly, I'm not introducing the space time. Just, just imagine that, that I introduce that space time. And then think of a null cone in that space time and sections of this null cone. So each section in this null cone, so the construction is designed in such a way that in each section in this null cone has a induced, has, indu has metric tensor, which is one of the uh, representatives of this, of this uh, conformal class. So if I change a section, then I obtain a different representative. So of course, this space time, this ambient space time is not uh, arbitrary. It has to have this property. Uh, well, the best example would be if, if this was two dimensional space and this was four-dimensional Minkowski space-time, then, then it would be all true. Uh, it's also true if, if we uh, define, for, for in general case, this, this uh, uh, ambient space-time has to be uh, uh, suitably flat in some sense for this, for this to be true. Okay, so now what are groups which now are relevant? So one of the groups is just group of P, so group of orthonormal transformations of this uh, metric here. On the other hand here, we have group of P plus one, Q plus one. So this will be our groups for our Cartan connection. Just a question, so, so you need these light cones to be there and you want to be able to do this light cone. Do I need what? You need light cone, space time with light cones. Yes. Where you can do the slicing yes. in a consistent way. Mm. But uh, you said to me it has to be, uh, I didn't understand why you said it has to be approximately flat. Because, I mean, is, is it enough just to have good causality properties or you don't want there to be caustic? Well, if we, if we it? consider, uh, yeah, both. <laughs> if, if we consider a generic null uh, uh, cone, then, then first, as you said, it develops caustics. And secondly, sections may not be conformally equivalent to each other because we have shear. Uh, so, uh, so, so this has to be, this ambient space time has to be constructed in such a way that, that there is only expansion and there is no, no shear. And, and people do it. So um, Pfefferman and Graham, they really construct such space times and this is an alternative approach. But Cartan, who was before them, he, he didn't use this, he, he just used this uh, heuristically, so, so now let us see what other structures would be available here. On one hand, 
Okay, so now if I take a point here, I can consider here some null frame, which, which uh, uh, okay, I can consider here well now autonormal frame uh, theta one theta n, and here I can lift this frame, but I need additionally uh, one one more element which corresponds to this null vector, so this element is called here phi. So this would be an, an e, a dx a. So in addition, I have some, uh, here I add one, one more, one form i. On the other hand, and also here I have some, some null, uh, some null direction. direction. one up to theta n, that little n yeah, is people's Yeah, this n is the, is, 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 yeah, yes, this is n. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I can call it, okay. Uh, yeah, so, so what we would do is we would now uh, uh, have here a null, null, uh, null frame in this p plus one, q plus one geometry that would consist of <coughs> pullback of this orthonormal frame from here, and additionally one, one form which corresponds to the transversal null vector. And we have one more vector, however, the one form corresponding to this vector pulled back to the uh, null surface is zero. So for this reason, we don't see it. However, we are aware of this vector. So, so that would be the structures, extra structures that would come. And then, of course, there would be also this, uh, this n plus two, uh, connection of this of this bigger space time. So our Cartan connection morally is this connection. We, we, we construct this connection without introducing the Abbeyan space time. We only introduce this null cone, you will see in what way, and we don't embed this null cone in anything, but having in mind this intuition, we, we, we construct on this null cone this uh, Cartan connection. So, so that was only illustration. Don't take it too literally. I mean, you don't have to take it too, too, too literally. Okay. So, okay. So now, what is this null cone? So mathematically, we can construct this null cone in a bit formal way. So this null cone is the so the first direction is the scale of this matrix. So at every point. We have scale, and the scale defines to us fifth, fifth dimension. So in other words, for every point of our manifold, we consider all the, uh, at this point, metric tensors obtained by which, which belong to the uh, uh, conformal class. So this is one dimensional, uh, extra one, dim yeah, one dimensional space. And we have projection. Uh, so we we can now uh, co on this space, so on this n plus one dimensional space, we consider a frame which is defined more or less along this, which means we consider pullback of uh, okay. But but before we do it, we, we we introduce one more. We introduce this null vector. So consider uh, this um, consider th this tra transformation. Uh, Okay, let me follow the nice slide. I, although I would like to to say to say quicker. So we, of course, we have here downstairs on this space M, we have our uh, we have representatives of our um, of our conformal class. So for every point on S, I have exactly the one corresponding representative. So I can take the pullback of this representative to S, and in this way, at every point of S. I have this degenerate metric tensor exactly in the same way as an, as an alcon. Now, we can consider the vector which generates rescaling. So if we rescale metric by a constant C squared, then 
we can calculate the corresponding the vector. So then we move to a different point and the corresponding uh, vector field is this null vector field which 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 which, which, which which is, which is, so in this way we have a distinguished null vector field on such cone. Uh, okay, and now we, we do uh, this, uh, we, we endow in our uh, null space with um, frames. Like? Just a quick question. You're allowing all kinds of signature here? Yes. Um, so we know that when you don't have exactly minus plus plus, but you have two time directions, the structure of that light cone is no longer conical like that. So, you know, here you're talking about these sections. So you know, the light cone can have a very weird kind of, there's no past and future light cone in other signatures. So I'm just I'm just wondering, is it just for generality, or is it specifically that you've handled those other signature space times? Well, certainly, what I'm doing. Well, well, okay, certainly, it w in what I'm doing here, still this this null direction is distinguished. So I'm here. I'm constructing this um, this space of scales. So so it's not like. Uh, um, some, some, so, 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 if you started with null surface and there were more than one null direction, then, then, then you could say there's ambiguity. But here, I start, I, I construct this null surface together with this distinguished null vector. So, if there are other distinguished null vectors, that's, that, 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 that's okay. Uh, It's the flat space. The I mean the uh, the full space time that uh, is is the uh, uh, Minkowski space time. So and if I use the Newtonian moment Penrose, then this n will be uh, the standard n and the xi will be l, something like this. If this is Minkowski space time, then this would be uh, just a regular cone in the Minkowski space time. And and what is the question? L and N are these two vectors, xi and N? Uh, yes, then L would be this vector tangent to the... And this H, uh, H group will be the oh, little group? Oh, always. In, yes, this H group, in, in any case, is the group preserving this null direction. Yes, so this is exactly what we do when we, uh, uh, at least when we have this distinguished <laughs> null vector on, on null surface. Okay, so on this uh, on this uh, space of scales, we introduce a frame which consists of pullback of of uh, of the frame from from the base manifold and this extra uh, one form which corresponds to transversal null vector. And the structure group is uh, so our big group is the group of orthonormal transformation of uh, which, which we adopt. So this is the moment when we adopt group from this picture, which, 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 which is group of orthonormal transformations in P plus one, Q plus one uh, signature. And our structure group is the group of transformations uh, which preserve this null direction. So what, what, what does this group consist of? It consists just of orthonormal transformations in the in this original manifold in this n-dimensional space-time. It consists of conformal rescalings of metric tensor in uh, this um, original space-time, and also there is additional degree of freedom which which are transformations of this vector of this one form phi <clears throat> the only condition this one form phi satisfies is that it's normalized such that uh, contracted with the null vector distinguished null vector it gives minus one so this is also something we are used to uh, when we do uh, null uh, geometries and uh, and and this is the transformation of this group of this one form 
pi. So when we act with those transformations, when we act with lambda, we just rotate in the uh, generalized sense of the orthonormal frame of n-dimensional manifold. When we act with this, then we rescale. Of course, we rescale by some function. Those transformations are point dependent. And when we ask with this kind of transformation, we, we just transform this one form phi, this, uh, this uh, transversal now vector. So in this way, we, uh, you see the counting agrees. We have now this bigger group, which has the same dimension as, as the bundle of frames. And the smaller group is the group, is group generated generated by this. So this is our, uh, our uh, uh, bundle on which next we introduce the Cartan connection. And uh, now con construction of the Cartan connection is, the idea is that we impose some conditions which we, uh, which we think that can be imposed. And then at some point, uh, those conditions uniquely define the only connection that satisfies such conditions. This is the, the usual way Cartan con constructed various, various <coughs> natural structures. So uh, by analogy with the affine connection, we uh, assume that our connection, that the upper row will be just the, the frame. And so by symmetry, the, the right, rightmost column. And we also want the curvature to have many zeros. And this term corresponding, this block corresponding to the, to the, to the base manifold uh, of curvature, we, we want to, 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 to be traceless, J just this. And of course, later it, it turns out this is the vial tensor and, 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 and so on. Okay, but now what is what is advantage? Now we will slowly go back to Earth, to, to our space. If we now consider a section of this of this bundle and and consider the pullback, so so, so what we the, the the connections we deal with when we do physics, they are not defined on bundles, they are just defined on our space time, which means we pull them back by, by some section or, or choose some gauge. And then those object, objects which are pulled back, they satisfy the following, they have the following transformation property. So A transforms as a gauge field. The catch is that H takes values in a group smaller than, than the Lie algebra in which A takes values. But other than that, this, this is still true. And the curvature transforms in this way. So now let us see how it, uh, right, okay. Uh, we can also get rid of this one form phi. So everybody knows that on, that on this, when we do, when we are on a null, on a null uh, surface, we can always choose, uh, we can always choose n to be orthogonal to slices. So we can choose n such that, such that the pullback of, of such that this n is, is, is orthogonal to, to slices, to a given slice, and then it amounts to just setting phi to zero. So in this way, this additional phi, phi disappears if we want and we put, can, gauge this part of the, this corner of the connection to be, to be zero. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you project this, uh, Connection from or the, the curvature from the bundle down to the space-time manifold. This gives just a vial tensor, I suppose, or is it some other tensor. I, I, but I, is the, the, this the, seems very similar to the construct 
for this Penrose construction of the um, twister parallel transport, yes, whose yes. curvature is, is just the vinyl tensor. So is this kind of a bundle version? Yeah, let us wait one slide and we will we'll see. Yeah, but you're, you're right. It's, it's exactly, it's exactly what, what you're saying. Uh, no, no, just a probably stupid question. I, I'm, I'm confused. Mm -hmm. So you started out by saying that this G, uh, you know, the, say the dimension of just dimensions, dimension of G minus dimension of H was the dimension of the base space. Is that is that correct, or, or am I completely lost? Mm, yes. So, so when you say A, there are some indices which are there, which transform with H, and then there are some remaining indices which are like in the G minus H part, and those are part of your space-time manifold. Is is that the picture? No. 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 Okay. So, so those indices. So I need all the indices for H. Uh, I see. So, so H is not transformation of some, it, it's not reducible to some, at least written in this way. So I need all the indices of, for H. Okay, and then it is living on space time. This is some extra, so, 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 uh, so the. So that was, uh, the second. Um, I mean, he, he, what he, is the role of G and this, yeah. this? This answers your question. This yeah. is H, okay? So yes. as long as I do only rotation of, in my base manifold, then indeed I need only indices in the base manifold. But if I want to conformally rescale, then I use this extra dimension. And also if I, and I also have this additional transformation here for which I need this. So, so you see those transformations are not all just, just, just here. Right, no, that, that mm -hmm. is fine. But, okay. but in the last line over there, so M okay. is a principal H bundle. Yes. So that means some of the structure of G is, is involved in defining M, right? M is your space time. Is, is that correct? Yes. M, M is the space time. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let us go down to Earth. And so, so those conditions uniquely define, define a, a one form. And now if we go down to Earth, you can now forget everything. If you didn't use principal fiber bundles before, then, then, then you, you can go back again uh, and, and to, to this uh, habit and, and not, not use them. Now we are, we are on our space time. We, we have some conformal class of metrics. So we introduce, we, we pick representative. We introduce orthonormal frame, orthonormal frame, uh, theta, and for this, uh, so it should be written uh, somewhere that, that now metric is some fixed uh, set of constants, theta A, theta B, and for this frame we, we can define, we, we can calculate the Levi-Civita connection, we can, def we can calculate the Riemann uh, tensor, we can calculate the Ricci tensor, Ricci scalar, and we can construct such tensor, sensor which is probably called Scouten tensor, mo modulo maybe some minus, or maybe even without minus, this is the Scouten tensor. And from Scouten tensor, we construct a one form like this. And now we can collect our uh, those tensors in the following, in, in such a matrix. So for this block, intrinsic block, we just take Levi-Civita connection, one forms, and here we set theta with lowered index. Index is lowered by this, by those, this constant matrix eta, and for this column we again take theta, and this we calculate what it is, and it turns out to be the Scouten tensor. And now, indeed, Wolfgang was right. Roger defined using spinors, defined very similar connection, where actually this is this connection rewritten in spinor representation. So for gamma, we have the, the, the spinorial uh, connection, that, and for P, we have the same tensor, but just decomposed in terms of spinors. And uh, well, we should ask Roger whether he realized or not that that was the same as uh, the, the normal conformal Cartan connection. The person who noticed this 
was Merkulov. That was some uh, mathematician of Russian origin who, who uh, worked on Penrose transform and, and all various applications of twisters. And he also noticed, that was the first to notice that this is the same, uh, the same thing. Now, but uh, as I promised, we forget the bundles. If we forget the bundles, then, then we can, we can using our autonomous frame, we can construct those tensors and we can just think of such matrix of one forms. And then we can, what is guaranteed by this, uh, uh, by this theory is that if we now perform uh, orthonormal transformation, then this matrix transforms just according to those, to, to, to this block diagonal way. Uh, however, also if we perform a conformal transformation, if we multiply our frame by a function, then again, still this one form has this uh, uh, nice transformation property. However, this uh, transformation matrix, it is, well, it's a bit, bit complicated, but, but, but still this is true. So what is more important, even more important is that, I mean, is, is that curvature has even simpler transformation law. So now what is curvature? Curvature consists of the vial tensor inside. So here I use this notation that given vial tensor, I turn it into a two form, which has extra two indices. So this is a two form, which takes values in very algebra. Uh, and here we have the covariant derivative of the Scouten tensor, which, which is just, just this. It has something to do with cotton tensor. And uh, the transformation law for F is this. And F satisfies also, also, uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so for, for Lorentz transformations, this is, this is obvious, but, but it also satisfies this transformation property for conformal transformation. So it transforms in a, in a nice, nice way. Mm -hmm. So on top of uh, internal Lorentz transformations and conformal transformations, you also have this shift symmetry as, uh, that corresponds to yeah, this changing is K in this ambient space. So yeah, yeah, this is something which I, which I didn't which I, I didn't find application for this, but, but, th but they are there. For the but time being, I gauge them away, but, but may, they may be used for something, if you want. But they're not like diffuse on the base manifold. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> I, I uh, because there's now a ve uh, yeah, corresponding gauge transformations mm -hmm. on the... Yeah, yeah I agree that they, they, they have something to do with translations in this tangent space. So, so okay, they could be... They, 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 yeah, maybe. I, mm -hmm. Sorry, just to, just to understand. So if I take ADS, say D-dimensional ADS, and I can think of it as embedded in a space of what? Mm -hmm. meters higher, and then, uh, so the example is given the capital A, where there is this lambda and this omega acting on the, on the base manifold, mm -hmm. and then you have the scaling transformations, and this other one, which is like sets of conformal transformations in that context, the, the ones where you have this octagon, just to, is that, is that useful way to think of it? I'm not, so, so, so in our case, we, we embed in space time, which is, um, which has two more dimensions. Okay. That, and in case true. of, of boundary of, of okay. ADS, this is, so, so it's a little, so it's a little different. It's not, not boundary. I was saying that ADS can be embedded in, uh, in yeah. a hyperboloid in a, in a flat system with one extra time delay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but then, then oh, you're saying you have to add here. Yeah, so then it would be it would be similar. And then the then the capital H you wrote like some slides back, uh, in where Madhavan asked the question, where the third entry was like special conformal transformation is what I was wondering. Yeah, the, what was again? Uh, the the your your H capital H, you had like some transformations which only acted on the base manifold, and you had one one which was scaling, mm -hmm. and the third one which was which had some octagonal entry. Is like is it in that context it is the special conformal. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. In this, yeah, this is always this model model case when we consider this is the flat case. Yeah. 
this, this, this high symmetric case, yes, and in that case, <clears throat> those transformations, they, they, they would correspond to, to the other um, transformations preserving the, in this, in this Abian space. Yes, thank you, that, that, that was a, a good question. And now, uh, uh, this uh, F just for free satisfies the Bianchi identity, and Bianchi identity encodes some well-known identities satisfied by the Valle tensor and the Skull tensor. Okay, so, so this was the, uh, this, this, this sort of kinematical part. But now let us go to four dimensions. And in four dimensions, we have one more conformal structure that we can, uh, that we can associate to, to, to conformal geometry, namely the Hodge dual. So we can always consider for every two form a Hodge dual and then this operation is, is co uh, conformally co <coughs> invariant. So we can also write the Young Mills equation. We can, we can take our, our connection F, our uh, connection, ca calculate the curvature and now calculate the dual and apply the covariant derivative and ask what is this? What if F satisfied the Young Mills equation. So it turns out that if we do this calculation, we have a lot of zeros except for this column and this row, and this B is just the Bach tensor. So, uh, and apparently the Bach tensor is, is known in, in relativity. W what it is known from? Well, first, you can see that if we consider uh, Einstein space-time, then, then, then um, uh, if we consider Einstein space-time, then this term will vanish because P will be proportional to the metric tensor, and here we have contraction, so since this is traceless, tra it will be zero, and also the covariant derivative of P is zero. So Bach tensor vanishes for every solution to the Einstein equations with cosmological constants. And at the same time, it's, top, it's conformally invariant. So, so this is a conformally invariant condition for Einstein tensor to be satisfied. However, it's not, it's not a sufficient condition. There is, one can construct, one can construct counter examples. Uh, however, however, in one, di in one uh, uh, direction, this implication is true that whenever we we, we have a Einstein space-time, then we have, then our space-time also satisfies, uh, satisfies Bach equation, so this F satisfies the young Mills equation. Actually, that was also noticed by Mirkulov, this fact that the vanishing of the Bach tensor is just the... Is this, this proof with the connection includes the torsion tensor? I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but you can always I mean, you can always consider connection which, given metric tensor, you can always use connection which is torsion free. So, so um, but if, if you wish to introduce torsion, then, then I don't know. Okay, so uh, th there is a special example. I will just, maybe I, I, don't, I don't have much time. How much time do I have? Uh, 20 minutes. Ah, okay, so I can, I can mention uh, because it has also something to do with this, whether this condition is, is uh, uh, sufficient or not. It's not sufficient. Okay, so given a connection, you can always uh, 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 talk about holonomy, and you can, you can in particular consider cases when holonomy is reduced to some subgroup. So in, in the case of this uh, Cartan connection, clearly, if Einstein equations are, if, vacu if, if vacuum Einstein equations are satisfied, then we can see that we have zeros here and zeros here, so some reduction takes place. So this is one case when, when holonomy is reduced, and, in, and actually then you can, so one-to-one -one correspondence, you can say that, that we, we just consider geometries of reduced holonomy, and then, but, but of course this is, a, so, so then it's, it's conformally Einstein, because here everything is conformally covariant. However, there can be a different, uh, a different uh, a degeneration, namely uh, here we have, we have this, this group, so consider Lorentz, 
so, so we have Lorentz transformations. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, this bigger group is O two four, but spinorially it, it can be also uh, it also corresponds to uh, to S two two, and we can ask what if if uh, if the if if A takes values in S U one two, which is which is a reduced reduced case, <clears throat> and we have such uh, such an example. So it turns out that in that case, uh, our space time admits a null conformal killing vector, which is also the uh, eigenvector of the Weyl tensor. So the Weyl tensor is of the type n, and if psi is in addition twisting then the space time is known by mathematicians it was introduced by Pfefferman. on the other hand from our point of view from the point of view of friends of Roger Penrose Penrose this uh, space time admits solution to the twister equation and and this covariantly constant local twister it it, it reduces the holonomy from from SU22 to from SU12 so I noticed that fact some long time ago when I learned about all this stuff. And for those Pfefferman metrics, you can also construct examples when the Bach tensor vanishes, but Einstein equations, but, but, but this metric tensor is not uh, conformally Einstein. So, so then you can <coughs> see example that, 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 it, that this condition of vanishing of Bach tensor is not sufficient. Actually, I think it's the only a known example. Okay, so now let us turn to symplectic to the to the application. Okay, so let us let me first. Th this was already introduced by by Mark. So um, so by Lagra like I will consider Lagrangian as a density differential form of 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 as a differential form of highest possible uh, rank. Now the variation of so so consider Lagrangian, which depends on on fields. The the variation of the Lagrangian becomes the part which gives us the uh, equations, the Euler-Lagrange equations, and exterior derivative of some one form. Uh, so if we assume the equations, then 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 this E is zero. We don't have to be assuming them. This one form. Theta is not defined uniquely. However, we consider this a symplectic potential current and minus one form. And from this, by taking second variation and anti-symmetrizing, we can construct a, a symplectic current. This is, <coughs> or symplectic density. To, 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 to define symplectic two form on phase space, we still would have to, to take integral of this and minus one form along some Cauchy surface. So, but, but we are we are not doing this. We consider only this form. And then we have the known ambiguities. We can add to theta some some uh, de derivative, and um, we can also uh, not changing the equations. We can add to to Lagrangian some boundary term or some exact term or or just pure divergence term and and actually the second, this transformation doesn't affect the equations, but it, uh, okay. It, it, so, so the second transformation doesn't affect the symplectic uh, form, the symplectic current, uh, omega, this, but this transformation does, uh, sorry, this transformation does affect the symplectic current. It, it, it adds some exact terms to the symplectic current. Why we like the symplectic current so much? Because if the field equations are satisfied, then this is an exact n minus one form. So it can be defined to it can be used to define some preserved quantities, and can be defined to used to define a Hilbert space of of quantum fields, which which are of one particle quantum fields which live in this space time. So this is a very very useful. Uh, object so now let us okay so since we have let us apply this this einstein's 
Einstein's thought that, that, that given hammer, let us look for a nail. So, so since we have this, this Cartan connection, let us construct Young-Mills potential from this, Young-Mills Lagrangian. And then uh, for Young-Mills Lagrangian, all those variations are known. Here the subtlety is that actually our A is not just arbitrary Young-Mills field. It is constructed in very careful way from, from normal uh, orthonormal frames. However, the same rules apply, and if we calculate variation of our Lagrangian, well, the subtle point is that we also, that this star also depends on our A. However, it only seemingly depends because <clears throat> if we go to the details and due to this identity which is satisfied by the vial tensor, so for vial tensor, it doesn't matter whether we take a Hodge dual with respect to the first pair of indices or second pair. So we can pass the, the vial, the Hodge star from second pair to the first pair, and then it becomes, it is expressed just by constants because we work in orthonormal frames. So, so we, so those constants, they don't, are not subject to, they don't depend on, on variations. So at the end of the day, we obtain the usual uh, form as for young mills field that this gives us equations equations of motion and this gives us the symplectic potential the same as for maxwell field or for young young mills field now if we work out the details then it turns out that the equations of motion uh, not surprisingly are give this bach equation and um, still the symplectic potential takes this form so we have the symplectic potential uh, Eric. Mm -hmm. So there's a subtle difference to Young-Mills because now the connection coefficient, there are now constraints between the connection coefficients A. Absolutely. Like gamma AB depends on. Yes, absolutely. On yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, yeah. However, what the, what the, what the, the only thing that we use is the following, that we, that we have the set of conformal geometries which satisfy which satisfy Bach equation. In, and in this set, we have a, a subset, which are those metric tensors which satisfy, satisfy Einstein equations. Sorry? This is... Okay, so this is Bach, and this this red is Einstein. Okay, and now whatever we define on the phase space for solutions to the Bach equation is automatically pulled back or reduced to the phase space of Einstein metrics, and if, due to the Bach equations, uh, some forms were, uh, were closed, then they continue to be closed for, in particular, for solutions to Einstein equations. So it means we constructed uh, 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 another candidate for symplectic potential, which also works for Einstein spacetimes, even though we didn't bring up Einstein, Einstein uh, action. So now, for this space of Einstein solutions, we have two proposals for symplectic potential. One, one the usual coming from Einstein-Hilbert action or from Azteca variables or whatever Lagrangian we choose. And the other one induced from those Bach flat space times. So you can guess that, that there should be some relation between one and another. So let us... However, what is, what, okay, but this is, uh, this is the way our conformally invariant potential, symplectic potential reads. And this is very important property that this potential is conformally invariant, which means if I rescale my frame by omega and correspondingly rescale variation of the frame, then 
the symplectic potential of this is the same as before rescaling. So <clears throat> now you can see that if I want, for instance, to consider conformal boundary and rescale metric tensor, then my symplectic potential will in smooth way pass to the, to the boundary because it's unsensitive on the, on the rescaling. Okay, so here I wrote what I ex explained here that we have <coughs> those uh, uh, the equations of our theory are by equals zero, but they contain solutions to the Einstein equations. So the general idea is to pull back the symplectic potential for the Bach flat spacetimes onto the phase space for, for Einstein uh, solutions to the Einstein equations and take advantage of the explicit conformal, conformal invariance. And still all the preservation laws also satisfy because, of, because, <coughs> because we are still in the space of, of solutions to, to this uh, young Mills like, uh, young Mills -like uh, uh, theory. Okay, so now let us see what, what is the symplectic potential. So let us start with observation <coughs> that our, our, uh, <coughs> our young Mills Lagrangian can be written as the Euler part. We, we can split it into Euler part plus something additional. And actually this additional Lagrangian was better known in the literature before we wrote this paper to, to, to generate the Bach Mm, equation, the Bach tensor. Um, and now if we consider that well, we can calculate the, the symplectic potential of the Euler uh, density. So not surprisingly, if we vary the, the Euler uh, form, then we don't obtain any equations. We obtain only uh, the symplectic potential, uh, which, which, which takes this form. Now, uh, on the other hand, when we vary the, when we take variation of the left-hand side, we obtain, we obtain our symplectic form. So now what is left is to obtain, calculate variation of this. So we calculate variation of this, we obtain the Bach uh, uh, tensor and some, one more symplectic potential. And now if we take everything together, then we find, <coughs> then we find the the following then we find okay so let, but, but let us go one one step step farther so we can also so we find some some relations between those two potentials but they are still valid for arbitrary bach flat space time but now let us go to einstein space time so if we reduce to this red invisible red sub sub, sub space of our bigger bach space then, uh, uh, okay, so let me recall uh, also quickly what do we do with Einstein-Hilbert action. So we write the Einstein-Hilbert action by using frames, like Palatini action. And then uh, we all know by heart, all people who, who work, uh, use, <coughs> work on Ashtaka variables know by heart that the form of the symplectic potential is this. And the final, final result is the following, that the symplectic potential of this conformal theory of the Cartan connection is reduced to the solutions of Einstein equations, but this is what, what we are interested in when we do Einstein theory, is the uh, symplectic potential coming from the topological theory, from, from, from the Euler term, minus this, uh, a coefficient times the symplectic potential of Einstein, of the Einstein theory. And notice that here we have cosmological constant. So if cosmological constant is zero, then our stuff is pretty useless, uh, or at least it's not so useful. On the other hand, when cosmological constant is not zero, then we can easily divide by cosmological constant, and then we can use this equation 
uh, to write the symplectic one form of Einstein Hilbert action as this conformally invariant one form and this one form which comes from topological theory so it is like 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 boundary term which you can uh, which we can uh, always add okay so 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 this is this is the the comparison between so in other words our the symplectic potential which we calculated is equivalent to the symplectic potential of einstein hilbert action uh, and the difference is that we added the topological we, we added the euler term to the action so what, what i'm saying now is that we can forget this conformally this bigger conformally invariant theory we can now just go back to einstein space times and ask what we did so from the point of view of einstein space times we just added to lagrangian this euler term and then we found that our well we, we can we can get rid of this coefficient by 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 by, by we can divide by this coefficient and then we'll find that the result is that instead of of einstein hilbert potential the, the, the usual we have we have a new potential which is equivalent however it's manifestly conformally invariant This is the symplectic potential density, right? Yes. I mean, so if you integrate on a Cauchy slice, then the integral of theta, the first term vanishes uh, because it's coming from Euler term or? No, it gives so-called boundary condition. So, so yes, so in, in ideal case, if, if it was a compact Cauchy surface, it, it vanishes. However, if, if we have some boundary, then it, it yeah. produces some boundary term. Okay. However, what is nice is that this potential is defined everywhere. So it's not like adding some one form only on, on boundary. It's, it's defined everywhere uh, in, in space time. So this uh, term of 1 over 4 uh, script key, that topological term in your Lagrangian density for the conformal Lagrangian scale, it looks like it turns time and turn. Uh, because it's exponential. Yeah, when, yeah, yes, whenever we take a churn, churn action and we calculate variation, then from ch churn number we obtain, churn Lagrangian we obtain uh, churn Simons Lagrangian on one, on, on three dimensional boundary. So, so this is the same as churn, right? Because on, on, in the case of, of yeah. this, of this algebra, as uh, 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 SO13, we have two invariant uh, uh, um, symmetric for uh, we have two invariant forms, and so we have two churn, uh, uh, two different definitions of a churn number, and 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 one of one of them is this. Another one would be if we just raise this index and 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 erase, and in both cases this is this is like adding. Like in Young Mills theory, adding the churn uh, term and then the, the variation of the churn term always gives the churn simul's term on the boundary. Yeah, so so it's true. It's 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 a more general general rule. Okay, so now let us very quickly uh, see. Okay, so now now what we do in terms? Let, let us very quickly see. So we know that that there are symmetries, and from symmetries we calculate. <clears throat> we calculate charges and and as I explained here the charges and and currents which we which we calculate from this potential are are equally good as, as those which we calculate for Einstein Hilbert but they may look differently <clears throat> so for diffeomorphisms we easily calculate this charge which becomes if we work out details it just becomes a psi contracted with Levi Civita connection and time, times star CBA. I don't know whether anybody considered such charge in, in gravity, but, but it looks very, very natural to us. So probably you, you can always also guess such. Um, for uh, for conformal rescaling, the charge is zero. For uh, 
Lorentz transformations, the charge is similar to this, but instead of this, we, we just have the generator of the Lorentz transformation. Okay, but now let us finally uh, 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 take advantage of all this uh, conformal invariance and let us do, let us see what happens if we consider, I'm sorry, there is a mistake here. There should be, there sh it should be rho to power n. So th there should be rho to power n g n i yot. So if we now consider uh, uh, space time, which is asymptotically the sitter, and if we write it in this way, when, where the, uh, where now instead of capital omega, we have, we have, we can think of this row as what previously was capital omega, then we obtain this kind of expansion, and the scry now corresponds to the vanishing of, of rho. And uh, however, we, 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 uh, so we could do either, we calculate this, so if we calculate the symplectic potential for this non-physical metric, then certainly it has to be finite. But it's also just equal to the symplectic potential on this, of this physical metric. So now we can do, do the calculation, and we find that our, uh, okay, so we do the calculation, and we obtain the, the following result, that if we uh, pull back our symplectic potential to scry, to, to where rho is zero, then it takes it, the familiar form uh, known for, for people working on scry, uh, well, here I'm talking about asymptotic de Sitter, but the same would be true for asymptotic anti de Sitter. You just have to, to use, uh, yes? Mm -hmm. Sorry? You have a zero uh, on top. Yeah. Uh, G I J zero in the superscript. No, in the next line. Uh, yeah. And downstairs you have a circle on top. Are these the boundary metrics? Uh, yes, so this is zeros orders. Uh, sorry that there is this row missing here. Already. So this zeros order expansion is, oh, used, is used later as a background metric. So it means that, okay, if we are physicists, then, then when we, we just know that we raise index and this is inverse metric, here I just, just for, for consistency, it was explained that, that with upper indices, this is just uh, raised. Uh, Yeah, yeah, this, this G is the same as, okay. as this G. I, I'm sorry for this. Yeah, yeah, later this, this G becomes distinguished as a background structure, so we, we just put this small circle. And, and <coughs> right, then the other Gs are also subject to some identities due to Einstein equations, and the first G which is free is this third order term. So we call it capital T, and it is known as holographic stress energy tensor, even though this is a vacuum case. So the pullback of our symplectic potential is this, and this is exactly what we obtain when we, well, modulo, modulo, the, the, modulo the constant here, when we, uh, when we renormalize, co consider renormalized uh, symplectic form by, by adding to, to uh, action this, uh, uh, this extra term here defined on, on only on the boundary, which makes this uh, uh, symplectic. So, so this is another way of making the symplectic potential finite. And when people do this, so this is what people usually do in literature, and then they obtain the symplectic form. We did what we did, and we obtained this symplectic form, but this difference in coefficient is just coming from the difference between the Lagrangians, so it is, so it is consistent. So it means that we can just uh, divide by this and, and obtain. So, so the conclusion is that we just obtained, obtained uh, for free this renormalized symplectic form without doing renormalization. Abai told me, Yesterday, that actually uh, already 20 years ago, he uh, he, uh, 
he had this similar, sim the same observation that if we replace, so this T is also related to the vial, vial tensor. Right, right. It, if, if we calculate what this T is, then it's, it's, it's rectic part of the vital tensor. And Abai just said that, 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 he, that he did it from, uh, from uh, always. That, that, that we can just, by looking at the usual symplectic potential, we can, we can rewrite it in terms of this vital tensor. And then we will see the same results. Yeah? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. But, but this, in, in here, we, 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 we see how it follows from from um, conformally invariant uh, theory of, of Cartan. Okay, so, so this is, um, yeah, here, here are those, those charges, but, but I'm afraid that, that I already, okay, I already told the summary, so <laughs> thank you. Yes, yeah, so maybe a quick question. Yes, yeah, since, uh, since you're exploring the analogy with gauge theories, it's mm -hmm. reasonable to ask if you can find cell dual solutions to that actually wrote namely the star f equal to x. That would give you a subset of these Bach tensor solving hmm. equations. Well, this, this, is, this is interesting. I, I didn't try, but if, so you mean that we should, in that case, huh? Yeah, but notice that, well, but in what sense of dual? In complex? It would be, have to be Euclidean, I think, to get real solutions. Yes, yeah. so in our case, this group, is always, it's never Euclidean, this bigger group. Because even if we start with Euclidean uh, four-dimensional space-time. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay, okay, no, no, I take it back. So we can start with Euclidean four-dimensional space-time, then we obtain this, this in this case, we, we, we obtain um, uh, 1015. However, the geometry is Euclidean, so we can consider 015 self-dual Young Mills, and your question is what it is. Yeah, your two form is, mm -hmm. is in four dimensions yeah. with values in... With some. values here, yeah, that's so true. You can ask I, don't know, I don't know what, what, what it is, but, but maybe it's something uh, <laughs> interesting. Thank you. Yeah, but it's a good, good question. Probably it has some nice answer. Yeah, maybe very quick, otherwise we move the questions to the discussion mm -hmm. because we're running late. Where is yeah, we so are just late. very quickly, how much of this construction relies on the Bach tensor being zero, or could you carry over part of the Cartan connection construction even if the Bach tensor was non-zero? Yeah, so, so uh, the, the, all the first part of the construction is, um, yeah, so this is the question how, uh, well, we, we don't have to, to assume uh, the, the, the field equations. We can also always use use uh, all this, uh, extend this symplectic formalism to, to bigger phase space uh, uh, of, of fields which don't satisfy the field equations. And then we still have those, those structures, but then they are not, they don't, then the, the balance uh, law is different because, because then, then the current is not, is not a, a closed form. So, so it's, a little different, but 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 here, well, it makes the best sense if Bach equation is satisfied, if the if the, the Bach tensor vanishes. Okay, let's thank Jurek again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll continue in the discussion session. Maybe we take a quick uh, five-minute break and uh, come back. <laughs> Start in Agata. Long break will happen. Long break Agati and Akana. I don't long break Agata, forty minutes continues. Sure. You know, break Agata, long break. Our time is Kagbandakana, Sandrela. Okay, let's resume. Okay, we continue now with Professor Fernando Barbero, um, who will tell us about configuration spaces for quantum gravity and QFTs. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, especially Madhavan and Sumati, for their invitation to participate in, the meet in this meeting. It's really a pleasure and a privilege to be here among so many good friends. Um, well, the title of the talk, as you see, is Configuration Spaces for Quantum Gravity and QFTs. More specifically, I will be talking about computation of Poisson brackets in, in field theories. The talk will be pedagogical. Um, the, the message of the talk is actually an invitation to try to build field theories in some very natural types of functional spaces because we are working. Uh, and uh, there is also some warnings regarding the, uh, the computation of Poisson brackets in field theories defined on manifolds with boundaries, okay? Uh, some parts of the talk may feel a little bit technical, but everything, absolutely everything that I will be saying today is quite elementary. So don't be frightened by the formulas, okay? Uh, well, uh, this, uh, what I will be talking about is work done in collaboration with these people, Eduardo Villasenor, Mar Vasquez, and Bogart Diaz, and I will give you the reference at the end. So just give me a quick summary. I will start with motivation, why, I'm, why we started looking at these kind of questions. I will say some things about the configuration uh, spaces of field theories and also about the phase spaces of field theories. I will discuss some details about the computation of Poisson brackets, which may be relevant in particular when you have boundaries, in spatial boundaries. I will also say some things about differentiability in, in, in this context. And I will actually give some concrete examples, simple examples, by using a very natural type of functional spaces, which are Sobolove spaces. In fact, I will be working with Hilbert Sobolove spaces, which are very particular ones with nice properties and nice structures. So actually, when we started looking at this thing, our, we were thinking about understanding some features of the holonomy flux algebra in loop quantum gravity. So uh, our motivation really has to do with loop quantum gravity, where you usually work with distributional objects. Uh, this, has, this, this has been well known for many years at this point. If you really want to understand what's going on with the holonomy flux holonomy algebra, you need to actually do some relatively subtle regularization procedure to understand, for example, how is it possible that the Poisson brackets of the fluxes is not zero, but something different from zero. Of course, this is perfectly well understood at this point. So, so our motivation was try to understand these issues, but of course, we, we realized that this is perfect from, from a different point of view, but we realized that this is perfectly okay. And one of the reasons was that if you did some straightforward computations, to check, for example, some violations of the uh, Jacobi identities, then you run into trouble. And when you think about it, uh, if you compute the, if, if you can't compute the Poisson brackets at all, the Jacobi identity will always hold. So that was something that, that we didn't understand. At some point, we, kick, we realized that if you want to do this thing, a, a way to do this thing with rigor is to take into account some functional analytic issues and Actually, I strongly believe that this may be the case for all field theories. Of course, if your functional space is something easy to understand, then this is also easy to do. If the functional space is more complicated, then it is really much harder. And as I have already said, this is, in this is important in particular when you have boundaries in, your, in the spatial manifold where you are defining your fields. Now, very quickly, and just to put some pictures before the, 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 transparent, the, the slides get too dry, so let me just tell you what the mechanical uh, the configuration space of a mechanical system is. So basically, a very neat geometric way of describing mechanics is that you have a finite dimensional system, say a double pendulum. You associate to that system a differential manifold. You can use that most of the time, so there are some pathological examples where you have slightly more complicated objects. And then you come from here to here. This is a concrete example with formulas. And of course, this is what you use to, to get this geometric, very clear, abstract, but very clear picture of the dynamics. Now, what about field theories? Well, 
field theory is uh, the usual attitude is that your configuration spaces are spaces of regular enough functions defined on some manifold. And the specification of what you mean by regular uh, very often reduces to saying that, well, the fields are as smooth as needed. For example, you, you need to plug them into the field equations, so at least they must be differentiable as many times as, uh, as you need to, to do that, okay? Now, when you, when you think about differential manifold point of view, of course, infinite dimensional manifolds are much more rich than finite dimensional manifolds. In the case of infinite dimensional manifolds, you have to specify extra things that you don't need to specify for finite dimensional manifolds. In particular, you can define Banham manifolds, and because in infinite dimensions you may have infinitely many inequivalent norms, you have to specify the norms. Same thing with Hilbert manifolds, you have to specify Hilbert products and things like that, okay? And sometimes this is not a matter of mathematical rigor. So one of the messages that we want to convey today is that in a specific examples, the structures that you put in here, for example, the scalar products, actually show up in concrete computations in a very clear way, okay? And uh, here uh, I will uh, concentrate mainly on the use of some of the spaces as configuration spaces and take advantage of the structure that you have there. Uh, Lagrangian formulation of field theories. Very quick slide to remind you how this thing works. So how do you define a field theory in the Lagrangian formulation? Then you choose, well, first of all, you choose a configuration space, the field, uh, a space of fields, which is interpreted as an infinite dimensional manifold. You consider its tangent bundle and define a real function on it, which is called the Lagrangian. Now you introduce a space of paths in this configuration space, for example, something like this. So these are paths parameterized by uh, parameter t, which takes values into one and two. They have some smoothness properties. This is a standard one, asking that they are twice differentiable. And you require that uh, the value of the, the, this curve at t1 is the, uh, the q1 configuration, and then at t2 is the q2 configuration. With the help of the Lagrangian, you define a real function in this space of field, uh, which is called the action, it takes this form, and of course, as we are wrong, you look for the stationary points of these, which are given by the only Lagrange equations, that this will give you the dynamics. Now, also very quickly, how do you go from the Lagrangian formulation to the Hamiltonian formulation? Well, you have this configuration space, you have the tangent bundle here, you have the same configuration space, you build the cotangent bundle here. Now, the way to go from the tangent bundle to the cotangent bundle, or phase space, is to introduce the definition of momenta, which is also called the fiber derivative. This is the standard thing, okay? So this takes points in the fiber here to points in the same fiber. In the phase space, the points in the cotangent bundle, you can think of them as uh, a base point and a, and a covector, and this covector is defined in this way, okay? Now, uh, there is an important uh, function in the, in TQ, in the, in, the, in the tangent bundle of the configuration space, which is the energy. It is defined in the usual way. And a nice feature of this energy is that if your Lagrangian is time independent, uh, all solutions of the euler Lagrange equations, this energy is constant, as we all know. And very quickly, how you can describe the dynamics in the cotangent bundle. In order to do that, you have to do three basic things. First of all, you introduce a real function in the phase space, which is in this way. If you look at the definition, it involves both the energy and the inverse of this fiber derivative. That means that if the fiber derivative is pathological in some sense, for example, if it is not invertible or if it is not a diffeomorphism, you will run into trouble. And that is what happens in singular systems, and in particular in gauge theories. Now, one of the nice things of working in the cotangent bundle is that it's a symplectic, uh, canonical uh, symplectic structure over there, canonical in the mathematical sense, something that you can build by using just what you have in here. You don't need to introduce any extra objects, okay? And then with the help of this canonical symplectic structure and the Lagrangian, uh, and the Hamiltonian, excuse me, you can define Hamil the Hamiltonian vector field associated with the, uh, a particular Hamiltonian. Basically, you have to solve this equation where this is the differential phase space and this is the interior product of the vector field and the uh, canonical symplectic form. 
once you have this Hamiltonian vector field, you take a point, you compute the integral curves coming through that, you project them onto the base manifold, the configuration space, and those are the di dynamical trajectories for your system. That's, that's, what the, that's what the dynamics is, and you can prove that this is equivalent to the lab dynamics that you get in the Lagrangian star. Now let me say some things about the canonical symplectic form, because this is relevant for the rest of my talk. Now, if your configuration space is finite dimensional, then it's very easy to show that, that this uh, canonical object is a two-form, which is close and non-degenerate, where non-degeneracy basically means that it is invertible as a matrix, if you want. Uh, standard way we look at this is the following. Well, if you have some coordinates on your configuration space, you can span one form in this way by using the differentials of the coordinates. Let me just say a few words, uh, something about notation. I may use this thick the differential to refer to fields or to the Frechet differential that I will introduce later. Here and uses the standard notation just to, to, to follow the standard conventions, okay? Now, once you expand a one form in this way, the canonical symplectic form locally in a patch is given by this expression. Now, this can be interpreted in a slightly different way, which uh, is completely equivalent, which is the following. If you give me two vector fields in phase space, you can, of course, expand them in this way, in the basis, in the coordinate basis defined by the Qs and the Ps, and now the action of the symplectic form on a pair of these vector fields can be written in this bilinear form, okay? Um, now, as a point in, in one of the fibers in the phase space can be interpreted as a pair consisting of the base point in the configuration space and a covector, actually a vector which is tangent to the phase space can be interpreted as a pair consisting on a tangent vector, or, or, or tangent vector and a covector, okay? So, if we extend this to the full phase space to define vector fields, you can reinterpret the previous expression, this one, in a coordinate free way, if you want, in the, as this. So it's the action of, uh, so this is a function in phase space, which is obtained by taking this one form and acting on this vector field and subtracting this other object. Another one form acting on another vector field. Now, how, how do you work with field theories? So this is for mechanical systems. This is completely obvious. So what about field theories? Now, the, the usual, uh, uh, usual way that we, uh, that we, that we use uh, all the time, uh, which works well in some situation, is saying, well, what I will do is just replacing sums by intervals. Then I will change these by these, where now these things will be fields instead of just coordinates in free space. And this integral is defined on is, is defined on the spatial manifold where the fields live. But if you think a little bit about this, this, this is not really very well defined. So, for example, what kind of measures? Are, so, first of all, how do you define the integrals of these objects? What kind of measures should I put here? So, there is something slightly fishy about this. But there is a way to fix this, and this is actually very odd. You can see this in some old books by Martin, uh, where he talks about these things. If you look at those books, whenever he talks about mechanical systems, he uses ex exactly the standard notation, but he, with, he's talking about fields. He avoids the use of expressions such as these, and actually what he does is he uses this expression here. So in that context, the way you think about an object such as this is this one, where here this A labels just the, the fields. And of course, this is perfectly well defined, but this is telling you something which is very important, which is that you really need, if you are working with fields, you really need to understand how these dual objects work. So some functional analysis, analysis will play a role, okay? And this is one of the points that I want to make in my talk. So you really need, I mean, so this is the best way of dealing with the symplectic structure for field theories, but of course, that requires that you have a good grasp of about how these dual objects work, okay? Poisson brackets. So let's suppose now that we are, we have a field theory, 
I will consider very, very simple case, which is working with Banach manifolds, which are actually modeled on reflexive as, as spaces. Those are spaces where the double dual, yeah. Quickly remind what, what the dual forms were in earlier in the, in the, yes. in the reasonable case. So if you look at this special here, okay, then uh, basically what you have here is, uh, so this is a special of the symplectic form, and you can think of these as uh, uh, the components of a covector. So a way of interpreting this, this bilinear special is that you have a covector acting on a vector, okay? So if you uh, do this thing, I mean, if you think about the points in the fiber as points and covectors, and you look at how the vector fields on the phase space look like, then you see that you have uh, vector fields and one forms, okay? So that is the idea. Sure. So, so you, you mentioned Banach manifolds, um, and the space of smooth sections of a vector bundle is not a Banach manifold. So what, what examples are you thinking about? What I'm thinking about is uh, these similar spaces that we'll talk later. So oh, okay, so, so you're, you're like restricting the number of derivatives. So yes, yes, okay, yes, yes, okay, of course. Uh, actually, we'll use just one derivative, as, as you will see. Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Reflexive, Reflexive means that the double dual is uh, isomorphic to the f to the original space. No, that probably is not true. I mean, if they are if they are modeled on L2, then probably that's true. But you can have Banach spaces modeled on L and P things, things like that. So I think in that case, it's not. Okay. By the way, if I say something wrong, please correct me, OK? So uh, so these are very simple. These are the simplest uh, things, because it, it can be proved, uh, that there's also a theorem by Mazen, that in this case, the canonical symplectic form it's really close and non-degenerate. So if you have new phase dimensions, uh, you may have strong non-degeneracy, weak non-degeneracy, but you are working with reflexive spaces, and in particular with Hilbert manifolds, then these things are, are perfectly fine. So it's, it's actually working like an ordinary uh, mechanics of a finite dimensional system. So generically, it's only weak dimensions. Uh, say that again? Generically, Generically, this is odd, but if you are in a reflexive, it's weakly non-degenerate, but if you are in a, in a reflexive space, it is strongly non-degenerate, okay? So that's the whole point, to mimic really what you do with mechanics. Uh, some definitions, what the Hamiltonian vector field associated with a differentiable function is phase space is, is just the generalization of what I introduced when I talk about the Hamiltonian. So you take the function, you, you give me a function, you take computer differential, you solve this equation, then you get a Hamiltonian vector field. You give me two such functions, you differential functions. The Poisson bracket is defined in all of these equivalent ways. So this is just notation. So this is basically the action of the differential or the Hamiltonian vector field. You can write it any way you like. And of course, it is straightforward to see that this Poisson bracket is uh, anti-symmetric. It has the, the usual properties, okay? So let me just... Uh, as I will work with very specific example here, which is uh, which are some several other spaces in one dimension, just to illustrate the points that I want to make. So I need to tell you some things about s s these several other spaces and some specific properties that uh, you would have here. Okay. So first thing that I want to say about several other spaces is that. Strictly speaking, they are not functions, but rather equivalence classes of functions, modulo uh, zero measure sets, okay? So I will be using a slight generalization of the concept of field, but this is not extravagant, this is quite natural. I will work in one dimension, so uh, the properties of several of the spaces depends on many things, on the dimension, on the number of the derivatives, on several things. So here I will just look at the simplest possibility, one dimension. And I will give you the definition of a sovereign of a space. So you, you have one inter open interval in the real line, which may be bounded or unbounded, and you consider the space of continuous differential real functions with compass support in this interval, which I will call test functions. This sovereign of a space that I will call H1 of I is defined in the following way. Its elements are L2 functions, but they are such that they have weak derivatives. 
derivatives, where the Greek derivatives are defined as you would do, for example, for distributions, by uh, thinking about what happens when you act on uh, test functions and integrated backgrounds, okay? So you can think of the elements in this particular suburb space as square integrable functions which have a square integral with derivatives that I will denote with uh, the standard notation, okay? Now, there are, I will show you some results about this particular type of suburb space which I will be using here. Now, well, the first thing is that with this scalar product that involves not only the product of the functions but also the product of the derivatives, uh, and it's associated norm, this space is a separable Hilbert space. This is an elementary result, but this is a very useful thing, okay? Now the second is a very interesting property which the elements of this solar space have, and this is the following. You give me an element of this solar space associated with some interval of the real line, then there exists a continuous function defined on the closure of this interval such that it coincides with the element of the solar space almost everywhere, and not only that, you have something like the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, yes, Sumat. Just a quick clarification on the notation, if you, can you just go back to the previous yeah, slide? Yeah, sure. Just so that I know which, so H1 is the solar space, space and then this is, uh, is continuously differentiable, <coughs> compact support, okay. Thanks. So the other things, these phi's are some test functions that are used to define these weak derivatives. That's it. But I mean, the, the, I will not refer to these things. And, uh, this is only using the definition. Okay. Second theorem is uh, is is interesting because when you are in an L2 space, of course you know that the elements of an L2 space may be very strange. I mean, there is no way of thinking of them as, as functions. But here, you can think of these elements as some continuous function. So you, you, can, you have a much, much better picture. In, a, in an L2 space, you cannot evaluate one end element at a point, but here you can actually by using this, con this representative that whose existence is guaranteed by this theorem, okay? So that is a very important difference with respect, for example, with L2 spaces. I will, I will take advantage of that during my talk. Another, another interesting result, the third one that I will need is the following. You give me two elements in this particular solar space, then the product is also an element of the solar space. The derivative satisfies the Leibniz rules and the formula for integration by parts holds. So in practice, you can do computations exactly in the same way as you use in standard analysis for multivariate analysis. As a consequence of this, this thing is a Banach algebra. And it is important, in particular, the fact that you can multiply elements in this solar space and still get elements in, the, in this solar space. The U primes. Okay, the U primes, the derivatives may not be, I mean, they are definitely in L2, but they are not necessarily in the solar space. Okay, so you lose regularity when you differentiate, as usual. Okay? Okay, so comments. Uh, of course, this is a very particular uh, type of solar space. So you look at the theory of solar spaces, of course, the dimension is important, the number of derivatives that you consider, and general solar spaces are not defined as things living in L2, but living generally in some LP, okay? So this is important. I am talking about the very, very, very restrictive, uh, and taking a very restrictive choice of uh, a solar space. This issue that I mentioned, that I have continuous representatives in the closure of the open set, means not only that these things are defined everywhere, but also that I can talk about the boundary values, okay? This is also important. In the general theory of solar spaces, the boundary values uh, are called traces. This has nothing to do actually with the trace of a linear operator or, or, or a matrix. And this is very useful because if you are studying solutions to partial differential equations, elliptic partial differential equations, then of course you want to talk about boundary conditions. So if you work with things in L2, then that makes no sense. But if you work in such in solar spaces, then for some regular boundaries, things like that, you can actually define another functional space with elements which are 
good enough and which play the role of boundary conditions, okay? Now, this continued representative that this theorem guarantees that exists is actually not an arbitrary, cannot be any arbitrary continuous function. It's actually quite, quite a tame thing. It's differentiable almost everywhere. And actually, you can prove that the classical derivative coincides with the weak derivative almost everywhere. And I will mention an important result in Hilbert spaces, which will be relevant for what I said because it refers to dual. This is the, this uh, very well-known Riesz-Fechet representation theorem that tells you that if you have, suppose that you have a real uh, Hilbert space and you have a, lear, a linear map which is continuous, then this linear map can be represented as a scalar product with a fixed vector in this uh, Hilbert space. And also, if you want to compute the norm of this operator, it, it, it is actually exactly the same as the norm of the, of the vector that represents it in the Hilbert space, okay? So this, uh, this is actually one of the reasons why I'm working these spaces, because they give me a very neat characterization of the elements in the duals, okay? Which, for some other spaces, may be more complicated, maybe. So for example, matter in the following sense. Suppose that you are in three dimensions, okay? Now, I three dimensions, if you are in H1, you, you don't have a continuous representative for the elements of the solar space, space. So the, uh, and, and this, is, this is actually a corollary of uh, the Solev embedded theorem. So, um, so that if you want to have a continuous representative, which I need here because I will be talking about the evaluation of the fields, this works if you, and, and you want to have just one derivative, so to, to have the simplest possible situation, then there, uh, this will not, th that works in one dimension, but it will not work, for example, in three dimensions. Or two, for example, yes, yes. I need to, to that, probably in that case, if I add enough number of derivatives, then I, I may get something like that. But if I want to keep it simple, uh, then, uh, and it's true, what they said is the best, uh, the simple example, okay? Now, another topic, differentiability and functional derivatives. This is relevant in the computation of Poisson brackets because the standard formula that we have in our minds to compute Poisson brackets in field theory is involved functional derivatives. So we want to say something about this. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to remind you of the standard definition of differentiability in, say, Banach spaces. This is also called Frechet differentiability. This is uh, the undergraduate definition. So there is nothing exotic here. So if you give me two Banach spaces with the norms, you give me uh, an open subset of the first one and a point there, and you consider a function from this open subset to the second Banach space. We say that the function is differential or Frechet differentiable at the point if you can find a linear and continuous map and of course in infinite dimension continuity is a very important thing to take into account, that I will write with the same thick D that I wrote before. This is a, a map from the first Banach space to the second, which is called the differential and satisfies this condition here. I mean, it's not only that the limit of the numerator goes to zero, but also when you divide by the norm of the vector in the, in the, in, in, in the first Banach space, it goes to zero. This is the standard definition of differentiability for, say, Rn, and it's the generalization to Banach spaces. Now, this differential has very nice properties. For example, you can prove that it is unique. You can use it to define uh, directional derivatives. Um, it's obviously true, or it's trivial, that you have a linear and continuous function, then of course it will be the best approximation in this sense, so the differential of a linear and continuous function coincides with itself. And this concept is very useful because it allows you to extend many results of fun, uh, multivariate analysis to infinite dimensional Banach spaces in a very simple way. You can prove theorems such as in the, the inverse function theorem, the implicit function theorems, things like that look at the integrability of vector fields in a simple way and, and such a kind of uh, results, okay? And in fact, this is the kind of differential that you use when you define the stereo de derivative in, in differential geometry, okay? So this is standard differential in mathematics. Now, when you 
work with field theories, in particular in gravity, and when you are doing the Hamiltonian Lagrangian formulation of field theories, the word differentiability often means the following. It means that if you give me some functional of the fields and you compute the variation, you can write the variation in the following way. So if there are no, uh, in the following way, uh, and in the case of working in the on a manifold without a boundary, this is just it, but if the manifold has a boundary, one, you see very often the requirement that this expression must have no boundary integrals in the right-hand side. I call this RT differentiability because one of the first people, uh, to my knowledge, that use it was Richard Datelboin, but of course you'll find it, for example, mentioned in Wolf's book and things like that. And of course this is useful in, in the con when you have to deal with boundary conditions. So, uh, so this is something that, uh, that can be used uh, in a good way, okay? But uh, you think about it, the, the Frechet differentiability that I introduced before and this concept are completely different. They have very little in common. I am using uh, completely different definitions, okay? So it's not at all obvious. Actually, they are not equivalent, as, we, as I will show later. Of course, the mathematical consequences of Frechet differentiability are very clear, but it is dangerous to export them to situations in which differentiability is understood in the second sense and vice versa. So, and this is one of the points of my talk. So when you want to compute Poisson brackets and you're dealing with field theories or manifolds with boundaries, you must be very careful because this issue may crop up and then you try to compute the differential in the, 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 the functional derivatives in the standard way, you may find Boundary terms, and then you say, well, stop here because this thing is not differentiable. I cannot compute the Poisson brackets, and, and that's it. But this is, as I will show in some examples, this is actually not true. So you must be careful with this. So more specifically, let's, um, the point is that the differentiability concept that you need to compute Poisson bucket is for differentiability because you remember the definition of Poisson bucket, it involves the the differential, uh, uh, the stereo differential of some uh, function defined in phase space. Now, standard formula that we use and, and we find often in the physical literature in the context of field theories is this thing here. And if you look at this formula, there are a couple of things that I want to mention. First, it, it of course involves functional derivatives, which are thought as some generalization of partial derivatives. Yeah. Wait for the mic. Sure, go ahead. So, so you, you, you called your formula for a shade differentiability, but yeah. I, I think it's like mathematically this people one. usually, yeah, call it Gatot derivative because for a shade derivative doesn't really require norms. Uh, uh, okay, for me, Gatot derivative is something like the, the, like the um, um, directional derivative. So maybe. But, a, uh, uh, so, okay, maybe there are different nomenclatures because uh, in, in the literature I know the directional derivative is called Frechet derivative. Okay. And so, but it doesn't matter. But so, uh, actually, the point was a bit different. So, um, beyond Banach spaces, you, you also have other notions of di differentiability sure, where of Frechet derivative works. So, uh, there, there's an alternative way of, you know, making sense out of these functional derivatives using. Uh, calculus on locally convex topological vector spaces. So, yeah. so going beyond Banach. So then, somehow you, yeah, you, you lose the niceness of Banach, but but then you have more control on the derivatives. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I, I'm just sticking to the simplest situation that I can think about in the infinite dimensions. But of course, there are some. So, so I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I have completely, um, you know, skipped that part in in my talk, but. Uh, in, in the sort of, I mean, those derivatives I was writing on the board, I mean, they also make sense. Uh, but sure. yeah, well, one could also work in the smooth setting. I was just. Yeah, exactly. So for the smooth setting, then you would need fresh air spaces. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you work in fresh air spaces, so then, and so fresh air so manifolds are directional derivatives. Sorry, fresh air derivatives are directional derivatives. But, 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 but the derivatives he's talking about. Yeah, okay. yeah. Are but these are, these are much stronger. These are much stronger. Yes, derivatives. yes, 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 yes. And and the, yeah, so so the I guess the Frechet differentiability on smooth spaces is somewhere between what you called RT differentiable and and um, Banach differentiable. 
I, because I, it. I yeah. don't know what in between means in that. It's it's what a do you it's mean a by it's strong stronger notion than one and weaker notion than the other. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, okay, but yeah, I thank, want thank to, you. I will talk about that later, okay? Uh, okay. So, so this is standard formula. Now, if you look at this formula, what actually what you see is actually some kind of L2 scalar product of these functional derivatives, okay? So uh, that's something that it is there. And uh, on the other hand, if you remember how Poisson brackets look like for field theories, you have some expression like this. So, it's interesting to pose yourself the question, well, can you connect this thing with this thing? Is there a way that uh, you can think of this expression as this other thing, which is defined in very simple and rigorous terms? And the answer is yes. So let me show you how you can do it again. So I introduce, for this, in this particular context, uh, a, a definition of what I call here functional derivative, which may be non-standard, but it makes here uh, it makes con uh, sense in this context, which is the following. Suppose that you give me a, a real function on one of the Sobolev Hilbert spaces. Now, I, and I take a point here, now we'll call the functional derivative of this function at this point as the unique element of the Sobolev space satisfying this condition. In other words, the functional derivative that I'm introducing here is the Riesz-Fréchet representative of this Fréchet differential that I introduced before for the function, okay? So this is not standard, but this is a definitional functional derivative that will allow me to interpret this uh, expression that I wrote down here in this way. It's something that resembles this thing, okay? This, this is for, uh, this actually you can do for every solar Hilbert space. I will use it in one dimension. The representative is the representative is the If you have a continuous linear functional and you're in a Hilbert space, you can represent it as a scalar product. So here I, uh, I have this function and calling the functional derivative just the risk representative of the differential, which is a linear uh, continuous function of there. Okay, so it's straightforward thing, okay? And this, of course, is well defined because of the research differential, uh, the representation theorem, and the fact that the differential is continuous and linear. So, uh, very obvious, actually. Yep. So, so is the Fréchet differential, or this okay. is something else? So you give me a function, a real function defined on this uh, space, okay? Now, you can define, I mean, these are Varax spaces, so you can define the Fréchet differentiable of this object, and this Fréchet differentiable is linear and continuous. So this is a linear and continuous map, the differential, from H to R. Yes, so, I mean, that is the Fréchet differential on yeah, the left-hand side. That's all I want. Okay. And because I'm working yeah, in this solar space, yeah. then I can represent that by some element in the sure. solar space. And that element is what I'm calling in this context, the functional derivative. Thank you. Okay? So let's go back now to Poisson brackets. So in, in the formula that I have for the good formula for the Poisson brackets, when I have these uh, uh, dual objects, actually I can, I can write the Poisson bracket in terms of the risk fresher representatives that I am calling with the same letters but, uh, but not using the bold face, okay? And now, it's also a very straightforward exercise to introduce partial functional derivatives in the phase space, so that's trivial, and write this object here in terms of uh, these partial functional derivatives. Now, if you do that, I'm denoting those in the obvious way. There are partial derivatives in the field direction and partial derivatives in the direction of the momenta. So the Poisson bracket, in the solar space will have the following form, which actually mimics very well uh, the standard formula if you trade these functional derivatives here for this object that I have introduced uh, before, and you replace the integrals of the products by the solar, the solar level scalar product. So the formula is exactly the same, but it is written in the terms of these functional derivatives and the solar scalar product. 
So now I will give you some concrete examples to show you how things, how these things work and, the, and to show that actually there are some very nice things going on. So I will consider this solid space. So I am in one dimension, I'm taking the open interval zero one. I will define a function, which is very natural thing, which I call the valuation in the following way. If you give me an element, and, and the, I define the function in the closed interval. If you give me an element of the solar space, the evaluation is obtained by taking this continuous representative that you know it exists and evaluating that at the point. Okay. okay. This is this for in the particular example of working with one derivative, this will only exist in one dimension. If I introduce more derivatives, I can make this work in three dimensions. If you want. But and this is a corollary now. That's a corollary of this uh, sublevel theorem. Use the space space. Yes, sure. So I have to change the sublevel space. Okay. okay? Yes, it exists as, and it is unique. That is the result, the main result of the second theorem that I showed, okay? So that's the whole thing. That it, it is unique, it exists, so that evaluation is perfectly well defined, okay? Uh, this, again, this would not happen if you were in an L2 space. Now, it, it's very easy to show that this evaluation can actually be written as a concrete scalar product in H1. If you be introduce this function here, which is a funny function involving hyperbolic cosines and things like that, so it's a very concrete object. If you compute the Sobolev scalar product in this space of this function with any element of the Sobolev space, you get precisely the evaluation at that point. This is a dice exercise where you use, for example, integration by parts. I mean, it's a simple thing. And the first time you see it, it's a little bit shocking. I mean, I, I was very surprised because, uh, I mean, basically, uh, I mean, it's not that obvious that the things will work out, but they actually do. So with this concrete function here that you can prove it's very easy, that it is an element of the solar space, you can show that the valuation at a certain point is exactly the, the H1 scalar product you did, okay? So this is, uh, so this is a, a very neat result. And again, even though you may think about this issue as, uh, well, I'm working in a very abstract kind of object, this solar space, actually when you introduce natural functions, you get very concrete objects to work with. I will show, I will show you some more, okay? Now this function has some nice properties. For example, it has this kind of symmetry. And later you will see what this actually represents. Um, comments. Um, so it's, you can prove in this way that the evaluation is linear and continuous. You can do it the other way around, proving the first that it is linear and continuous and then looking for the least first state representative. Um, in particular, the fact that it is linear and continuous means that the differential is itself, which will be useful because I will use this thing to compute Poisson markets in, some, in a concrete example. If you introduce the definition of functional derivative that I am uh, using here, you can prove this, that the, the, differ, the functional derivative of evaluation at x is this, uh, uh, this e, that, uh, this function that I found here. And this is independent of, of the thing, so this is constant, okay? Now, for example, if you, true to, if you try to do the same thing with the derivative, then it doesn't work. Uh, and the reason is what I mentioned before to Madhavan. Now, the derivative is not an element, generically it's not in H1, so it doesn't have a continuous representative. So you can think about the evaluation of the function, but you cannot think about the evaluation of the derivative, okay? Let's consider another function, which is interesting because this is not differentiable in the rigid Tatelboim case, but I will show you that you can use this thing to define, you can compute Poisson brackets with this kind of object. Now the function is also very simple. It's a function from the solar, real function on the solar space, which is defined as one half of the uh, integral of the square of the derivative, which is well defined because the weak derivatives in the solar space are elements of L2, okay? Now this function is not differentiable in the rigid total point sense. So if you compute the variation, this is what you get, then you get boundary terms and even worse than that, you will get something here which involves second derivatives which may not exist. They may or may not exist. So this is 
something that you would react, you see it very often rejected as a function which is not differentiable. Because, but the claim is that it is not differentiable in the regulatable sense, but it is differentiable in this Rachet or Gateau sense that I introduced before. The proof is a simple exercise in undergraduate functional analysis, and the steps are the obvious ones. So I have to check that it is linear and continuous, and also plug that into the definition and see that the relevant limit holds, and this is obvious, okay? So I, will, I can show you here the steps, but this is just a very simple exercise. It's first undergraduate course on functional analysis. Now you want to, uh, actually you can describe the functional derivative of, of this function, it exists, of course, and actually a way of looking at it is by considering its evaluation. It's, you can do that. The computation of the evaluation can be performed by taking the scalar product with this uh, curly E uh, function that I showed you before, and if you do the computation, you get this thing where you have the continuous representative of the function U and that these other integrals that, as you see, involve these hyperbolic cosines and these hyperbolic uh, signs. So this is, this is a very concrete object. So this, again, so this function, which is nonlinear and is not differentiable in the regulatable sense, and of course it's defined in a manifold with a boundary, is differentiable in the standard mathematical sense in this simple context of Banach's spaces, okay? So conceivably you can, if you introduce a phase space, which I will do next, and define some function involved with these things, you can compute the Poisson brackets, despite the fact that some people think that these things are not differential. So let me just go to this example and I will finish. Is so there anything else that can't work? Can I have something which is, uh, um, can you have something which is um, differentiable in the absence and but not differentiable? I have not thought about that. That's a very interesting question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very good. I will think about that. Well, you, you have, okay, so if you blindly write that as some uh, Lagrangian, you, you must be careful because, for example, integration by parts is not obvious, okay, but because but you have. You have found this functional derivative, right? So you will get some, I mean, in your sense, you will get some equations of motion. So I just want you to know what they were because. Uh, again, the, ha, suppose that this is the Lagrangian, okay? Then you have, you have to compute the variation of these, but then, of course, you cannot, I mean, this step is not justified. I think, that, okay, these, these are unrelated things, right? Because the way you would get the, I mean, how would you get the only Lagrange equations? Precisely by doing this computation. You would yes. you compute the variation, and then, the you, variation. and then you would try to, so forget about the boundary terms for a moment, then you look at these, and they will say, well, then the equations will be phi prime prime equal to zero, but this is not justified because this is not guaranteed to exist, okay? So if you want to, I mean, so the problem that you're thinking about is, well, uh, if I introduce some curves and so on, and I define the, an action with these things, how do I characterize the stationary points? I don't know, I, I don't know the answer to that. And actually that's a difficulty that will, uh, I will mention at the end because it will be relevant, okay? But of course you can, what you can do is compute the differential. The differential is just this thing that they wrote that he, down here, which is the obvious thing, okay? But, but but you cannot get the, the, the Euler Lagrange equations directly from here. Again, because you cannot integrate by parts. Okay. Yeah, I will help. Okay, is that clear? Yes, okay. Like if not, we'll, I, I, I will tell about it. So let me just do, uh, I will finish with some, show you, showing you how you can compute Poisson bracket with these kind of functions and in this kind of setting. So suppose that your phase space, I mean, because this thing is a vector space, actually the, the tangent and the cotangent bundles are, are trivial, so, and because you have this uh, real representation theorem, you can actually think of the phase space of uh, theory defined on this configuration space actually as the Cartesian product of it with itself, okay? 
Now I am in phase space, I have fields and I have momenta, so I have to introduce two projections in the obvious way. So you give me a point here, I have a projection one that gives me the fields, projection two that gives me the momenta, and I can define partial evaluations. So I can define something which is f like phi of x and something which is like pi of x, which are real differentiable functions in this phase space, basically because I, I have shown you that this evaluation is differential, and of course, the projections are trivially differentiable. They are linear and continuous, okay? So I can use the formula that I found out before to compute the Poisson bucket in terms of the partial functional derivatives of these two things defined in the way that I used before, okay? And which again is, uh, is, is not in standard, it's a specific for this that I'm saying to them here. Now, it's a simple exercise to compute the functional derivatives of these functions here. It's, these are one line computations, so for example, this one is given by EX, this other one is given by EY, and these others are zero. You plug that into the formula, and then you get, for example, that the Poisson bracket of these two objects is given by this function here, okay? If you do the same computation with phi x and phi i, or pi x and pi i, you get zero. So this is, these are the basic Poisson brackets of these partial evaluations in this phase space. And as you can see, they are very tame things. Uh, you now go back to the standard way we deal with the scalar fields, for example. The Poisson brackets that we, canonical Poisson brackets, we write them in this way. And here you have a distribution, okay? So this is either zero or it is not defined. So there is something ugly and this going on there, which of course we, you can fix by doing smithings and this kind of stuff, okay? So it's, it's not uh, a dead end. But here, just by following, by using the standard definitions and just, uh, I mean, nothing exotic, in this setting, you find some Poisson brackets which are perfectly nice. I mean, you get something here which is regular in this space. It's not pathological at all. Which, for example, is well defined even if x is equal to y. So it's a very, very tame kind of object, which is not what you get in the standard framework, okay? So comments, the, of course, these functions are real functions in phase space. In fact, uh, so the Poisson bracket is again a real function in phase space, which in this case is constant. As I said, even in the case where I have x here and x here, I have something which is perfectly well defined. And the objects that I get are, are regular, so if I want to plug them into the uh, Jacobi identities, of course I can do the computation again, and I will get, the, for example, that the Jacobi identity will hold, okay? And uh, one thing that it is different from the standard interpretation of uh, the scalar bracket, uh, the Poisson brackets for a scalar field is that, for instance, this thing is never zero, which is not what you usually have in our minds. Uh, in the standard setting, we think that phi of x and pi of y commute and something funny happens if uh, you are at the same point, okay? Now you can compute Poisson brackets also involving the other nonlinear thing, uh, non fréchette differentiable thing that I introduced. Computations, you do them, so for example, now think about this Poisson bracket. I take this partial evaluation of the field and I compute the Poisson bracket with this V, this object. Now, the, the computation is exactly, with, you, you follow exactly the same steps. Here, I have added this to remind you that these are actually functions on the phase space. And, of course, uh, you, you get, for example, that in this case, you have a zero. This is not unexpected because V, if you remember, V did not depend on the momentum, the pi's. It only depends on the pi's. If now I introduce the pi, uh, the, the ob this other object, the computation is completely analogous. I get this thing. Now it depends on phi, so now it's not constant, but it is a very simple expression. It's well defined, and there are no obstructions whatsoever. If you look, I mean, these are one-line computations. You need to get used to the notation, and the first time it's, uh, the, the, I mean, you, you need to know what you're doing, but it, these are completely straightforward and very simple. And the result is, uh, concrete expression, simple expression, and of course there is, there is really nothing funny going on, okay? So, uh, actually you can show that these Poisson brackets that you get in the, in the uh, here are, are again uh, differentiable functions, so you can plug them into the Jacobi identities. So really nothing funny happens, 
okay? So let me end here, so let me make some final comments. So it's true that from a heuristic point of view, and in many cases, rigorous point of view, the, the transition from Hamiltonian mechanics to field theory is relatively straightforward, but not always. And in particular, if you have boundaries, you have to be careful, okay? So that's a warning, that the general kind of warning that I want to, to make. Now, if you specify the function of the space where you're working, you may actually have to your disposal some additional structures, mathematical structures, that you can use for your benefit, as I showed in these particular examples of one-dimensional sublim spaces. And one thing that I believe after looking at this is that these solar hydrogen spaces actually can be nice configuration spaces because of all these things, okay? So I have an invitation, a proposal, maybe a challenge, which is, well, uh, now that we see that there are some things that you can do here, uh, one could look for useful field theories in these spaces. Try to see if you can get uh, the standard field theories that we work with uh, that we can write them in these spaces. This is not trivial, not even for the scalar field, but I, I have some ideas about how you can do this. And this would give you a different perspective. So there are some problems, for example, you want to do quantum field theory. So one of the things that I have shown is that distributions don't appear. So distributions are very useful things, of course. Um, now, depending on uh, your, your mood, you can think of them as some very uh, singular objects, but you can also think about them in a completely different way. For example, you can claim that they are very smooth because they can be differentiated as many times as you want. So one of the problems that you have with distributions is that you cannot multiply them. But for example, here, you in this solar space, this is actually Banach uh, algebra, so you can't really multiply the functions there and get functions again. So you may be able to define field theories in these spaces and even look at the quantization without, without having to deal, or probably not as much, with the difficulties that you have when you work with distributions. Also, when you work in, in this kind of functional setting, the, the topology is very, very simple. These are metric spaces. These are really, really, really the simplest things you can think of. You go to space of distributions, and the topology there is much harder to, to work with, at least for non-experts like myself. So there you have to deal with problems that will not show up here. So it may be interesting to look at field theories in this context and see what you get, just in case there is something useful you can do with that. And I finish here. Thank you very much. <laughs> By the way, the details of all these computations can be found in this paper here, where we actually do examples in three dimensions and things like that. Um, yeah. So thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, interesting. I didn't understand a lot of it. But uh, a couple of comments that I want to ask you, um, com comments I want to make, and also ask you a couple of questions, is so. Uh, this, this idea of low regularity space times uh, has, again, you know, the fa fact that we can use things of very low regularity is uh, something that people have actually been, um, there's a whole lot of mathematicians have been working on this uh, now for a while in the Lorenzian context but as you well. Mean, but you mean the space time manifold, right? Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying that therefore also then fun all, all of the structures that are there uh, using low regularity, so not using the full um, so it's, it's very interesting in that context how to see this kind of work. Um, but also from the point of view of, you know, when we make connection from discrete theories to the continuum, right, we always make uh, those connections in sort of the st strictest possible definitions of continuum quantities. So from that point of view, it's also very interesting if there are, uh, for example, um, things that you're talking about where the transition from discreteness to the continuum happens in this completely new sense of um, uh, Poisson brackets or any of this. So, I mean, I have, I have nothing to offer but just to sort of uh, wondering whether you've thought in, in, in that language. And the second question which I'll quickly ask because, uh, again, I don't really understand this well enough to phrase it properly, but is, I mean, you talked about boundaries and the fact that, you know, boundary terms don't seem to have as much of a role to play in this kind of um, way of thinking, if I'm not mistaken. But in that case, 
does it change, for example, things that we know about black hole horizons, and, you know, uh, where those boundary terms matter a lot in much of the calculation? So just a bunch of questions. Sorry. Okay. So regarding the first question or, or, or comment, of course, uh, really what I'm doing here is something very, very simple. So I'm considering that I have fields defined on some differential manifold, a small manifold, which may have a boundary or not. So I'm not thinking about defining in more complex, uh, I mean, different settings like a discrete set or something like that. Yes, but with low regularity, so <coughs> when I say low regularity, I'm going down all the way to 0, 0, 1, whatever. Um, yeah, but then there, for example, topological issues really become relevant. I mean, uh, you work, for example, with the smooth function. So of course you have, you can have topologies there which are natural and work well, but they are not as easy to handle like uh, the topology in a Hilbert space or the bank space, okay? It's, so I don't, I don't, I'm not sure to understand completely your point. But I, my statement is that I'm thinking actually at a very, very simple thing. From the point of view of the base manifold, I just take a different, smooth differential manifold, maybe with a boundary, okay? And then regarding the second question, boundary terms, I, I'm not saying that boundary terms are not important. On the contrary, they, they, may, be, they may be very, very crucial. What I am saying is that if you have boundaries, there are some people think that you may have abstractions coming from these definition of differentiability involving boundary terms, which actually are not there. So my statement is that if you have boundaries, uh, some things are actually work well. I mean, uh, it's not a problem, but I'm not saying that, bound that boundary terms are not important. They are, they're very important. You have to, actually, you, when you define the dynamics of a system, they may play a very important role. So, so I hope that uh, I did not misled you on this thing, okay? Is that clear? And, and then regarding black holes and that, of course, that will depend on the particular Lagrangian that you, the, how you define your theory and, and how you, how you, the specific example you're working with. But again, I mean, if, if you, so, suppose you give me a space uh, manifold with a hole and this hole is supposed to model some kind of inner horizon and then you want to define a field theory there involving gravity or something like that, or some modified theory of gravity, then you will have to give me, define me your configuration space, of fields with some care. You must tell me, one of the points that I'm making is that you have to specify the functional space where these things live. The definition of the functional space may, for example, involve boundary conditions. If that makes sense, I mean, if I take L2, they, the boundary conditions would not make sense, but if I take uh, in this, a, a good sublevel space where I have traces, I have something like boundary conditions, then I can include that in the definition of the space. Then you have to write an action and then compute the variations of the actions. The variations of the action may involve, may have bulk terms and boundary terms, so you need to understand how these things interact with each other, but that's, uh, that's just following the, the usual steps carefully, okay? So uh, I cannot tell you more than that, I have not worked specific examples, but the steps that you have to follow on this are clear, okay? Um, so I'm trying to think about this uh, last set of uh, questions that you're raising, and perhaps, <coughs> excuse me, perhaps I'm extrapolating too far, <laughs> but Normally, we would interpret uh, Poisson brackets as happening, uh, as being defined on a uh, space-like hypersurface, and we would hope that they became something like commutators in the quantum theory. So the fact that your Poisson brackets don't vanish when x is not equal to y would translate at least naively into a statement that operators that are space-like separated uh, wouldn't necessarily commute. Absolutely. So the question, that might make sense depending on how fast the, the commutator falls off to zero. I mean, you might say you have some kind of deformation, but 
Is there a scale hidden in here somewhere? Is there a way of saying, uh, do, does the, the Poisson bracket of pi of x uh, with phi of y fall off to zero as x becomes far from y, and is there a scale for that? No, or is uh, it just not zero? Okay, so I think the answer is no. I mean, uh, actually, if, when you look at the Poisson bracket that, uh, of these uh, uh, partial evaluations that I wrote here, so let me see it, this one here. So you have this E x of y, but this function, I actually, it is this one. This is defined on an interval, okay, so the issue fall off uh, is a little bit, here it's, uh, it's, a little bit, it's not so well defined, but this function is not very peaked. I mean, it goes up and down, so it's not constant, but when you look at it, basically it's, uh, it's very different from zero, let me put it that way, in the whole interval. So if you want to quantize with this thing, you will, I mean, you will proceed in the standard sense, but some things are, will be different, so I really don't know what happens. You can ask yourself the question, well, if I have a field theory defined uh, in this kind of solvable space, uh, then how do I quantize it, and what are the consequences of the fact that th this canonical Poisson bracket, th these are actually the, the canonical Poisson bracket, so this thing is not, uh, is not a, another definition of the Poisson bracket, these are really the canonical Poisson bracket, in this case are given by these functions. So I, I really don't know what happens with the quantization, but it is not, I mean, you saw something very big, then you will say, well, there's something like, I mean, basically things essentially will commute if the points are far enough, but no, no, that is not uh, what happens. And I don't know the consequences of that. Maybe that uh, at some point you see that that makes the quantum field theories defined on these spaces completely unphysical. That yeah. may happen. So. Right. so just to make sure, so the statement is that if I, instead of looking at Poisson bracket between phi of x and phi of y, if I smear phi of x, I mean that's a function also. You can, of course. I can smear it with a little interval and phi of y also with a little interval such that the intervals are disjoint, you're saying the points of bracket between the smeared things is also not zero. Uh, okay, that, I don't know. Are you saying that? I, I thought you are not saying that, but then when you put this transparency, because if it's not the case, then I think this whole idea that you first were saying very loosely, oh, delta distribution is zero. That is a silly way to talk about distributions, right? Yes, 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 yes Yeah, of so therefore it's not zero. It's and, and I mentioned that, of course, right. to this meeting there. So, right. so, 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 so what happens, so, so we, we, we can just do that calculation, right? I mean, I just take your function and I is integ in integrate it. So you, f x. so you define, say, one function, capital F, yeah. as some integral. Of little f, right. Uh, no, no, capital F is fine, but is equal to some <laughs> test function. Test function phi 1, which has, say this is 0, 1, so phi 1 has a support yeah, here, yeah. okay? And, and pi 1 has a support. And, a uh, and I write yeah. here phi of x. Yeah, and then similarly for pi. Oh, and then yeah, I, this has an x here, yeah. and I integrate in x, okay? Yeah. And then I have g, which is the integral of, say, pi. phi 2 of uh, it's y. It's not phi 2, it's pi, it's pi right? It's pi here. Yeah, okay. The y, then you compute the Poisson bracket, you will get, uh, uh, and another support of this thing is here. Yeah. Then I mean, it seems that you will get zero, right? Yeah, so, so I mean, I don't see any contradiction whatsoever. I mean, I, <laughs> sure, sure, I mean you will get zero. the only sense in which we are talking about the, uh, the, the, in the field theory, that the points, and the usual way of writing that the Poisson bracket is equal to delta, is only in the sense of this. And what yes, you're saying sure, is sure, that sure, sure. No, you are giving a little more meaning you are at, I mean, so you are getting exactly the same answer as standard field theory, except that in the standard field theory is just says that, well, it's a distribution, and you are saying, therefore, if x is equal to y, then, you know, sure, that, that's sure. a silly way to talk about. I mean, it's, but distributions don't take values, and you are saying that, well, no, this way is taming the distribution. I mean, you, you can give it as a sign of value. So it's a very, very, very fine point, fine Indeed. extension. Okay, but for example, regarding the, I mean, but. Again, as I said before, is you have to multiply distributions. When you do quantum field theory, at some point you may need to multiply distributions. That is uh, slightly uglier, right? Uh, well, but that's all renormalization theory that comes sure, in and so on and so forth. But, but uh, yeah, but as far as I shouldn't go. No, no, but I as far as this concern is concerned, it seems to me that there is absolutely, so we don't have to worry about Steve's thing about, you know, commutators. I, it, it's just the standard commutators you will get if you quantize this theory. In the, in the usual. And uh, just one more remark is that uh, you gave this very nice uh, reference to Marsden's book, but I found that book to be rather difficult 
But there's a, another small book by Marsden and Chernoff. Chernoff, yes, I know Chernoff and Marsden, which is the Springer Lecture Notes. And that I found it to be much easier to read for physics audiences. So I thought that I, I would just mention that as a. Okay, so, uh, so let, me, let me make a comment regarding this uh, Marsden and Chernoff book. Actually, uh, some of these issues also come from Marsden and collaborators. And one way they deal with these uh, problems is by working with what, with what they call manifold domains. So basically, they're, I mean, they're thinking about constraint systems, for example. Yeah. And then there, if you look at those from a geometric point of view, then uh, the issue of consistency of the dynamics can be reinterpreted as the issue of tangency of vector fields to some manifolds defined by constraints, either primary or secondary constraints. And then these, domain, uh, these manifold domains are actually some kind of bundles where you have uh, a base manifold, which can be a sublevel space, but the fibers are L2 spaces. So this, uh, what they do to deal with that is that they relax the tangency condition and they use tangency to the closure of the some manifolds in phase space defined by the constraints. Now that's, that's a consistent point of view and that, that works. But in practice, when we try to make that work for some examples which are not a scalar field, it is actually difficult to deal with this condition of closure. So that perspective is there. So that's another yeah. way of thinking about this problem. Right. But I was, not, yeah. But, but, but if you stay, uh, stay away from the constraints, indeed, that's systems, a very good, it's a simple, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's continue maybe in the discussion session because we're running late. So let's thank Fernando again. <laughs> Uh, what time is it now? Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, well, 15 minutes, 20 max, maybe. We'll, we'll clap. Uh, yeah, I think we will.
Okay, let's, uh, let's resume with the last talk of the morning. So now it's the pleasure to have uh, Professor Amitabh Virmani from CMI Chennai, and he will tell us about uh, super radiant instabilities of care ADS black hole. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, let me start by thanking Madhavan and Sumati for inviting me to this conference. Uh, uh, we have organized conferences in India, and we know how difficult it is, and they have put together a very good program and very comfortable stay. So I really want to thank Sumati and Madhavan for this. Uh, so uh, the title of my talk is Super Radiant Instabilities of Current ADS Black Hole. I have not written a paper on this subject, uh, but this is a subject that I have followed uh, over some years. And this is the first time I am giving this talk. There is a typo here. This is actually September 2023. Uh, I have not given this talk uh, before. So, <laughs> OK. So let me start. Yeah. So let me first say the scope uh, of uh, what I am going to do. So um, as I will review, the Kerr ADS black hole suffers from a classical superradiant, a class of uh, classical superradiant instabilities over a range of parameters. And um, this has been uh, first uh, argued by uh, Hawking and Rial. And it, I mean, many people have worked on it. Uh, I will not be very precise about the references. If you read one of the good papers, then you will find all the references uh, on this subject. So I will just write some names uh, who have uh, worked on this subject. So in this talk, uh, I will review this subject and argue that the developments over the years it strongly suggests that the endpoint of this uh, superradiant instability is not a classical solution. Uh, it's something else. And uh, it has been suggested recently that the final state is, is a coarse-grained solution of Einstein's equation, and um, uh, uh, it has been called uh, gray galaxies. So uh, I will review what is uh, gray galaxies. And in the last part, I will present my own work uh, on studying some properties of uh, gray galaxies and a new class of black hole solutions that people are discussing. These are called uh, revolving uh, black holes. Okay, so uh, so this uh, this this part about uh, some properties of gray galaxies. This is work in progress with the two undergraduate students, uh, Anand and Piyush. Uh, uh, Piyush is from NICER. Anand is from CMI. Okay, so uh, motivation. So the ADS CFT correspondence maps asymptotically ADS solutions of Einstein's equation to states of uh, dual conformal field theory, conformal field theory. And uh, the Kerr ADS solution lies in the universal sector of the correspondence. Like all, all supergravities have truncations to, to this sector. So it's a uh, uh, gravity sector, I mean universal sector of this uh, correspondence. And um, there are good reasons to study properties of Kerr ADS solutions because uh, they will help us understand the thermalization in the ADS CFT correspondence. If the solutions are unstable as they are, uh, then they will lead to some new phases um, um, of the dual theory. And they have been studied for more than 25 years. So I will uh, present an overview of what all has been done. OK, so here is the plan of my talk. Uh, I will say a few things about Kerr ADS black holes. Then I will uh, review the superradiance instability. Uh, then I will present the work in the GR community on the endpoint of uh, the instabilities. And uh, then I will discuss the gray galaxies proposal. And finally, uh, to our work. Even if I don't get to this part, it's OK, uh, because uh, uh, it's more important to get these points across uh, to this audience, I guess. So uh, OK, so let me start with the radius black holes. OK, so before we start with Kerr ADS, uh, we all grew up learning about properties of Kerr black holes. So let's all uh, just review what are the main properties of Kerr black holes. So Kerr black holes have two killing vectors, partial t, partial phi. Uh, famously, Kerr black holes have no hair. Um, and they are famously stable. If you do quasi-normal mode analysis or even um, like more detailed analysis based on initial data and things like those, um, these black holes are uh, stable. Although formally you can write down solutions which sort of have naked singularities, m greater than a solutions, uh, uh, a greater than m solutions, um, but those solutions are not realized in nature in the sense that cosmic censorship protects us from such uh, naked singularities. 
and infalling observers crossing the horizon, they don't see they don't see anything funny. They just uh, simply cross. Okay, so uh, when we turn on the cosmological constants, um, it's a zoo. Like um, I mean, many things can happen. Uh, so in this talk, I will only do a global ADS, which means that the boundary of ADS is R times uh, S2. Okay, I will not discuss planar or hyperbolic or whatever. Th those cases I will not discuss. Okay, so it so happens that many of the above results that I mentioned for curved black hole, they do not uh, uh, hold. Uh, and each of those points is a talk in itself. Uh, I will focus only on the, um, on the instability uh, of the, of the curry ADS. Okay, I will not be able to discuss the other issues, uh, um, the infalling observer and things like those. Okay, so uh, let us look at the parameter space of lambda equal to zero curve black hole. Okay, so um, so we have uh, the curve metric has two parameters, little m and little a. Um, the allowed parameter space is uh, uh, is this region. So m has to be greater than a, and then black holes exist in all of this region. This is this is the extremality uh, extremality line. Okay. For Kerr ADS, the diagram is not so simple. So for Kerr ADS, uh, let me first uh, tell you the metric and so on. So Kerr ADS solution was discovered by Carter in 68. Uh, it has three parameters, little m, little a, and uh, lambda. Uh, for this talk, lambda is fixed. Uh, in many equations, I will write uh, L. In some equations, I may write lambda. Uh, but lambda is really fixed. So uh, in this slide, for example, L, I have set it to, uh, to 1. <coughs> OK, so the, uh, the metric has uh, several functions. It has this extra function delta theta, which is this uh, 1 minus a squared over L squared cosine squared theta. So L is set to 1, so that's why you don't see it here, L. Uh, uh, but this is the new function that appears compared to the Kerr metric. Uh, otherwise, very similar structure to the Kerr metric. This is the function that determines the location of the roots uh, of the uh, location of the horizon and things like those. Okay, so there are many different ways of writing this solution, um, and this was a source of confusion in the early days of uh, ADS-CFT. Uh, but now um, all those things are settled, and uh, uh, there are now standard ways, standard ways of defining the time coordinate, uh, phi coordinate, and so on. So now such confusions are not there. Okay, so the parameter space. So lambda less than zero, global ADS. Okay, so three parameters, M, A, capital lambda, um, L, I set it to one. Okay, so let me draw this here. Uh, the diagram is a little bit busy. So, so we have, so I have this little M parameter and little A parameter. Um, when A becomes equal to L, uh, so the metric becomes singular. So anything above A greater than L, the metrics are uh, singular. So, so the, this is sort of the line beyond which there are no, uh, no regular uh, metrics. Okay, and then within this range of M and A, there is a line of extremal black holes. So this is this line um, where the black holes are extremal. And um, the region below, the region below has sort of more rotation than the mass, so this is this is uh, not allowed. Okay, so so this is also not allowed, and this region below is also not allowed. So only allowed region is uh, is this above <coughs> above region. Okay, so in the above region, you see uh, something is funny. So if the uh, mass is small, uh, little m is small, then you see you you cannot have a equal to l. You don't you don't reach you don't reach uh, a equal to l because the 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 region is blocked and uh, but if the mass is sufficiently high then you can uh, reach a equal to l. Uh, Madhavan, you have yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, this is in the little m and little little m and little a space, but perhaps it's better to uh, uh, better to look at this parameter space in the more physical quantities, uh, ADM mass and ADM angular momentum. 
Okay, so again, so this is one topic that was confusing in the early days of ADS-CFT, and uh, uh, Ashtekar and Das did a paper which clarified uh, many of these things. But now, um, uh, the, I mean, these are just called ADM uh, mass and ADM, en ADM angular momentum. So ADM energy for the Kerr metric in the little m and little a parameters is m over one minus a squared over L squared, and uh, capital J is m a over a minus L squared over a squared. Okay, so, I, so what I should do is that now I convert this diagram into capital E and capital J space. Okay, so this is the diagram in the capital um, uh, E and capital J space. So let me, this, so this is one of the important diagrams for my talk, so let me draw this uh, here again. Okay, so, so I am drawing uh, uh, ADM energy and ADM angular momentum, and uh, there is this uh, 45 degree line, which is uh, equal to J equal to J line. So this is this is what is called in the literature the the BPS bound or the unitarity bound. The BPS bound comes because this simplest uh, uh, simplest uh, Einstein uh, theory with cosmological constant, you can make a supergravity out of it, and then you will see that E equal to J is the BPS bound. But from the CFT perspective, the operators uh, have this condition that the mass summation is greater than J, so this is the unitarity bound. Bo both names are used uh, interchangeably. Okay, so nothing uh, exists uh, below uh, equal to J, which is good, it should not exist. Um, but if you look at the parameter space of curved black holes, then black holes only exist in in this region. Okay. Um, they don't exist in this uh, this wedge-shaped uh, region. Okay, so this is already my first puzzle: why ADS black holes do not exist in all region allowed by the BPS bound. Okay, and if you uplift this puzzle to supergravities, then it becomes a deeper puzzle. And uh, even the number of parameters and things like those uh, do not work out uh, properly. So uh, towards the end of the talk, I will have something to say about. Uh, yeah, so J is the ADM angular momentum. And uh, is written in terms of little m and little a in this, in this one. Oh, um, Yeah. Yeah. Gibbons and yeah, Gibbons Gibbons and four. That the, all the work in this area is done by people with a initials of A, B, and M. <laughs> and the other one was with uh, Manu and Das, and you said we can just call it A, B, and M. Okay, very good. <laughs> okay, so Ashtikar, Das, Manuan. <laughs> okay, fine. Okay, I have to think about it. I cannot think on my feet uh, on this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's send the mic. So, I mean, the boundary theory lives on an S2. So on the S2, you have a discrete, you know, there, there's a radius of the S2, and you measure energy and uh, the angular momentum in terms of that S2, and this is just a unitarity bound that comes from the conformal algebra. So that is the E equal to J bound. Yeah. No, he's asking about the units. The units uh, are, I mean, you said ADS radius to 1, ADS, so the units match. Yeah. There's no problem. Some it's, of, yeah. Uh, In some of the equations, I have said <laughs> L equal to the, 1. This E but is the scaling dimension of the of the algebra, okay. and this J is uh, the angular momentum on the... Yeah, uh, so if I restore the units, then L should show up. Uh, L, uh, will, L will show up, yes, yes. So L, J, L will show up. Yeah, J by L, perhaps. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, so now let me review... Uh, yeah. Is, is there a, a Euclidean gravity analog of this? Let's say we try to do the, the Gibbons Hawking path integral. Yeah. Uh, but we turn on some chemical potentials for the angular momentum. Uh, then, uh, do we find that there isn't a Euclidean saddle point for this 
you know, in that intermediate region that you showed, which yeah, is... The, yeah, I mean, we don't know a solution which uh, can serve as a Euclidean saddle point. I see. So not, so even away, so no, no, it's not just a Lorenzian issue, you're saying even in the even Euclidean, in the Euclidean we'll see this. Yeah, yeah. Just, just a quick question. The BPS bound that you're talking about comes from the conformal field theory notion no, no. of a BPS you can bound, or is it... So the simplest supergrave, like in like in flat space, you can take Einstein theory add a right. Uh, but here you also half. have a cosmological constant, so right? That's really the yeah, I mean so that's in, the issue here. In right? ADS case, you can also add the spin C half particle, and it will become a supersymmetric theory. So you can think of this B BPS bound coming from there. Yeah, it's the asymptotic property. So it has to do with yeah. So I mean, in may, maybe the question is. When you write BPS bound in quotations, Quotes, yeah. I just want a clarification. Yeah. Not, cha I mean, I. So, what does it mean compared to what you mean in, say, flat space it time? It means the same thing. It means the sp same, but there is obviously some minor difference because you're in 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 flat space. The BPS bounds are uh, uh, typically of the time m equal to q. In ADS, they have m, j, and q both. M equal to j plus q. It's the analog of the spectrum <coughs> condition in, in a flat space. Fact that you have to have, you know, certain, uh, you the BPS have algebra is different in ADS. It's coming from there. I mean, there is nothing funny. Yeah. So but it's the analog of the spectrum condition. Uh, in flat space, you would say that the energy has to be larger in the magnitude of the momentum. And this is that condition. Uh, it's the, you, the flat space condition that you're using. No, 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 no. It's no. an ADS it's condition. The ADS it's the condition. analog of the spectrum condition in flat space. Yeah. So actually, yeah, so actually now I remember, so 1 over L appears here, so E is J over L. Okay, so let's remember to go back to this yeah. discussion. Okay, so yeah, so the first puzzle is uh, what is happening here. Okay, so now uh, let me come to the second part. So this is the super radiance uh, instability. Okay, so rotating black holes can have ergo regions, and they can act as negative energy reservoirs for particles. So uh, this is something we teach in our courses. So we have Penrose process. That is that if a particle of energy E1 comes, uh, it can go out with energy E3 such that E3 is greater than uh, E1. And this can happen in any space time which has ergo region. So the wave analog of this uh, Penrose process is called the super radiance. And the idea here is that the returning signal is amplified. So it has, uh, the reflected signal, signal has more reflection coefficient than the, the incident signal. So I will try to give an example of this. So this is the diagram. So incident signal is coming with a smaller amplitude. The reflected signal is going with the greater amplitude. OK, so uh, I will give an example of how this comes about. Um, OK, so in a one plus one dimensional setup, it is very easy to see uh, how this comes about. So consider a complex killer field in the background of a vector field. And take the vector field to be as simple as possible. So just the uh, time component is turned on, the space component is uh, 0. And take this uh, at as a function of x to be of this type. So x going to minus infinity, it is 0. And x going to plus infinity, it takes this value uh, v. So now, um, now do quantum mechanical scattering uh, in this setup. And uh, what we are solving is uh, box phi equal to 0. Now the particle is charged, and there is a electric field turned on. So we have to modify the derivatives. So with the modified derivative, we write down the wave equation, which is this. Now in the x going to minus infinity, the solutions are simply e power minus i omega x, e power minus i omega t plus omega x, and e power minus i omega t minus omega x, like this. Um, uh, but in the x going to plus infinity, this at will turn on. And then the solution is slightly different. So the solution is e power i omega minus e v uh, times uh, times x. OK, so now uh, with this, we do our um, undergraduate scattering. Uh, we construct the Ronskian. Conservation of Ronskian will give us the relation between the reflection coefficient, uh, transmission coefficients, and so on. And this is the relation we get. So r squared is uh, i squared minus omega minus e v over omega times t squared. OK, so clearly we see that when omega is in between 0 and Ev, um, this quantity is uh, 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 negative. And as a result, this number is, this whole thing is positive, And we have r greater than uh, i. 
Okay, so in black holes, exactly the same thing happens. Um, but of course, the equations are uh, horrible, <laughs> if you say. So uh, in black holes, the relation that you get is like this. Uh, zero, uh, the, the frequency is between zero and m omega. So m is the, um, uh, the angular momentum mode of the, uh, of the scalar field. Okay, and this may look a bit funny, but this is perfectly consistent with the first law. And this is my slide to explain that how it is consistent with first law. So first law is uh, delta m equal to uh, t delta a plus omega delta j. And now you have a wave which looks like e power minus i omega t plus i m phi. So this curly phi is the angular coordinate. Um, and now for this wave, if you construct, I mean, there is a, there is a prefactor which, which I want to get rid, I mean, which I don't want to talk about. So that's why I consider delta j over delta e. So then this prefactor sort of disappears. So uh, delta j over delta e, uh, small calculation shows that this is this quantity, the stress tensor constructed out of this scalar. Uh, and if you just compute this, you find that this quantity is m over uh, omega. So m is here, omega is here. Okay, now you substitute this m over omega into this equation, and then you find that delta m is uh, proportional to delta a, and the prefactor is omega over omega minus uh, uh, m. Uh, omega. Okay, so clearly when uh, omega is less than this m times capital omega, then this quantity is negative, so delta m is uh, negative, so such waves can extract uh, energy from the black hole, and from this relation we also see that delta j is negative, so they extract both, ang both energy and angular momentum out of the black hole. But this is absolutely not a problem, perfectly consistent with first law. Um, and the second law, I mean, the area of the black hole increases. Uh, there is no uh, instability. I mean, Kerr black hole has no instability. The uh, radiation comes, gets amplified, but goes out. There is no problem. Okay. Now, if you do the same thing in ADS, uh, then there is something funny. And what you make is what is often called the black hole bomb. So in ADS, uh, we work with the reflecting, reflective boundary conditions. Uh, so you send in your wave in the super radiant scattering regime. So this wave gets amplified, and then it bounces back from the boundary, and then am gets amplified more. And you know this process keeps repeating, and as a result, you get an exponential growth uh, in this uh, uh, setup. And now you may ask, uh, uh, how does this? Exp I mean, this exponential growth already suggests there is some sort of instability, and how does it show up? So what you can do is that you can compute the quasi-normal modes of this black hole, and it will show up in the uh, uh, quasi-normal modes that some modes uh, have this uh, uh, instability. So what is that reflective boundary? Hmm? What is that boundary? The boundary is the ADS. So we are putting everything in ADS now. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a question. So I mean, I just want to understand the physical picture. Right? Yeah. So that's a black hole, it's embedded in ADS. Yeah, a rotating black hole. Right, and you're sending in some photon, let's say, initially. Yeah. It goes in and comes out amplified. Amplified, yeah. Then it goes, bounces off the ADS boundary, comes back in, yeah. amplifies again. Yeah. And that continues. That's that continues, and this leads to some sort of exponential growth. Right. And uh, now you, you ask, how, how can I make this precise? The, the way of making this precise is to look at uh, the quasi-normal modes. Okay. And in the quasi-normal mode spectrum, you will see there is some instability. But Thanks. the point here is that the, that the angular momentum does not decrease when the... This is a probe calculation. I mean, this way, I mean, it's very, dif it's somewhat difficult to, no, the... No, but if the angular momentum can decrease, then, then you prefer to caution the ADS. I'm sorry, it's just like what happened in the lambda equal to zero case. <laughs> Uh, as I say, this is difficult to make precise. This exponential picture is difficult to make precise. The best way is to compute the quasi-normal modes, and then you will see. Yeah. yeah another question. Oh. Yeah, the heuristic picture. Yeah. No. It could happen. I mean, this is a bit like a laser doing amplification. Yeah. And in a laser, we know that you can have saturation. Can that not happen at some finite amplitude uh, here? Actually, people have discussed reflecting boundary conditions at the horizon rather than at the infinity. And in that case, the laser phenomena is uh, like exactly mimicked. Uh, this is for so, so my question is, could there be saturation at some point? The exponential growth is only for small in the beginning. Yeah. After a while, you could have some nonlinear effects that stabilize the solution. 
Is that a possibility? So, as I keep saying, so this exponential growth picture is a bit naive. Its heuristic picture is difficult to make precise. Uh, the best, what I will do is I will compute the quasi-normal modes uh, and then show that there is an instability. So, so my question is related to what Sam asked and others yeah. also just asked. Uh, uh, I, I understand, so if I'm understanding, you compute the quasi-normal modes and with ingoing boundary conditions, you find a mode that actually has positive exponents. Mm -hmm. Right, but, uh, so this is very interesting, but surely, uh, you know, the quasi-normal mode is computed using the, the, the linearized wave equation. Yeah. And uh, the moment you start getting large enough amplitudes, the validity of that breaks down. So isn't yeah. what they are saying reasonable that you know if you go to large amplitudes then uh, you don't know what the endpoint is you have to study what the endpoint is. I will I will talk about you, the endpoint. Uh, yeah 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 yeah. Uh, Sudipto, you have a. No, let's make, uh, can we? No, I'm done. Yeah, let's continue the, the discussion. Okay, so so now you ask where is the threshold and where all this starts. So omega l equal to one is the threshold of this uh, instability. Uh, so detailed study of quasi-normal modes and general results. Um, uh, show that black holes with omega L greater than one are super radiantly uh, unstable. So uh, the quasi-normal mode studies were done in this uh, well-known paper uh, by Cardoso, Diaz, Hartnett, Lehner, and Santos. And uh, general results were established by uh, Green, Holland, Ishibashi, uh, and Wald. So um, I will not say much about this. I will actually say a few things about, uh, about this. Okay, so now, uh, so we have this diagram. Uh, we ask, uh, what is the range where um, uh, the things are becoming unstable? So, this, so I, I repeat, this is by studying the quasi-normal modes. So, in this slide, what I'm looking for is L equal to M equal to two uh, gravitational perturbations. And I am asking, what is the line beyond which the L equal to two, M equal to two mode becomes uh, unstable? So it turns out that line is this blue line um, um, and this purple line is omega L equal to one line. So, uh, so actually I need to sort of uh, zoom in on this uh, diagram. So I have E and J, then this is my unitarity line and this is my uh, extremal line and beyond the extremal line, there is this uh, L equal to M equal to two Q and M. Okay, where they are becoming unstable. So this is the region where the uh, uh, this mode is unstable. So this blue region in my diagram, this blue region is the place where L equal to two M equal to two uh, mode is unstable. units, presumably the smallest black hole is at Planck scale. Uh, but here, if I'm reading the scale right, maybe I'm, E by L is like 0 0.06 or something. <laughs> yeah. But that is much lower than the Planck scale. So there's no black hole at all at E by L equal to 0 0.06. So something is... Uh, this is, I'm just drawing the classical diagrams. I have my classical, even, classical black holes I'm doing. But even then, at, there's no black hole which has like 0 0.06 ADS, like... No, the, the curve, 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 for curve black holes, this small versus large issue is somewhat complicated. Um, I mean, technically what I'm talking about is large ADS black holes, but large uh, R plus actually never exceeds L in these cases. I mean, it, it's the, the diagram for the page, the, what do you call, Hawking page diagram is somewhat complicated for rotating black holes. Maybe you just remove an N squared in front of the unit? Like yeah, yeah. Every, everything is in units of n squared. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, so yeah. you mean e by l n squared? Actually. Yeah. The, the yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, everything is scaling with n squared in the ADS CFT language. No, it's okay. Yeah. Maybe let's let's stick to shorter questions and keep the, yeah. the longer ones for the discussion. Yeah. Okay. So this is l equal to two, m equal to two mode. But if you look at l equal to five, n equal to five mode, then you get this uh, greenish line. Uh, and uh, I, I don't have to do this more. So omega, equal, omega L equal to one is reached in the asymptotic limit M going to infinity. So if you look at M equal to three modes, then you know, this line is unstable. Then everything below this line is unstable and so on. And then it sort of saturates at uh, omega L equal to one line. So, uh, so the, all this, all this uh, uh, parameter space the uh, current ADS black holes are, are unstable. 
Okay, so my puzzle one was why ADS black holes do not exist in the region allowed by the BPS bound, but now I have puzzle two, what is the end point of this uh, super radiance uh, instability? And it is a puzzle because the issue has been discussed over 15 years, but still the, the subject is unsettled. So let me say a few things about uh, what is known about the, the end point. Okay, so here I am focusing on only the general relativity inspired uh, work. There is a lot of work on the CFT side also, which I'm not discussing. Okay, so a lot of physics has come out of this uh, discussion. Um, so there is a class of solutions which have come out. These are called black resonators. Uh, I will say a few things about them. And these and other solutions of this type, uh, they don't have partial T and partial phi as independent killing vectors. Only a combination of them is a killing vector. So these, are, these, these, these solutions have also been called black holes with only one uh, killing vector. Um, and a lot of numerical simulations people have done in order to answer these questions, but uh, uh, they are inconclusive for reasons I will explain. Okay, so let me say a few things about the black resonator. So black resonators are some sort of time periodic solution. So what is happening is that it's trying to realize this, uh, uh, this bouncing uh, back and forth uh, uh, in a precise way. So what we are looking at is L equal to two, M equal to two um, uh, mode where they become uh, unstable. So on this line, the imaginary part of the L equal to two, M equal to two mode is zero. So exactly at that point, um, what one can try to construct is uh, uh, this uh, time periodic solution where some waves go in, they bounce back, again go in, bounce back, and the whole thing is sort of stabilized in a uh, non-trivial way. And indeed one can construct uh, such solutions numerically. Um, uh, Gary Horowitz and Oscar Diaz, and Joy Santos, they were the first authors to construct such things. And uh, what one finds is that uh, partial T is not a killing vector because of this bouncing back and forth. Partial phi is not a killing vector. The whole thing is rotating in a certain way. Uh, but there is a, a combination one can write down which is a, a killing vector for uh, uh, for these solutions. So helical, some, some sort of helical killing vector is preserved, but the other two individually are not uh, preserved. But this solution is known only numerically. Only numerically, yeah, yeah. <coughs> The, okay, so let me make a comment. <laughs> so in four dimensions, the numerics is very difficult and it has not been followed up uh, much. But in five dimensions, where you can have cohomogeneity one situation, uh, A equal to B, myers uh, black holes. In that case, the numerics is just ODEs and that has been followed up uh, quite a bit. Many other people have also uh, looked at such things. You also are sure that that is the result. Yeah, yeah, that is where the non-trivialities are. Won't you still get a stability from higher partial radio modes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is the so black resonator solution. This is a practical challenge. Like black resonator solutions have been only constructed for L equal to mostly have been constructed for L equal to two, M equal to two mode. But of course, it has been conjectured that they exist for all of these lines. So M equal to five, L equal to five. There should be a black resonator. And uh, yeah. But unstable again, and L equals 2, M equals 2 would still be unstable again. So, yeah, this is, okay, it will become clear in a moment okay. that, uh, okay, let, this is the next slide. Okay, so black resonator solutions, they extend from the onset of super radiance instability, and they exist, they also exist in the region where Kerr radius solution does not exist, so they are sort of beyond uh, extremality. Uh, but the given, but given the results of Greenwald, Greenwald and Holland, it's clear that these solutions are also unstable. Yeah, this is this is what you were asking. Yeah. So since all these solutions have omega l greater than one, um, these solutions are also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nonlinear version at imaginary omega equal to zero line hmm. on that line. Yeah. Okay. So this let. Non-reflective. Uh, that <laughs> then it is, it's a different subject. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, so in some sense, <laughs> uh, 
frustrated by all these uh, instabilities and so on, uh, Horowitz, uh, Diaz, and uh, Santos conjectured that there is no endpoint uh, to this. Uh, because if you look at the time scales over which these things become unstable, the time scales also grows. So L equal to two mode is uh, sort of faster in growth, but L equal to three mode is slower in growth, and so on and so on. If you go L equal to infinity, the time scale diverges. So they are very slow instability, and um, they conjectured that there is no endpoint. <laughs> okay. So uh, I don't have time to uh, explain all the details, uh, but uh, but there is a very fascinating GR work um, that has come out of this problem. Especially, I really like this cohomogeneity one business of uh, uh, myers perry black holes with uh, A equal to B. There, everything is ODEs, and one can do a lot of work uh, in that direction. So if you're interested, you can look at papers by uh, Chesler and Love. They have done numerical analysis analysis, and uh, Ishii and Murata have done this uh, five-dimensional analysis, and number of papers uh, uh, Santos and Diaz have written. Okay, so uh, this brings me to gray galaxies. What is the gray galaxy? Okay, so this came out in uh, May 2023. This is the TFR group and uh, uh, Korean group, uh, uh, Seo Kim, uh, Shiraz, and uh, Chintan, uh, Lee, Lee, and Kundu. Okay, so the paper is very long. Uh, <laughs> is 115 pages. Uh, uh, it's, it's a proposal, I would say. I mean, um, but there is no exact solution that one can find uh, in this uh, paper, but also at the same time, there is no real exact working model with which one can uh, do more calculations. But still, uh, fairly convincing, and I will explain why uh, it is so. So the way I present this is I will present what a gray galaxy is, and then I will explain uh, more and more uh, what the features are. Okay, so gray galaxy is the following. <laughs> so this is my boundary of ADS. Um, there is a black hole uh, in ADS, and then it has some, there's some sort of accretion disk uh, around it. So the black hole is omega L equal to one. So black hole is at the threshold of this superradiance uh, instability, and then there is this galaxy around it, uh, sort of, accretion disk, and this accretion disk is quantum gas uh, at temperature T uh, and uh, omega L equal to one. So, so notice that uh, extremal line was the lowest uh, line. All these above black holes have non-zero temperature, and uh, so at, at that temperature, um, we have this uh, quantum gas, uh, and this gas is uh, not, uh, uh, not everywhere. I mean, the gas is uh, at uh, theta equal to pi over two plane mainly. Okay, so now let me explain why this makes sense and why this is, why should we take this? Okay, oh, oh, okay. Oh, before that, um, uh, let, me, let me explain uh, how much gas is there. So, okay. Okay, so, so this is my uh, uh, energy and uh, angular momentum. So this is some unitarity line. This is my extremal black hole. And uh, I will draw here. This is my omega L equal to one uh, black hole. Okay, so the proposal is the following. So, oh. Uh, so the lines are not 45 degrees, but okay. So the proposal is the following. So if you start with uh, one of these um, um, uh, unstable black holes, uh, what you do is that you move on the 45 degree line. So um, a line parallel to E equal to J line, and then you will hit uh, this line uh, at some place. You will hit omega L equal to one line uh, at some place, so that that energy and angular momentum, so let's call it E0, J0, and then there is this delta E and delta G. Delta E and de this extra bit. So the proposal is that um, um, you move along these 45 degree lines, and the place where you hit omega, omega L equal to one line, that is the, that is the sort of mass and energy of the, uh, energy and angular momentum of the central black hole, and whatever is left is goes into the quantum gas. 
So uh, here is the uh, sentences. So the proposal is to move along 45 degree lines. Uh, the central black hole is thermodynamically favored always. It has less mass, so more entropy and so on. Um, the whatever energy and angular momentum is left, uh, all that goes into the gas, and the gas is very far. Um, so this is related to what Subrat was asking. So uh, for for Kerr ADS black hole, the R plus uh, is of the order of L. So in my units, R plus is of the order of one. Uh, but the gas is very far away. In ADS safety language, this will be like growing like square root of n. OK, so why, why should we believe in this proposal? It's n. Yeah. Uh, no, I have uh, so <laughs> I have written it as square root L. Oh. L is the I, I will explain. It will become clear in the next slide. Yeah. Okay, but the key point is the gas is very far. Yeah. After some point, like saturation is reached once you hit the line, and then you get this new effect coming in. And uh, is that a yeah. Oh, Sam disappeared. No, it's here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was looking in the front. <laughs> no, I, I, the way I understood Sam's questions was for uh, arbitrary value of omega L. Uh, but here it's really omega L equal to 1. So you have to draw these lines, and you come to omega L equal to 1 black hole. and then the stable black hole, then you, you, see towards, you go towards instability. Yeah. Uh, the way you, you, you start with an unstable black hole, you go towards the stable configuration, ah. and that will be the, this is the proposal, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so why should we believe in this proposal? Why, why it makes sense? Yeah. But now you, that you've included a whole lot of other structure here, even when you uh, talk about anything like ADS-CFT, do you really know, I mean, in terms of the galaxy and all of this other stuff, I mean, the you're paper talking about a much much messy uh, yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. So, so the paper has paragraphs. Okay. Yeah, the paper has paragraphs. We can discuss this <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah. yeah, some. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's not a small discussion. Okay, so why should we believe in all this? Okay, the, the, so first of all, we saw from this numerical relativity or GR work, we could not find any endpoint. Uh, the, 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 those people conjectured that there is no endpoint. Uh, but what one can do is that look at the thermal gas in ADS. And, okay, and the best way to go about doing this is just look at mass, uh, actually I have written the formula for the massless scalar, but okay, so you can look at the massless scalar in ADS and look at the normal modes of ADS, uh, of massless scalar in ADS. So what you will find is omega n l m, this is delta plus l plus 2 n, so n is the overtone number, Delta is related to the mass of the scalar. L is the angular momentum of the mode. And the, the uh, M parameter, the, the spherical harmonic thing, this goes from minus L to, uh, to L. OK, so now with these modes, look at the multi-particle partition function over the single particle Hilbert space. So I construct this 1 over e power minus beta e minus omega beta jz, and I multiply all the modes. So in a normal situation, this quantity will converge because this number will be less than one. Uh, but look at this in ADS, what happens? So if you look at this, just look at this combination uh, for uh, L equal to M modes. So I'm not even worried about the lower modes, just L equal to M modes. Okay, so for L equal to M modes, when you have E, mi so this E minus omega J, um, at omega equal to one, this will just become delta plus two N. So the L and the M will cancel because omega L is uh, one. And now we, have, we are supposed to do product over all of L. So if you do this product over all of L, um, this product uh, uh, diverges. So this is essentially the reason why uh, we should uh, worry about this. Um, in the, so one can make all this more precise. One can look at how it diverges, uh, regulate this, try to figure out which modes dominate and so on. So that is 
the main content uh, of the paper, of this uh, TFR group paper. Uh, in the omega equal to one limit, the sum over S. So the product I converted into log of Z. So the sum over L uh, diverges and it gets cuts off. It cuts off at uh, um, like one over one over beta times one over one over beta times one minus omega. And the typical value that contribute the most is uh, is uh, L of the order of one over uh, beta times uh, one minus omega. Okay. So now going back to Suvras point. So if we, so now we should look at the scalar mode functions, scalar wave mode functions at this value of L and ask where they are localized in ADS. And they are localized at, as L, they are localized at R going to square root of L. Uh, but if you convert this into capital N, uh, then they are localized at square root of N. If there, is, there, there, is a, there is a discussion there. It requires a bit of a discussion. Okay, but the key point here is that the back reaction of the scalar cannot be ignored. And once you take into account, try to take into account this back reaction, then you will come up with this picture of uh, gray galaxies. So there is a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now let me uh, say what we are doing. And uh, 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 let's see. Okay, so one thing that I am interested in is uh, something called uh, revolving black holes. I don't have 100% clarity on this project, but I have been struggling with this. Uh, so this is really work in progress. So in ADS, what happens is that there are circular bound geodesics. Okay, this never happens in flat space. In flat space, the geodesics are straight lines. Okay, but in ADS, you have this funny feature that you can have circular bound orbits. So what you can do is that write your black hole solution in Kerr child form, and then apply one of these funny isometries, and uh, um, the transformation is such that it takes the um, the static particle into this um, revolving particle in ADS. And the question is, can we do this for a black hole metric? And uh, uh, so this is something we are struggling with. We plan to construct such metrics, and we are hoping that. It will, it will address part of the puzzle because uh, at least the way they look, they should have some different angular momentum compared to the curved black hole, and they should really have some angular momentum. Uh, so perhaps uh, they can be used to fill up this uh, region uh, between, uh, between the BPS bound and the, the range where curved black holes uh, do not exist. Okay, but this is really work in progress. We, we, have, we are actually, right now, we are struggling with some group theory stuff. Okay, <clears throat> so the other project that we are working on is uh, we are looking at uh, tidal forces in the gray galaxies. So this is the project with the two undergraduate students. And uh, I thought of talking about this a bit more because I think this work will connect more to the uh, GR audience. Uh, so what we do is the following. So we model the gas as accretion disk. This is a very naive model. Um, uh, so, okay, well, I should explain one more thing. So in the uh, TFR group paper, they are unable to take into account any sort of back reaction of the black hole on the gas. And uh, this is our attempt to understand the back reaction of the black hole on the gas. So what we do is that we model the gas as accretion disk. And then, then we use some fancy properties of Kerr black holes. So Kerr ADS black hole admits what is called Killing-Yano uh, tensor. And what we can do is that we can use this killing Yano tensor to construct a parallelly transported tetrad frame along any of these uh, geodesics. And if we model the gas as accretion disk, then we can calculate tidal forces on this, uh, uh, on this gas. Okay, so this is the idea. Uh, this idea is uh, uh, motivated by a paper of Penrose in 73 and Mark in uh, 83. Okay, so the aim is to construct a parallelly propagated orthonormal tetrad frame, which satisfies Amita? this equation for yeah. arbitrary so geodesic. So, I mean, God, ADS is also a vacuum solution, right? Uh, I with mean, with yeah. cosmological constraints. Yeah, but yeah. once you put this gas hmm. as the back reaction, it's no longer a vacuum solution. Nobody knows the solution. This is the reason I said I, this is not an exact, there is no exact solution in that paper. And uh, the, the motivation of uh, the gray galaxies is really coming mostly from this discussion, that if you consider thermal gas, gas in ADS, then the saddle point changes. And hence, one should 
one should consider the back reaction of the scalar. But the back so reaction may... That is a classical, you mean classical, classical discussion. discussion. Here we are talking about um, uh, ensemble uh, at finite temperature, finite angular velocity. But it even need not be a black hole, right? Once the vac reaction set in? Or? Yeah, well, so nobody knows. I mean, the proposal is that uh, you should do this. Uh, and once you do this, you will find this. Okay. This is the proposal. <laughs> Let, let, let's maybe finish oh, because galaxies we, because they look like galaxies. Yeah. Okay, but but the proposal is, I would say very well motivated and actually if you look at the literature it goes back to Hawking and Hunter, uh, Hawking and Hunter uh, uh, many many years ago. Okay, so what we are trying to do is that we were trying to construct this uh, orthonormal tetrad. And uh, I will just flash some slides. Uh, uh, I will just very briefly explain how we do this. Uh, this is uh, a part which will perhaps resonate with the GR-oriented uh, people. <coughs> so what we look at is uh, Carter's tetrad frame. And uh, if you just square these things and add them up, then you get the Kerr uh, ADS metric. Okay, so I don't write the um, all the other things, but. Okay, so now what you do is that uh, you take this uh, 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 tetrad and contract it with the geodesic uh, uh, tangent vector. So uh, because the geodesic tangent vector by definition is parallelly transported, so the first component is simply this vector. Okay, so a simple calculation will give you the component of this vector in the tetrad frame. And here you have to use the killing tensor in order to separate the geodesic equations and you will write some expressions for r dot, theta dot, and uh, in terms of e and j and so on. Okay, so this is very easy. This is uh, nothing very fancy. And also, it uses killing tenses, which are part of the textbook material. Okay, but now, uh, it was pointed out by Penrose that once you have one parallelly transported vector, and if your space-time admits a killing Yano tensor, then you can construct another vector by doing this construction. So you just take the killing Yano tensor, contract it with the lambda, and then you will get another parallelly transported uh, vector. And the norm of this vector turns out to be related to the Carter's constant. So we renormalize, I mean, so, uh, normalize this uh, in this way, and then you will get the second uh, component of this uh, tetrad frame. Okay, so now we have constructed lambda zero and lambda two. Now the aim is to construct lambda one and lambda three. Uh, so once you have two orthonormal vectors, you can just look at them very carefully and try to guess what are the natural other two orthonormal vectors. So just looking at, looking at lambda zero and lambda two carefully, you can try to guess what are the lambda one tilde, lambda, lambda three tilde, such that they complete the orthonormal basis. So this is, I mean, undergraduate students, they are very smart. They just looked at these things a few days and they came up with uh, this answer, which is very similar to what Mark uh, also did. Okay, so we introduced these uh, these uh, crazy quantities with alpha and beta given by these. Okay, so you see, they are really constructed out of r dot, uh, theta dot, but the, the, the places where r dot and theta dot appear, they are interchanged compared to the previous uh, thing. So here they are in r dot, theta dot here, here they appear uh, here and here, and so on. I mean, you have to play with it a little bit, and then you can come up with uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, lambda one tilde and lambda three tilde. Okay, so these vectors uh, are good in the sense they're orthonormal, but they are not parallel transported. And then what you can do, you can ask how much they are not parallel transported. And it turns out that if you just do a rotation between these two vectors, you can find uh, a combination which is parallel transported. Okay, so this is a long calculation. We have done it in uh, Mathematica and uh, uh, what you find is that uh, uh, you can find a combination, just rotation between these tildes into untildes, where you have an orthonormal frame, which is parallel transported along an arbitrary geodesic. Okay, so once you have this parallel transported frame, what you do is that you contract with the wild tensor and you will get a tidal tensor. And this tensor will allow us to estimate gravitational forces on the gas uh, that have been ignored uh, so far. So this is what uh, we have been doing. Uh, uh, so this is where I will end. So here is my summary. Uh, I gave some properties of uh, Kerr-ADS black hole. I reviewed superradiance instability. 
Then I said a few things about the endpoint in the GR literature. Um, the, 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 the conjecture seems to be that there is no classical endpoint, and then uh, we are led to this gray galaxies proposal where there is a quantum gas um, in the black hole, and then um, uh, we have been trying to struggle with uh, some of these things, uh, constructing revolving black holes or tidal forces. So with this, I will stop. Maybe one quick question. Hello, hello. <laughs> Yeah, actually, the students, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah, it's working. Yeah, yeah. So, at the end, uh, you mentioned about uh, switching back to some until uh, frame to uh, till uh, frame. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, maybe you have mentioned it, but what was the motivation oh. of doing, uh, oh, no, changing no, no. the frame? Yeah, yeah. So, this is just... Uh, so, so these lambda tildes is not the, the vectors that I want. These vectors, although they form the complete orthonormal basis, they are not parallel transported. These are not parallel transported. So, but what we realize is that if we just do this simple rotation between these tildes, uh, just like so, then you can construct a quantity which is parallel transported at, at the same time orthonormal. Okay. Yeah. And uh, there is a unique shy also the the size so the size satisfies a differential equation i did not so there is there are more equations below which i did not write uh size satisfies a differential equation which you can separate into r part and theta part uh -huh. so that is very much really you know how do you call the magic of killing yano tensor uh -huh. so <laughs> does it uh, uh, like uh, is it related to some conserved quantity uh, like the uh, no so the conserved quantity is the k the capital K, K, the K. Carter's constant. Carter's constant. But here we are using more refined property, this killing Yano. Oh. Uh, killing Yano, square of killing Yano is the Carter, roughly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe a last question. Hello, you want to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Here's your chance. So, so I will have just a small question. So if you start with the stable, as you were explaining before, the it's exponential instability, that yeah. there is exponential uh, because yeah, yeah, of yeah. quasi-normal modes analysis. Yeah, so one of these black holes, like somewhere here. Yeah, exactly. And then yeah. the, so the instability will basically take you towards this line, right? The, the allowed the, line. No, stable, uh, you said no, stable. Yeah, but I'm saying then you do the original instability that you The original stability is only between these wedges. No, but is this what you mean? No, I, I, I thought that the initial explanation you gave of the quasi-normal modes is that you know, once you have more and more uh, yeah, only, only between these wedges. So, uh, the the first, the, the the simplest mode is unstable somewhere here. Then uh, a more complicated mode is unstable here. In the limit m going to infinity, you reach this line. So only between this two okay, wedges. Okay. So in the context of quasi-normal modes analysis, what happens once you have this, uh, you know, once you have this uh, uh, unstable quasi-normal modes? Like this picture has any connection with that at all? Or uh, no, because that is a probe uh, probe calculation. So you will just compute those modes, and then you will find them to be negative, positive, and that's where the analysis will stop. OK, and then you, this takes over. This is just yeah. endpoint solution, the endpoint solution. It, then, then, you, then you write another paper saying that I have <coughs> this uh, uh, <laughs> omega imaginary equal to 0 line, and I s ask what happens uh, if I can construct nonlinear solutions. Yeah, just a very small question. This accretion, in the accretion disk model that you uh, yeah. want to study, the, so the the energy of the accretion disk is the expectation value of energy of the quantum gas that Chiraz and others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the accretion disk has this much energy and this much angular But accretion disk is classical in the sense that the qu quantum gas has some fluctuations also in the energy, which you are ignoring so right now. We don't know how to model. I mean, actually, yeah, there is okay. no very good model of okay. any of this. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, quick and... So, I mean, does this resolve the instability, the existence of this uh, so the gas? The, yeah, exactly. So the proposal um, uh, proposal resolves the instability. Right? So, I mean, so it combines everything. Um, there is no classical endpoint. This is what these uh, uh, Horowitz, uh, Diaz, and Santos conjecture. And the proposal says that, yeah, there is no classical endpoint, but there is a sort of coarse-grained semi-quantum semi-classical endpoint. And that endpoint is given by these gray galaxies. So this, it 
this quantum gas serves to screen, so to speak, the, the black hole it, from the ADS boundary? Not, I mean, it will be a gas around the black hole, um, consistent with Hartle-Hawking state of the black hole, and it will carry energy and angular momentum, but will not be able to carry any entropy for reasons I could not explain. Uh, and the entropy of the entropy of the gas and the black hole will be given by uh, the, the the place where the line intersects. It's a longer discussion. I mean, the the paper is very long actually. It has many many aspects. No, this is following up an earlier question from Deepak. No? Yeah. Suppose you take the regular curve metric, in, not in ADS, but in fla asymptotically yeah. flat space, yeah. and you put reflecting boundary conditions or a physical mirror. Black hole bomb. Yeah. Would that form? Would that have the same problems? Uh, 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 yeah. So, uh, indeed, uh, Cardoso et al. initially studied that setup, and mm. indeed, it has instability. Yeah. Okay. And what they said is that the mirror shatters, the mirror breaks at some point. Uh, okay. So about this, let me say one more sentence. Um, so how to put Drishle boundary condition in ADS was a very subtle issue because all this quasi-normal mode analysis will be done in terms of neumann penrose scalars. Um, and what is the correct boundary condition for Psi-4 uh, in which uh, consistent with Drishle? I mean, this took many years to settle. It was, uh, yeah. there was a lot of confusion about all this. And just a comment, yeah. this problem, there was a, you were talking about finding a parallel transported tetrad. Yeah. So there was a paper by Penrose and Floyd in around the same time. Yeah. And they've done it for the lambda equal to zero case. It uh, might. Oh, I see. Okay, I did not know that paper. So yeah. the paper that we we used is this paper by Mark, uh, in '83, uh, and it, it this paper uses the construction of Penrose, uh, but Penrose not Penrose Floyd. Uh, it uh -huh. was uh, independent. Yeah. I, I can find the reference. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks. I had a comment first on a question which you are discussing. I guess it's not surprising that the endpoint has team union not equal to zero because yeah. uh, once you perturb the mode, you generate a stress tensor. So that's not surprising. But I really didn't understand the motivation for the Gray Galaxy proposal, which I had not even realized was such a strong proposal. Yeah. Because what you presented earlier was the formation, as far as I could see, of a Bose Einstein condensate in empty ADS, right? Yeah. You take temperature yeah. to zero and yeah. you get a Bose Einstein condensate. Yeah. And there it's not surprising that you know, you're doing a quantum analysis, you find a Bose Einstein condensate. Now you're saying that in a, there's a classical analysis that gives rise to some exponential instability. And if you could solve the full Einstein equations, presumably you'd get some singularity, like if you did it. Uh, yeah. is that, but somehow that's resolved by the sudden appearance of this quantum effect. Not I mean, sudden. What I mean is the, the, even the, the evolution, the yeah. evolution will go on and on and on. And after some time, quantum physics will take over, and then so gray galaxy. But I have not understood the logic and also the relationship to the empty ADS, uh, the empty okay. ADS proposal. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, okay, you know, that's yeah. Bose Einstein yeah. condensate, so, and this so, is about okay, a black exactly. hole. They're very different. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. What so, is the logic? So, uh, so okay, this is the reason I said that uh, there is no exact working model, and certainly there is no exact solution in the paper. Yeah, but this is the main point. The gas is very far. This is the reason I wrote this. So the it, no matter how big the black hole in ADS, how how big how what mass and angular momentum you consider in ADS, per ADS per, per black hole in ADS, the R plus you will see that it is bounded from uh, above. Okay, and, and then the gap, if you analyze the, the 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 quantum modes of a scalar field, they are localized very far away from the ADS, and hence the idea that uh, black hole and the gas weakly interact. So one can do this so in. Th this is an example of a theory where you're saying the h bar goes to zero limit doesn't exist, and if you work in that limit, you'll get some wrong answers. But the classical singularity is resolved by a quantum effect, which sounds like an extremely strong uh, statement. So what it would be nice to have. There is no singularity. I mean, some classical. The, the 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 evolution never stops. It just keeps on going. Uh, let's say you could solve. Uh, we were we had s very s strong supercomputers which we could use to solve the Einstein equations exactly. Okay. Then I perturb it. Uh, something will happen with this exponential instability. Uh, yeah. What maybe some kind of singularity will. And be so what people have shown. This is Chesler and Love. What uh -huh. they have shown is that you start with one of these black holes here. Um, then you will first develop an m equal to two, l equal to two, this black re black resonator kind of solution, and then from the arguments of Wald and Green and so on. This is unstable, so they continue the simulation. And you continue the simulation, you will find that a new black resonator appears at m equal to 3, l equal to 3. And this way, it just keeps on going. Uh, what you're saying? No, this is numerical simulation. I see. Yeah. 
and, and, the, and the paper of uh, TFR group actually compares uh, to, to the extent possible with this numerical simulation. Okay, so there's lots of discussions for the discussion <laughs> session. Let's okay. thank Amitabh again. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so uh, obviously there are lots of questions. Sorry for being such a tyrant about it, but we do have that one plus hours later, which, uh, 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 which I. Um, uh, thanks to um, uh, G, uh, Gra GRG editor Myri, who's here, and to Sumanta's um, suggestion, uh, we would really like to make, uh, you know, and, and also looking at the quality of talks that have been here, with uh, the degree of pedagogy that we've seen, um, we really feel strongly that it would be lovely to have uh, an issue, a uh, special issue, um, quantum gravity at RRI. Um, and of course, we can't extract this out of you, but we'd be very grateful if, um, uh, you know, we'll, go, we'll do a formal uh, request for, uh, for, for contributions, but it would be really nice to have such an um, issue will be good for RRI because it's on our 75th anniversary, but it's also, I think, something that, you know, given the level of pedagogy we've seen so far, it'll be something that perhaps will go down through the generations. Um, so <laughs> this famous uh, meeting that we had, but yeah, I think it'll be useful on many, many fronts. So not just to make us, you know, have something you know, uh, uh, some sort of statement to make, but more that it's actually of, will be of serious scientific value to have so many different approaches represented in one special issue. So thank you, Mayri, and uh, thanks to Manta, who's not here. Uh, okay, so that will all come in the email, <laughs> as well as veiled threats. I will not make them in public. Okay, uh, so let's uh, head for lunch. And.
Chair has not arrived. Uh, thank you, Alok. Thank you a lot. Okay, so let's start with the session. We are very, hap very happy to have uh, Yasaman from Imperial College, and she's going to tell us about old and new cosmological puzzles with lambda from causal set theory. Thank so you. So I will give the 10 and the 5. Thank you. And, and thank you to the organizers of this conference. It's great to be here and to be part of this wonderful celebration. Uh, so yes, I'm going to uh, talk about the ever-present lambda dark energy model from causal set theory and how it relates to some old and new cosmological puzzles. Some of what I will talk about is based on joint work with Santanu Das, who's a postdoc at Imperial College, and Arad Nasiri, who's a PhD student at Imperial. And you can find this work in these two papers on the archives. The first one primarily focuses on the theoretical background and statistical properties of this model. And the second one primarily focuses on comparisons with observations. So one of the oldest mysteries in cosmology is what is the nature and origin of dark energy? Um, and is it a cosmological constant? Is it dynamical? Is it a fluid? Is it stochastic? And so on. And related to some of these questions are the cosmological co constant puzzles and how some obvious ways of thinking about dark energy as vacuum energy are difficult to reconcile with the present day observed value of it without fine tuning. More recently, there have emerged some new tensions in cosmology. One of these is called uh, the Hubble tension. Um, so in the Hubble tension, there are disagreements between uh, predictions made for the present day value of the Hubble parameter based on measurements of the CMB, for example, from the Planck data and predictions of the Hubble parameter today from more local observations, for example, from supernovae, from Cepheid stars, and tip of the red giant branch. So the, the value predicted from the CMB observations is a lower value, and the value predicted from the local observations is a larger value. And the, the disagreement is beyond the uncertainties that go along with the measured values uh, for those uh, quantities. Of course, the precise degree of the disagreement depends on the particular combination of data sets one considers, but under some standard um, choices, it's around five sigma, so it's statistically significant. And another important uh, recent tension in cosmology is called the S8 or sigma 8 tension. So S8 is a measure of how inhomogeneous the universe is. And the CMB data predicts a more inhomogeneous universe than galaxy cluster measurements show. And similarly, the, the uncertainties are smaller than the level of disagreement 
Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a statistically significant uh, tension. So, so there's, a, there's a good chance that new physics is needed to resolve these tensions, and it's exciting to have these uh, recent puzzles to think about in addition to some of the older ones. Uh, now, we don't necessarily know whether quantum gravity will be needed to understand these questions, but there's certainly an opportunity here for quantum gravity to shed light on these questions in a well-motivated way. And as others already mentioned earlier in this conference, this will also inform our search for a theory of quantum gravity. And I am at least optimistic that by thinking of quantum gravity together with these open questions in cosmology, that we will make progress in both of these. And this applies to other open questions in cosmology as well. For example, the nature of dark matter and what's happening in the early universe and some other questions. But in this talk, I want to focus on these questions surrounding dark energy. And I want to tell you about what the ever-present lambda uh, model of dark energy from the causal set theory approach to quantum gravity has to say about them. So here's an outline of what I plan to tell you about. I'll start with some uh, brief, uh, with a brief review of causal set theory. I'll be repeating a lot of the things that you've heard already from the earlier talks on causal sets. And I'll also review some of the basic motivations and theoretical background of the ever-present lambda idea. I'll then show you how ever-present lambda provides a way out of the cosmological constant puzzles without the need for fine-tuning. Then I'll review a concrete phenomenological implementation of ever-present lambda, which allows us to conduct statistical and observational studies of the model. Then I'll discuss some uh, statistical results coming from simulations based on this model. And I'll also talk about some subtleties that arise in interpreting the results from those simulations. I'll show you some uh, recent results from uh, observational tests of these models using the CMB and supernova data. And I'll end with coming back to the topic of the recent tensions and talking a little bit about what some of the future directions of this work are. So, so this is the part where I'm going to repeat a lot of things that you've heard already. Uh, so a causal set is a locally finite, partially ordered set. The set is a set of space-time elements. And the ordering relation is the causal precedence relation, so which elements causally precede which other elements. Here's an example of a causal set. The circles are the causal set elements. The lines are the causal relations, and the arrows indicate the direction of the relation. So time goes up. For example, y is in the causal past of z, and z is to the causal past of x. Now, there are two key properties of causal sets that are the main ingredient to the ever-present lambda idea. One of these key properties is related to the dynamics, and one of them is related to the kinematics. I'm going to start with the one that's related to the dynamics. So in a large class of classical dynamical models for causal sets, a causal set grows element by element sequentially. At stage one, the first element is born. And subsequently, at each stage n, we have an n element causal set. Each new nth element selects a random subset of the existing elements to be in its causal past. While this choice is made stochastically, there are some rules to ensure causality and a suitable analog of discrete covariance are preserved by this ancestor selection process. And here's a diagram showing one step of such a growth process. So this four element causal set down here can grow into one of these five, five element causal sets above it. And because of this elemental growth of this causal set, 
the number of elements in a causal set plays a role similar to time. So as time passes, the causal set grows in number, and as the causal set grows in number, similarly, time in some sense passes. Now, while we don't really know what the quantum dynamics for causal sets is going to look like, the most natural framework for it is a path integral or sum over histories framework. And then, instead of putting something like a fixed time interval constraint on that path integral, because of this analogy between time and the number of elements that I just mentioned, it makes sense to fix the number of elements in, in this path integral for, in this quantum path integral for causal sets. And this is the, the key ingredient that we'll need from the causal set dynamics. That the number of element plays a role similar to time, at least as far as something like a constraint on a path integral is concerned. So now for the second key point, which is related to the kinematics, not every causal set can be related to or approximated by a continuum manifold, but those that can be have a number volume correspondence such that if we were to take one of these discrete causal sets and embed it in a continuum manifold, there would be a number volume correspondent, the, the, the number volume correspondence would mean that the number of elements within N within any arbitrary region with volume V would be statistically proportional to V. And the Poisson distribution ensures this correspondence with minimal variance. So if we want to study causal sets that resemble a certain space time, we can generate them by placing points at random in the manifold using a Poisson process such that the probability of having n elements in a region of space-time volume V is given by this expression, V to the power n over n factorial uh, times e to the power uh, minus V, where I've set the proportionality constant between V and n to one in writing this expression. And, and this is just the definition of the Poisson distribution. This is an example of a causal set generated in this way using a finite volume of the sitter space time. So this is the key point that we'll need from the causal set kinematics, that the number of elements in manifold-like causal sets follows a Poisson distribution. So here again, I've set the proportionality constant between the number and volume to one. So the mean number of elements representing a region of space-time volume V is V, and the standard deviation of the number of elements representing a space-time region with volume V is square root V. And we also have a converse relation that an n-element causal set can be approximated by a range of volumes that are Poisson distributed. So now let's see how we can put together these two key ingredients and arrive at the ever-present lambda idea. So as I mentioned, we don't yet know what the quantum dynamics for causal sets are, but we expect it to be some form of uh, path integral dynamics. So now imagine that whatever this dynamics is, we are in a regime where it can be approximated by an effective continuum gravitational path integrals, for example, with something like the Einstein-Hilbert action uh, in the exponent here. And remember that from the causal set perspective, it makes sense to fix the number of elements as a constraint on the path integral, but because we're in an effective continuum picture here, that translates to fixing the space-time volume. So that's the constraint that we're going to consider on this path integral. And this is also a version of what is considered in uh, unimodular gravity. Next, let's perform a Fourier transform on this expression where I've labeled the Fourier transform variable lambda, but at this point it's just an arbitrary variable. After we uh, reverse the order of integration and apply the volume constraint, 
we would arrive at an expression where this Fourier transform lambda variable has now appeared in the same role as a cosmological constant. So we can interpret it as a cosmological constant. And because this, this lambda and the space-time volume V were related by a Fourier transform, they are quantum mechanically conjugate variables with a, a corresponding uncertainty relation that I've written here. So delta lambda over eight pi G times delta V greater than or equal to H bar over two. I've kept the dimensionful constants here, but I'm gonna drop them. Yes? Uh, <coughs> I have two questions. Uh, so if you're doing a Fourier transform, you are working with some background geometry, right? No. <coughs> so, no, it's just that the, the global space-time volume is fixed, but this is a path integral over um, any geometry with this constraint. Okay. Uh, and the second thing is I just wanted to point out that the fact that lambda is conjugate uh, to volume is something that arises in um, what is known as black hole chemistry or black hole thermodynamics in ADS spaces also. So you can construct a, a first law uh, where, and it turns out that uh, this relationship is obeyed there, so. Sure, yeah, I, I think there are different ways of, of seeing this. It, it could be that that is one as well. I'm not familiar with it. Just, just a clarification. So you start off with. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. No, so you start off with some path integral for, for what? For quantum gravity? Is that that the the, the one? No. So over, it's. So what what is what are you doing over here? What is the partition function supposed to do for so, you? So this is just a generic gravitational path integral. And the only input coming from the deeper quantum regime where we don't know what the path integral looks like is to motivate this constraint. Okay, but at, 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 at some, I mean, how, how is this the partition function which you would write down even formally for quantum gravity or? This is, this is a semi-classical. Um, okay. Yeah. But with the volume fixed? Yes, some with, with, with the volume fixed as a constraint on it. Okay, so, so what classically comes out is unimodular gravity, is that, is that correct or? So, yeah, so, so, um, so similar to unimodular gravity, classically the usual Einstein equations come out of this. Quantum mechanically, different things um, can happen depending on this constraint. Okay, maybe as you go, go along, I'll. Yeah, I was also wondering about the, this volume constraint. So, uh, I mean, presumably, it, it's kind of a compu also computational help, like to be able to do to do this computation, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. And at some point, you want to remove it. But I'm a little worried about the connection with the cosmological constant. If you want the cosmological constant to arise uh, as a feature of the theory, should it be a feature that is so connected to a finite volume? So, so I'm not gonna actually use this path integral to derive any dynamical equations or anything that I'm gonna use. The only thing I want to use it for is to arrive at this, to motivate this conjugacy relation between uh, the cosmological constant and the volume, that's it. I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna use it to, to evolve any system or oh, anything. Oh, you're not using the path integral to do No, okay. no, J so just wait. to motivate this. Sorry, but uh, you seem to have used this uncertainty relations, but which space really do these operators act on? Which Hilbert space is this? What all is happening? So, so I, I, I'm gonna, um, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna say a lot more about this uncertainty relation, but 
um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is, is classical in nature, so I'm not really going to go deep into, I'm not going to construct wave, wave functions or anything out of these, uh, simply because we don't know concretely how to do those things, and, and for the purposes of what I'm going to talk about, we don't need it. Um, but perhaps in the future, refinements can be inspired by um, having a better idea of what the quantum side of things look like. But um, I don't know at this point, and I'm not going to need it for what I'll talk about. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So we have this this uncertainty relation, and. We can learn more about this uncertainty relation uh, using our insight from causal set kinematics. So uh, remember that what we actually want to do is to hold the number of elements fixed because we have a causal set in mind. But because we didn't know how to write the path integral for the causal set, uh, we worked in this semi-classical picture with, with volumes. Um, and, and we're also assuming that we're in a re regime where the number of elements is very large and we can talk about something like a continuum correspondence. The other thing I mentioned already was that an n element causal set that is large enough to have a continuum correspondence has a range of volumes that will approximate uh, it uh, well, which is uh, Poisson distributed. And so, um, so we use that to interpret this delta V in the uncertainty relation as the standard deviation of the Poisson distribution, which goes as square root N or square root B. And, and like I already said, we're also in a regime where the number of elements is very large and therefore the volume is also very large and therefore the Poisson distribution goes over to a Gaussian distribution and we saturate the uncertainty relation. So now we have this nicer expression uh, that, that also gives us the standard deviation of lambda in terms of the standard deviation for the volume, which we know, know from the Poisson distribution. But nothing I've said so far tells us anything about the mean uh, of, of this uh, variable lambda, just the standard deviation. And this is an open question of this idea, what the mean of lambda is. I'm just going to follow previous work and assume that the mean of lambda is zero. So now let me put together everything I've said. So we're assuming that the mean of lambda is zero. So lambda statistically is equal to its mean plus standard deviation. So lambda is approximately delta lambda. Delta lambda goes as one over delta V. Delta V goes as square root V. And now if we want to connect this to our universe, we can substitute in for this V the volume of the observable universe, which in an FRW-like uh, universe, dimensionally in four dimensions, the volume goes as one over the Hubble parameter to the power four. So then lambda goes as the Hubble parameter square. And then finally, let's substitute in the value of the Hubble parameter today uh, into here. And in Planck units, we get approximately 10 to the power minus 121, which is approximately the observed value of uh, the cosmological constant today. And it is in this way that ever-present lambda provides an explanation for the presently observed very small but non-zero value of the cosmological constant. Sorry, I was wondering, I could as well in a very heuristic way say that, uh, you know, V, one of the square root of V goes like H square. I mean, I don't see very much the, 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 the so, I don't see very much, you know, where 
the, the causal search kind. I find like an empirical thing that you know, I know what I want to find and therefore I find it. So, I, so, I, I, so could, I, I could play I, I back, back of the envelope and say that, yeah, yeah, this, this I mean, I could, I could say that the volume, the volume, of course, is related to the rate of expansion. So that I could play with that and find a relation between the volume of the universe and the Hubble. And I don't see how, you know, how so this is really very robust that comes from, from causal sets. I'm a bit. So, so, so I will get to the history of this in the next slide. But, but to your point of backwards engineering it, this argument actually. Um, a, a simpler version of it predates the observations that gave us this precise value of the cosmological. I'm not function. talking for the precise value. I'm talking about one over square root of v goes like h squared. This is something I could play, and I could come up with that in a very, you know, kind of, uh, of you know, heuristic argument. But I, I cannot really uh, um, see that. The origin is causal sets. I mean, uh, I, I found. I mean, if if you have a different way of getting it, uh, that, uh, this but, is for my mind. You want to find that, and you put that. I, I honestly, well, I don't see well the very robust. Well, I used the Poisson distribution here for the square root v, and I've used this volume constraint to get the uncertainty. So, so in maybe the just first to place, but I, I'll just ask yeah. a small follow-up thing. So I thought the causal set input is that the fluctuation goes a square root of v. That's which one is precisely the, main, the causal yes, set yes, input, right? Yes. Everything else is not a causal set. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yes, that, that's just what I was going to say, that the relationship of 1 over the square root of v to h squared, there's no claim that that comes from causal sets. It's the relationship of that to the cosmological constant. Uh, sorry. The sign is still ambiguous here, right? You yes, just yes, want I to should say have that highlighted that. Up to a sign, up to a sign. Yeah, it's so in that range. Yes, okay. up to a sign. Up to a sign, so it, it, yeah, neither positive nor negative is preferred, so. And up to assuming lambda is zero, the mean is zero. Yes, right? yes, with, with that assumption as well. Okay, um, right. So, um, so let me just, before I, I move on, um, emphasize that this ever-present lambda idea is actually a really old idea. Some of the earliest references, as I uh, mentioned uh, a minute ago, uh, date even before the supernova observations uh, confirmed the small but non-zero value of the cosmological constant. So the, the earliest references are from 1987 when the idea was presented uh, in conference talks by Rafael Sorkin and these records are from the conference proceedings. After that, uh, there was some follow-up work, for example, by Sorkin again in the 90s. In 2004, the first concrete phenomenological model of ever-present lambda was introduced in this paper. And this is the same model I'm going to talk about um, for the rest of the talk. In these papers, some other models of ever-present lambda were considered. And finally, most recently, it's been taken up again by me and my collaborators. So it, it has a long but sparse history, um, I suppose. OK, so, so the main idea of ever-present lambda was that statistically and up to a sign, uh, the cosmological constant at any epoch, at any epoch goes roughly the square root of the space-time volume. But we still need to know uh, some more information to be able to simulate the evolution of this lambda and how its values at different times correlate with each other. And as I said, a concrete model that does this was introduced in this paper, and I'm going to review it and focus on it for the rest of the talk. So the, the model is called Model 1 in, in later literature. And the main inspiration comes from imagining each causal set element to contribute an equal amount, equal amount in magnitude, but with random sign, to the cosmological constant part of the action. There's also a free parameter in this model alpha, which sets the magnitude of the uh, single element contribution. 
And if I had kept the dimension for constants, you would see that it can be related to the ratio between the discreteness length and the Planck length. So, so then the, the effective cosmological constant part of the action at any time t is the sum of all of these single element contributions uh, from the elements in the past light cone of an observer at that time. So because the single element one had mean, z mean zero and standard deviation alpha, the sum of n of them uh, will, will go as square root n or square root v, and the effective cosmological constant will go as one over uh, square root v as, as we intended our model to reproduce. And we can implement this model recursively. Here's a diagram uh, representing a simplified picture of what's happening. So at, at, each time, uh, at each time t, the effective cosmological constant is the contribution from all the single element contributions to the past light cone of an observer there. And then at each later time, the cosmological constant is just the old cosmological constant plus the contributions in the past light cone of the later time that were not in the uh, earlier time. Now, of course, computationally, it's not actually feasible to add up all of these single element contributions. So we model this using uh, the central limit theorem and a series of random numbers and the calculated volumes at a, at a series of different times. For our volume, yes, sir, maybe yeah. I, I can ask a small clarification question. So this is related to the sequential growth model that you spoke about before. No, or no. It's a, but it's it's an independent uh, model of the growth. Yes. Yeah, so it's um, so we we want to think up a model that will reproduce this behavior, and and this is kind of the the motivation given, but it doesn't come from any other. I think just very broadly, the idea is that as n increases, space-time volume increases. And so that's essentially all that's going into this model. So sequential growth is a sort of a much more you know, deeper way of looking at it. But at this level, at the effective level, that's the only, from what I can tell, that's the only takeaway I, message. I suppose maybe another connection you picked up on is that it's, it's evolution in some sense is a process. Um, where you need to, um, yeah, so that, there's that similarity as well. So for our volume calculations, we assume an FLRW universe, uh, and we use this uh, Friedman equation. So, so the steps would be, we start with some cosmological constant, uh, so, some value, some initial value of, of this effective uh, cosmological constant. Then we compute the space-time volume at a later time using this equation, as well as the volume difference. Then we plug it back into here and get the value of the effective cosmological constant at that later time, and then we keep repeating. So, so here is an example uh, lambda evolution obtained from such a procedure. So in, in sort of thin gray is the absolute value of, the, um, of, of lambda, and the, the thickened red uh, trend is sort of a smoothed out version of it. It's on a log-log scale uh, versus uh, the scale factor A. And for reference, the uh, matter and radiation uh, energy densities are also shown. So because, uh, because lambda is always going as one over square root v or h square, at any time it'll be um, statistically of the order of the dominant ambient energy uh, density. So at earlier times it's uh, radiation density and at later times that's matter density. And we see that in this figure. Uh, so at, at 
early times, this, this red jagged line is, is close to the green line, which is the radiation density. And at later times, it's, it's close to the purple line, which is the matter density. Now, sometimes it happens that our, uh, our, our random numbers produce a cosmological constant that is so negative that the whole right-hand side becomes negative. And at this point, this equation doesn't make any sense, and we can't use it to evolve further. So this is a major uh, open question of this model. We don't know what to do at this point. This equation is not valid, and we don't know. Yes? Where is the randomness coming into this evolution? It's not obvious. So these are random numbers. Oh, OK. Yeah. And I mean, what sort of distribution do you draw them from? Um, I mean, you just take like some Gaussian distribution? Or? Yeah, you, you can use a Gaussian distribution, yeah. So there's no requirement that the uh, zeta should be all positive? No. Okay. No, it, it should not be if, if we want to model uh, lambda, which can go as plus or minus 1 over square root okay. Thanks. C. There's no H bar anywhere, is there? No. Um, right, so, 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 so this is an open question, um, what to do at these points. Practically, when we reach such a point before the evolution reaches today, we just discard that simulation and start over again until this doesn't happen, but this is something we need to understand better. And it's potentially an area where quantum physics can play a role. For example, something like quantum tunneling. So this is something we are currently uh, thinking about a lot. Uh, how often does this happen? In it, it depends on a number of things. So it depends on this alpha parameter. It depends on. Um, like at what rich if we start the evolution. Um, it, it, depends on, it depends on a, a number of things, how often um, okay. the output, yeah. Right, but, but yeah, so it, it definitely happens more often the earlier um, we start the simulation because one over square root d becomes very large. And that's also a reason to believe that uh, perhaps quantum physics can, can be relevant in addition to the fact that at these points, um, the classical evolution uh, gives you a lot of co complex um, values for the volume and so on. OK. So sorry, maybe I can yeah. ask a small clarification question. So the h square becomes negative because this, there's a randomness in the evolution of lambda? Is that right. So, so lambda isn't constrained to right. be in magnitude um, smaller than the sum of radiation and matter density. So it can be positive and negative, and it can be more negative than, um, yeah, the sum of sum of these two. So, so the net right hand side becomes. But negative. rom, I mean, rom suffers a very huge UV fluctuation also, which we have to fine tune. I mean, if you so, include that, then. Uh, so for rom, we just take the standard. Um, okay, so you ignore matter. the quantum matter fluctuation. No. OK, so because this model, and really any model of ever-present lambda, is stochastic in nature, the statements that we make about physical quantities are statistical. And based on running many simulations and looking at distributions of physical quantities that come out of those simulations. So for example, here in these, uh, in these two columns, I'm showing the distributions for the present day values of the Hubble parameter in the left column and the dark energy density fraction in the right column for three different values of alpha uh, increasing as we go down. And um, so in the, the red band, shows roughly the expected range of the value of the present day Hubble parameter. So we can see that uh, 
most of the simulations don't reproduce values that are, cl that are close to our universe. We can see that as alpha increases, the standard deviations grow, and we can get more instances that resemble our universe, but the majority don't. Similarly, for the dark energy density fraction, which, is, which uh, at present day is around 0 0.7, most of the values are smaller than this, but the, as we increase the value of alpha, uh, we can get closer, we can get more instances with this value. And so, so this was the result of running 10,000 simulations, but of course, out of that 10,000, a number of them hit this uh, H square negative uh, issue where we had to discard the simulations. So really, the, out of those 10,000, the number that went into these distributions were 9,990, 9, 3,228, and 535 uh, with increasing alpha. And a general question that we face when we think about these outcomes is how to judge the, this this small fraction of model outcomes that resemble our universe. Practically speaking, we would like to have more instances that resemble our universe, but judging the model more objectively, how can we determine the ability of this model to describe our universe? So um, the, these are subtle questions to think about. Um, and it's, it's not even clear if there is a fair way to judge that. Um, is it, for, for example, some questions in this regard are, does our universe even have to be a typical outcome or does it just have to be possible? So I just wanna raise these questions, but I'm not going to answer them at this point. I think any ways we can postpone uh, answering those questions to when we have a more complete model of ever-present lambda. And for now, the focus should be on whether the current models or simple modifications of them give us some or any instances that resemble our universe. So on that note, let me show you how the model does when tested against some standard cosmological data. So one analysis that we did was uh, to compare with supernova type 1A data. So we did a, a Monte Carlo Markov chain analysis with 20,000 20, random seed numbers. And we used the chi-square of the standard lambda CDM model as a reference point for how well the model did. So out of this, this 20,000 uh, sample sets, we found three cases that had a chi-square better than lambda CDM. Um, so, so here are the, the distributions for the present day uh, matter density fraction and Hubble parameter for the 27 cases that had the best uh, chi-square and the dashed lines show the three that did better than lambda CDM. So, so the, the present day matter density fraction, as you can see, is not very constrained by this analysis. Um, on the other hand, the present day Hubble parameter value is constrained to be close to what we expect it to be. A qualitative feature of the, the three uh, instances that did better than lambda CDM that we noticed was that the dark energy densities were smaller than matter density at, uh, at, at small redshifts compared to the ones with less good chi-square that had dark energy densities comparable to um, or larger or larger um, dark energy densities than the matter density. So in this figure, um, in, in, in color, are shown the, the, the jagged lines are the ever-present lambda histories with good chi-square, and the dashed lines are the corresponding matter density evolutions. 
And the black jagged lines are a few examples that had bad chi-square and, and their corresponding matter densities are in, in black dashed lines um, versus uh, low red shifts in the zero to 1.5 range. So we can see a clear distinction between the two uh, sets. So the, we, we can clearly see that the, the color trends are smaller than the, the black trends. So this, this could potentially be used in, in the future to more strategically sample. But it's also something we learn about the, the good histories of ever-present lambda. So we did a similar analysis with the CMB data, this time using 100,000 uh, random seed numbers. But we weren't able to find any instances that did better than lambda CDM. We could find much better results if we manually suppressed the dark energy density around the last scattering surface, but still it didn't produce uh, cases that did better than lambda CDM. So, so this is, at, at, in its uh, current state, a, um, the, the, this is the current status of what, how the model does with CMB data, and it is a weakness of the model in its current state that it struggles to fit CMB data, at least in the particular analysis that we did. It could be that you know, we, uh, the, the 100,000 uh, sample set that we used isn't anywhere near computational um, maximum ability, but there's sort of an um, interplay between seeing what the model does in its current state and thinking more about it and refining it and checking again. So in, it, in our initial study, the, this, this model one of ever-present lambda is struggling to fit the CMB data. And there's a lot of ongoing work right now to understand and pinpoint why and whether we can identify any features of the histories that did relatively better uh, to see if we can more strategically sample or perhaps introduce some simple modifications, just like we had the qualitative uh, signature from the runs that did better with the supernova data. So here's a sample power spectrum uh, from this analysis. So in red is our best fit from the uh, from ever present lambda model one. Um, in green is the standard lambda CDM curve, and in dashed red and orange are just two other uh, examples that had relatively better chi square in the ever present lambda run. So we can see from this figure that the main discrepancy is in the low multiples. And here are the distributions for the present-day Hubble parameter um, divided by 100 here, and the present-day uh, matter energy density for the 90 cases with the best chi-square. So in general, the, the values of the Hubble parameter are low. So we'd expect it to be around uh, 0 0.7. It's there on the lower end. And similarly, uh, the, the matter density today is on, the, is on the higher end. We expect a value around 0 0.14. We do get some cases that are close to that, but the majority are larger. OK. Um, right. So now let me. Uh, revisit the, uh, the topic of the recent cosmological tensions. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, it seems clear that you are not taking into account any inhomogeneities, right? Yes. Right. The, any spatial inhomogeneities, right. that's right. Okay. That, that is definitely something that needs to be um, introduced. Uh, yeah. And how would you, I mean, take into account if you just consider a, a causal set picture, I mean, that would also automatically have 
special in inhomogeneities, right? Any any geometry which is generated in a stochastic manner, mm -hmm. right? Well, yeah. I mean, th there are inhomogeneities. I mean, it's it's hard to get space out of it, but mm -hmm. but but really, the it's it's difficult to. Uh, I mean, it's difficult to build a model. Mm -hmm. We can solve this equation at any time, mm -hmm. and then we put one number in here at any time. Mm -hmm. Once you want to introduce spatial and homogeneities, it becomes difficult to know. You can't use this equation right. uh, because you need one number there, but then what do you replace that with, and how do you make sure it's consistent as you evolve? So those are some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. It's something that needs to be done, but it's it's very difficult. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So back to this topic of the cosmological ten recent cosmological tensions. So in the Hubble tension. Uh, what I'm going to say about ever-present lambda in relation to these tensions are just some thoughts and indications, but they no no concrete results. It's just one of the most interesting areas to focus on uh, a bit more in the future. So in the Hubble tension, the um, prediction from the local measurements for uh, the present day value is around uh, 73. I think the uncertainties are around one uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec. And the predicted value from CMB observations is around 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec. I think uncertainty is around 0 0.3. And one of the leading models to alleviate this tension is dynamical dark energy, and specifically early dark energy models where there is a very brief and early period where you have extra dark energy that quickly decays. Uh, so, so these are. Uh, this is one of the leading leading candidates for that that people are focusing on, and ever present lambda, by by its nature, is a dynamical dark energy model. It is compatible with early dark energy, and we also did a more model independent uh, study in, in our analysis and found a similar preference for uh, early dark energy. So what we did was um, we set the value of the dark energy at five different large redshifts in, in this particular graph that I'm showing you in this large redshift range as a, as a free parameter and then interpolated in between. And, and um, uh, to see... Um, to, to, to do a comparison with the CMB observations. And in, in this plot, what's shown is the uh, dark energy density fraction versus the redshift from this analysis. The curves are the best fit, and the opacity of each curve is proportional to the likelihood of that curve, so how well the, the, uh, those values did. So the darker the curve is, uh, the better it fit data. So there is a ten there seems to be a tendency from this analysis for an early positive dark energy. In contrast, at these early uh, early times or large redshifts, lambda CDM would basically be at zero. Right. Um, for. I have less to s even less to say about the S8 tension. Um, there are less models in general that have been proposed to uh, alleviate this tension. Some of these models that um, have been proposed have, have a feature where the dark energy density is oscillating and changing sign. These are obviously features that we have in ever-present lambda as well. Another uh, strong contender for um, alleviating this tension is interacting dark energy, where energy flows from dark matter to dark energy. Now, this doesn't happen in current models of uh, ever-present lambda, 
but it is something that could potentially be incorporated into it. And it could be an interesting avenue for thinking about some back reaction between the matter and the causal set. So it's, it's something we could think uh, a bit more about in the future. And one last thing that I want to highlight about these tensions is that um, there seems to be a correlation between these two tensions in that models that have been proposed to alleviate one tension seem to worsen the other tension. So it's, it's a very um, curious and interesting puzzle and challenge to try and think of a model that simultaneously can alleviate both of these tensions. And, and definitely, I think one of the most interesting directions to think more about is, is to study this, this S8 tension with our present lambda. We haven't directly done that study yet, just these indications about common features between other proposals and this model. So in, in summary, I hope I've given you a flavor of what the ever-present lambda dark energy model from causal sets are. It is a fluctuating cosmological constant that arises from basic features of the causal set, for example, the nature of its discreteness. And one of its key features is that it fluctuates over time, both in magnitude and in sign. So if there were to um, present themselves observations in the future that, uh, that show evidence for a sign change in dark energy, this would be a feature that is very natural for ever-present lambda and not of any other models that I know of, at least in a natural way. So this would be um, strong evidence for ever-present lambda if if this were to um, pan out in the future. So I hope I've, I've given you some um, idea of some of the strengths of ever-present lambda and some of the many open questions and weaknesses of, of the models and idea at its current state. So some which I talked about which need to be understood better in the future is why is the mean of lambda zero what happens at these stages of the evolution where uh, h squared becomes negative? And how do we think about the fraction of simulations that give us results that resemble our universe? Some of other improvements that we need to work on is to um, figure out how we can do better with the CMB data, uh, potentially use more insights or more insights from what we think the quantum physics or quantum gravity side of the dynamics will do to refine our current models. Perhaps we can look at stochastic differential equations uh, because this, this uh, cosmological constant is really a uh, discontinuous and, and stochastic variable and um, there are some uh, mathematical studies of working with, with stochastic differential equations, so that would be um, ready to be studied a bit further. And um, as mentioned already, one of the key things that needs to be done is um, the incorporation of spatial inhomogeneities in this problem, because we, we would, this would not be um, a true model of our universe without being able to describe also uh, this, this aspect. Uh, so in, in current and future work, we will be thinking about all, all of these things as well as focusing on the tensions a little bit more. And one last thing I want to mention about the direction of study which uh, we are pursuing right now is to think to think more about early, um, ever present lambda as an early universe model. So much of what I talked about was um, in the late universe, but there are also many interesting things that happen in the early universe. And um, for example, especially if we start with a non-zero initial value of 
uh, the cosmological constant, there are indications that an inflation-like behavior automatically comes out. So this would be an example of getting such a behavior without any scalar fields being needed. So it's a very interesting direction to think more about, and that's what we're doing. Thank you. Thanks for a fantastic talk. So we have some time for questions. Uh, So this is maybe a slightly technical question. Um, in your model, you have to decide how often you update lambda. Um, do you do that at regular intervals in proper time, for instance? The reason I'm asking is that uh, you expect the fluctuations to be much larger earlier on, so you might want to do much more frequent updates early when the fluctuations are large. Yes, but um, so, so we have studied different things. We have studied equal intervals, and there are also different variables to do that in scale factor, cosmic time, proper time. So it's different even which of those you pick. But we've studied both regular, logarithmic, and yeah, different. Um, uh, and different sizes for them. So we've, we've studied all of those things, and it's the, depending on the analysis, what we end up going with is kind of the, which one lets us capture most of the physics and which one seems to be stable under, you know, decreasing the resolution of the steps and, and so on. But we have explored okay. different, yeah. Uh, if I can ask something. If you go back to this. Uh, hello, hello. Yeah, uh, if I could ask, like, if you could go back to the slide where you have the Friedman equation. Uh, yeah. Like, um, yeah, so uh, as compared to the standard Big Bang model of cosmology, how many extra parameters do you have? Like, you have traded lambda for alpha and the moment in xi. So there's just. Alpha is the only extra. Uh, but the distribution you're getting xi from also has some parameter, right? Presumably. Sorry? These xi i's are random variables, right? Drawn from some distribution, some Gaussian or some. Yes. So that will also bring in a new parameter. So it's not a new parameter. This is, this is how we, we modeled this. So, so the, the true picture just has these alphas, but instead of adding up all of these things, we are just modeling it with this. Um, with this random number. Uh, it, if I change the dis distribution, the results will change, right? The distribution that Xi is drawn from. I mean, so, so, maybe not so, so much. The, the, this model requires that whatever random numbers you pick give you a particular mean and standard deviation. But you can, um, if it does that, you can choose your random numbers to be Gaussian, binomial, yeah, yeah. Anything. So yeah. that's what I mean by giving an extra parameter. Like you fix the distribution, but pick like maybe vary the parameter. So, okay. Oh, but that's fine. I think. Uh, I had a more general causal set theory question. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and this is in pertaining to the other talks as well. Uh, that the fact that that you are picking a Poisson distribution for distributing these uh, points and having a causal set. Mm -hmm. Where exactly is the detail that they are Poisson distributed important? Like. I mean, Poisson distribution, I can just specify that, okay, all the order of moments are these, like first order moments, second order, third order, so, order, so on. Where are the higher order moments really going in, in, uh, in these computations? Like, like, suppose I change the fifth moment of the Poisson distribution, where exactly will it not work? Um, let's see. I guess... Um, I guess it would be higher order terms in the fluctuations. Yeah, because central limit theorem and all will go through and but delta we will. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. longer yeah. discussion. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. No, just one comment on whatever the question was, but it would also presumably, unless you do it right, you'd have problems with this Lorentz invariance proof, right? I mean, there is a proof that the this distribution is the only one which is consistent with, with Lorentz invariance, right? For 
so yeah. so it might be that if you if you tamper, I don't know how much you can tamper. I don't know who, yeah, who has I, done I, I this work, but I if you tamper, you might it, you might yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. so so that would be one 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 thing. Uh, the more general question is like what I ask, keep asking you, which is what is the uh, what is the framework? I mean, we have only one universe. So, so when we are talking about fluctuate fluctuations, I mean, we don't have s different runs. We we just live with one universe. So, what is the when you say fluctuating lambda or fluctuating something? Then in what it's fluctuating space? Fluctuating uh, over time. Well, but, in this but model, it, but right. It's fluctuating space. But that's okay. But but from the causal set point of view, where what is this? So, so this is a causal set inspired um, model where where these fluctuations are. Then you're just assuming that they fluctuate in time, right? I mean, but, yeah, but so is there a fundamental? Uh, so, so, so this part is is very uh, is much more tightly connected to causal sets. And then when we want to model sort of the evolution, we have to um, make some more assumptions to get a concrete model. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, yeah. <laughs> right. uh, could you comment a little more on the last point for the sigma eight tension and the, this interaction between cosmological constant and, and dark matter? So do you, would you have like a matter model, some dark matter candidate, or how does that would work? Um, so uh, I mean, so 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 those models are are models that other people have have thought about. I just wanted to to mention it as something we could potentially um, incorporate. There is a dark matter candidate in causal sets, but I'm not sure if it would be easy to incorporate that into the this picture. Um, I would imagine that it would be more straightforward to take whatever the, the dark matter description and those other models are, um, and just, just introduce it here and think a little bit about the back reaction. But, but really, we haven't, yeah, we haven't really started to think more concretely about that. Because you said it's possible, so I was wondering how would the, the interaction, like not the calculation, but how would the interaction play out in this model? I, I don't know <laughs> at this point, no, it's just, um, but maybe we can continue idea. in the discussion. One more last question, then okay. we go for a break. It's actually two, but the, the first, maybe we can go with the first one. So the first one is, have you tried other distributions? Because it seems like a very powerful statement that other distributions don't reproduce anything close to the cosmological constant that we observe, if that's the case. Have you done such analysis? Yeah. Sorry, well, do you mean other than Poisson, yes. we try something else? Yes. Um, because that seems no. where the causal set really gives you the prediction, right? Yeah. So it's just the first moment that, that matters for yeah. the prediction, right? Okay. Okay. And well, uh, the, the, well, what was the other question? Ah, the other question was concerning you seem to be unsure about how to judge um, your outcome, and I'm a little confused about that. Why is it not fair to just say, if the mean is not the observed value, there's a standard deviation and the prediction is somewhat off? Why is that not how I should judge these models? Because it's a stochastic model. It doesn't have to. Why should our, why should our universe be at the mean? We just have one universe. Well, but that's the whole predictive power of the model, right, that it predicts well, you. Well, I, I mean think it's value. a bit more subtle than that. Um, it's, you may have that point of view, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be the most likely, because we have this one universe. It okay. could, yeah. Yeah, maybe that's some, some longer discussion. Thanks. So maybe I will ask my final yeah. question. So the fine tuning about the fine tuning, as you said that the central limit theorem tells you that so you have a h square, you had a one by square root v, and then you relate it to h in the end. Mm -hmm. And, but the, I thought the whole, I mean, oh, yeah. but h is related to the matter density as well as the cosmological constant. And mm -hmm. the point of fine tuning of lambda is that because 
the rho m gets fine tuned by the quantum effects like it has to be so here i mean that problem still remains right that i mean h still has to be fine tuned to match with the observed value i would have thought right in your case or so, so H is an equation. observed. Yeah, but I'm saying from theoretical perspective, from the Friedman equation, yeah, the lambda is not fine-tuned for you, but the rho m will be fine-tuned, right, because of the uh, UV effects. Or maybe I misunderstood the... I, yeah, I don't... But your Hubble scale now will be sensitive to the UV divergences, right? Because your cosmological constants are not... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, this is not coming from any quantum field. This has nothing to do. Yeah, with I was just connecting it with yeah. the usual problem with the fine tuning. That the heat, I think it transmutes into a different problem. But maybe we should. Yeah. Sure. Okay, let's thank. Eight, eight, eight minutes break. Tell me where to put it. Fun? You can hear me? It's not very it's clear. It's clear? It's clear at the back. <laughs> you don't need it. It's okay. <laughs> Okay, so we are very happy to have Suvraj from next door, ICTS, and he's going to tell us about holography of information and the information paradox. Uh, so thank you very much, Alok. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers. Uh, I have to apologize a little bit because even though I'm from next door and this is my home city, I'm a little jet lagged, uh, but <laughs> because I came from somewhere else uh, last night. Uh, but, uh, and so I'm sorry also for having missed some of the talk, but I hope to make it up <laughs> in the next day or so. Uh, thank you also to the organizers, I wanted to say, because. Uh, this room is, in fact, a rather special room for me. If I remember correctly, uh, this is the second talk, uh, only the second talk I've given in my life in this room. Uh, and the last talk I gave was a little over 20 years ago uh, when I was an undergraduate student. Uh, and in fact, uh, there were some of us who were here uh, for a summer program uh, in the Raman Research Institute uh, at a time when undergraduates didn't really do research. So it was a pretty important summer program uh, in my life, like it influenced my life. And uh, the talk we gave here was uh, the culmination of that program. So I'm thankful again, really, to the organizers for getting me back uh, here, here in this uh, historic room. Uh, so I'm going to speak today about work done uh, with several collaborators over the past few years. Uh, this most recent set of papers that we wrote with Joydeep, who's a former student, now at McGill, uh, Priyadarshi and Sunir, who are current students uh, at ICTS, and Victor, who's a postdoc at ICTS, in these two papers we wrote uh, recently. Uh, some other papers we wrote with Alok, who's chairing the session. Uh, putting his photograph here gets me a few extra minutes, I hope. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, Siddharth. <laughs> and and uh, Pushkal, who's a former student uh, uh, now at Harvard, uh, Siddharth at, uh, at uh, TIFR, Chandramoli, who's a current student, uh, Olga, who was at Perimeter, but also worked uh, with our group. Uh, and also this uh, set of papers we wrote with this uh, collaboration we used to call the Group of Seven, which is how Andreas, Carlos, Lisa, Marcos, and Sanjeet. Uh, and also based on some much older work with Kiriakos, 
And these are some references that might be useful. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, I thought that uh, th there's a lot of work, and uh, I thought rather than speaking about some of the most recent things we have done, I would try and give you a broad overview of some of the ideas that we've been discussing because I felt that would be appropriate for this conference. Uh, but I'm, of course, very glad uh, if there are questions uh, to talk more in, in detail about any one of these, these papers and topics. Okay, uh, so what is the theme of this talk? So the theme of this talk is about uh, the unusual localization of information in gravity. So let me remind you of something very simple that we take for granted. Uh, so if one looks at a non-gravitational theory, then a very basic property of such a theory, which is just clear if you think of the theory as being you know, a bunch of lattice points, degrees of freedom living at lattice points, is that if you take a bounded region like this pink region, you can specify the state inside and outside independently. So you know, if you go from this picture to this picture, I change this spin from being up to down, I change maybe this spin from being down to up, or up to down, and I could have done both of those, or one of those, or none of those, and you know, there's nothing that tells me I have to do something here if I do something here. Okay? This is just something that's, that's just clear. Uh, this is, uh, uh, in particular, uh, one of the consequences of what's called the split property in quantum field theories, which of course says more, but this is one of its consequences. And this is rather key to the idea that we have that information is localized inside some region, and it's not available in its complement. So in particular, if you look at this graph, uh, you know, this cartoon, uh, the cartoon is meant to say there's some excitation that's localized here. And if you have an observer somewhere here, they don't know what's happening inside here. Everything in all these cartoons are cartoons of a Cauchy slice. So this is at one time instant. Of course, if the observer here waits, then they know what's happening inside. But at one instant of time, you, know, you can have a configuration of this kind, which looks like the vacuum outside this region, looks, doesn't look like the vacuum inside this region. And what is more, I can change the form of the excitation inside the region and still keep the exterior of this looking like the vacuum. So this is again, uh, you know, this is uh, something very simple uh, that's true in quantum field theory. And it's rather key to this idea about, you know, our mundane ideas about how information is localized. The theme I want to talk about today, and this is what the talk is about, is that I, I will try and persuade you that this is not true in a theory of gravity once you consistently take into account both gravitational and quantum mechanical effects. In particular, this is what I said is true in a non-gravitational theory, but in a gravitational theory, I'll try and tell you that the complement of a bounded region always has all information about the region itself. So first of all, you can't set up a configuration like this where you have some excitation inside and everything outside looks like the vacuum. Now that is also true in classical gravity, right? Because if you put some energy inside some bounded region, you can measure the total energy from outside the region. But I'm going to make a stronger statement, which is that if you change the form of the excitation in this region, which in the classical theory you can do without changing things outside, uh, in the quantum theory I'll say you cannot do, and you also have to change the form of the tails that go outside, okay? So that's going to be the broad theme of this talk. Uh, this is what we call the holography of information, and I'll try and give you a bird's eye view of various results that we've found in this direction over the past few years. <coughs> Let me start with the following basic physical question. You already have a question, yes? Uh, the gauge theories are exactly like non-gravitational theories. So if you take a gauge theory, all you need to do is add a, you see there's a small collar region. I've in fact been careful enough in my drawing. So you can use that to absorb all the charges. And gauge theories have a split property exactly like that once you introduce a color region. But if I just, just add a big charge, then I, I mean, uh, the, the pitch, you're looking at an instant of time. And yes. so this elliptic property that you're talking about, which is something you happens. You can absorb the charge here. You can add an electric charge here and add a compensating charge here so that everything outside looks exactly like the vacuum. Uh, <coughs> so you, you, so, that's, so you know, that's why there's a small color region here. So you can specify everything inside here completely independently. That was the question, yeah. the color region. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. OK, good. So now from a physical point of view, why would we believe that gravity localizes information differently? Okay. So I'm going to give you different arguments. I'm going to start with a, just a very simple physical intuitive argument. The argument I'm about to give you now is not the most precise, but it's the physical intuition that I'd like you to keep in mind as I take you through slightly more refined arguments. So the, uh, let me start with something very basic. Okay, I'm going to claim that this results from a combination of the uncertainty principle 
and the Gauss law. Now the uncertainty principle tells us that if you take something that's very sharply localized in energy space, then it must be delocalized in position space. Really, you know, it's an uncertainty between momentum and position, but in a relativistic theory, momentum goes together with energy. <coughs> and so if you take something that has a fixed energy and energy eigenstate, it's something that's delocalized in position space. Fine. This doesn't prevent us, of course, in ordinary quantum mechanics uh, from creating excitations that are strictly localized inside a region. And how do we do that? Well, we start adding together different energy eigenstates with the right phases. So I take an energy eigenstate, a wave function which has peak at some energy. I add to it a wave function peak at a different energy with a different phase. And if I add an infinite number of these, then I can ensure that I have destructive interference outside a bounded region, and I have constructive interference inside a bounded region. And so I can, I can produce a wave function that looks like this in position space. So this is very familiar to all of us, something we learn in quantum mechanics 101. So what's different about gravity? Well, what's different about gravity is that it has a Gauss law, and the Gauss law tells us that we can measure the energy of an excitation out at infinity. In fact, in a relativistic theory, this is the only good definition of energy that we have, or maybe I shouldn't make too strong, this is a, or you know, one of the only good definitions of energy that we have, but you go out to infinity and you measure you know, the subleading fall off of the metric and you integrate that and that tells you what the total energy is. This is just you know, also true in the Newtonian theory, you integrate the gravitational field over the, the, uh, some Gaussian surface and you know the mass inside. Fine, so this is also something we're familiar with. And now I want to tell you that if you think a little bit about how you put these two ingredients together, you would already start seeing inklings of why it is that gravity localizes information unusually. The point is that in the quantum theory, when you think of one of these wave functions that was localized at a given energy, it can't just exist in splendid isolation, it must also have a gravitational tail. And so in particular, whenever you think of some state of the theory that has a given energy, it must be accompanied by the metric at infinity which integrates to give you that energy. Okay? So it must have a gravitational tail and so every excitation must be dressed correctly. And this is just a consequence of the Gauss law. Okay? Now what is important is that you know, to beat the uncertainty principle and to localize excitations, we had to superpose different energy eigenstates. And the point here is that you now have to superpose these dressed eigenstates. And the intuition is that when you try to superpose these dressed eigenstates, which have these tails that go out to infinity, these tails prevent destructive interference outside a bounded region and constructive interference inside a region. I'll explain this in more detail, but this is the rough physical intuition. And the bottom line is that it's not just the energy that knows about everything inside, but rather correlators of the energy and of other observables at infinity can tell you about what's happening inside. Okay? So this is just intuitive. What I said right now was not a proof, uh, but I want you to keep in mind that there's this very basic physical intuition that arises from very basic prin principles that goes into this. Is that related to the fact that uh, uh, there is no lo lo local gra uh, observables Absolutely. in the gravity. Absolutely. And whenever I want to do something, I have to create yes. the gravitational field of it. Absolutely. Well, it, it's related to the fact that there are no local gauge invariant observables in gravity, which comes from the same kind of argument. Okay. Exactly. OK. So now you might say, well, fine. You know, I gave you some argument, but you know, we don't believe it. Uh, we'll just write down some wave functions that have this property. You know, they differ inside some bounded region and they don't differ outside that, you know, and they coincide outside that region. So what is it that's going to prevent me from just writing down such a wave functional? So I'm going to give you various answers. I'm going to start with a perturbative answer. This is not the argument I'm about to now present, is not the strongest argument we have, but it will make the intuition that I just presented a little more clear. The point is, what prevents you is the fact that, that wave functionals in gravity must obey a set of constraints that all of us who work on quantum gravity are very familiar with. These constraints just have to do with the fact that the wave functional must be invariant under the diffeomorphism redundancies of the theory, and you have diffeomorphisms that move you along a spatial slice that give rise to the so-called momentum constraints, 
and you have diffeomorphisms that move the spatial slice up and down in time that give rise to the so-called Hamiltonian constraint. And of course, imposing the Hamiltonian constraint is called the wheeler devitt equation. So now we can prove, and I'll try and explain how this gels with the intuition we had previously. In ADS, in perturbation theory, and both ADS and perturbation theory are helpful for what I'm about to say now, that if you look at two solutions of the wheeler devitt equation, that coincide at the boundary of anti de Sitter space. So this is how anti de Sitter space looks after I've conformally compactified the spatial direction. It looks like a cylinder. If you look at two solutions of the wheeler devitt equation that coincide on this solid band, then they must coincide everywhere in the bulk. Okay. So this uh, does not, now let me point out, for those of us who are familiar with ADS-CFT, uh, this is a rather simple statement from the point of view of ADS-CFT. Because in ADS-CFT, one doesn't even need to specify the theory on the boundary on a time band. One only needs to specify the theory on the boundary on a time slice. But this result that I'm about to show you does not assume ADS-CFT. Rather, we think that it establishes a perturbative version of holography for gravitational theories. So I'm going to sketch for you how we can prove a result of this kind. So the point is, of course, that the wheeler devitt equation has been known for a long time and has been very fruitfully analyzed in, in the mini superspace approximation. But in fact, it turns out to be also interesting to just work in the perturbative approximation, which is what we did here. In that approximation, you can take the metric and you can write it as the ADS background metric plus some fluctuation, kappa whenever it appears here, square root of 8 pi g newton. And you can break the fluctuation into different parts. There's a transverse traceless graviton excitation, which is the dynamical mode of the graviton. And then there's some, some T part that we call the T component. And then there's a longitudinal part that's just pure gauge on spatial slices. Okay. okay, now off the Hamiltonian constraint is some very complicated constraint. However, in particular, it turns out to be useful to look at the integral of the Hamiltonian constraint. So you know the Hamiltonian constraint is an infinite set of constraints that you have to impose at every point in space on the Cauchy slice. But you can of course also integrate it. And when we integrate it, we find the following result. That's in fact somewhat intuitive. We find there's a boundary term which depends only on one of these components, which is the T component of H. This is in fact what you would have called the ADM Hamiltonian uh, in ADS. And this gets related to the integral of some bulk term, which looks exactly like a bulk energy density. In particular, it involves the transverse traceless component of the graviton and other matter excitations, if you have them in ADS. This is just an integral of the Hamiltonian constraint. I'm not imposing anything by hand here. You have a question, yes? The integral over the spatial slice. So I should have, yes, yeah, ddx. Over, over, over the spatial slice, yeah. Over sigma, correct, thank you. This is all true without ADS. ADS is just useful because it gives us an infrared cutoff in one of the arguments I'm about to make. I will also give you an argument in flat space. That's, that's, so the, uh, uh, Abhay is absolutely right. All this would be true without ADS. Uh, ADS is useful because in this argument in perturbation theory, it's useful to have an infrared cutoff. I'll point out where we need it. Okay, okay. so now, uh, you know, what are solutions to this integrated constraint? Well, you know, you can al already see what they are. These are precisely the kinds of wave functionals that I described previously. You take some wave functional that's an energy eigenstate of the transverse traceless component of the metric and of the other matter fields, and you pair it together with a particular state of the T component of the metric fluctuation, which is this boundary Hamiltonian. Remember, I gave you this cartoon where you had these excitations of matter, which were coupled together with the gravitational tail. This is the precise version of that cartoon in ADS perturbation theory. We can, of course, explicitly construct these wave functionals. They're just wave functionals we are constructing in the perturbative approximation that are energy eigenstates. And so this is an explicit perturbative solution to the wheeler devitt equation. And the important point, as I said, is that the constraint is forcing correlations between a boundary degree of freedom and the bulk state. Now, there are other components to the wheeler devitt equation, but they turn out to be not important because the pointwise constraints they fix the bulk dependence of these other longitudinal components of the metric fluctuation and the rest of the T component. Okay. Now, the point is that you, know, you can take a general mixed state in the theory, and a mixed state in the theory just comprises, you, know, you just take a, a graph, this, these kinds of solutions, a ket of them, you add them together, 
And then you can ask what happens if you impose the equality of these boundary correlators in a certain, in a time band of size epsilon on the boundary. And you can show without so much difficulty, and I can show you on the board if you like later, uh, that imposing the equality of these boundary correlators forces these states to be equal within this constraint space of solutions to the wheeler divit equation. Okay? And this is where we need ADS because imposing these correlators forces the state to be equal provided we have a discrete set of states and that's why the infrared cutoff is important. Okay? Yes, we could integrate over it. So if we try to make a slightly weaker statement uh, such as, you know, or the states are equal up to some IR terms which we don't care about, we could make a similar statement in flat space. And I will give you a result in flat space, okay? Okay, so this is a perturbative argument that I just gave you that, that, that makes precise some of the intuition that I told you about how the Gauss law and the uncertainty principle forces this unusual property of localization on gravity. Okay. Now by using somewhat different algebraic techniques, we can establish a stronger result. Uh, this result that I just gave you was valid in perturbation theory in G. Newton. Uh, everything, the solutions that we found were valid in perturbation theory. And by using different techniques, which I'll sketch for you, we can prove a non-perturbative result in flat space and in ADS. And most recently, as I said, you know, we, can, we, we learned how to solve the wheeler divit equation in an asymptotically de Sitter space-time to all orders in perturbation theory by using a different expansion parameter. Uh, and that helps us establish a different set of results to all orders in perturbation theory uh, in de Sitter space. Okay. Uh, let me just explain now what the results are, and then I'll give you more precise results, arguments. Yeah. So in the, I don't know, in ADS, things are yes. different. But in the flat space case, so if you go back a couple of transparencies where you looked at the Hamiltonian constraint yes. and you integrated it over. Somewhere. So yeah, yeah, just later, I think n square root of gamma. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. over here, usually, so if you, I mean, the way at least I understand things, if you want to rewrite it in that, uh, I mean, if you want a boundary contribution, then your lapse has to go to one or some constant at infinity. This is at actually just the background lap that we integrated things with. This uh, n was just, was, just, was just the background lapse function. You know, we are, we are working in perturbation theory, so we're working in ADS. So, so these things, okay, so in, in. What you're thinking of is the fact that there are, there's a set of pointwise constraints, which are the ones that, you know, so you would have, maybe yeah. what you would have said is, yeah. you should take this and integrate this with functions of compact support. And then that is what we would call the pointwise constraints. And then there's right. also a constraint, which is where you get the ADM Hamiltonian from, which is where we just integrate this way, you know, without, without, setting, without setting it to zero. The kinds of terms you're talking about are those where I insert a weight function, f of x, in this integral d dx. Yeah. That's what I would call the pointwise constraints. Those are the ones that fix the gauge degrees of freedom. And then there's one which is physical, which fixes the fact that there's a boundary energy which measures the bulk inside. This is a very physical result. Right. It is the Gauss. So, so, so the counterpart, if I just look in, in full, Yes. Gravity, then that typically would not be well defined. I it mean, would be well defined. It's okay. the it's the ADM Hamiltonian. Okay. You would get so many other terms on this guy. So you'd get the Landau Lifshitz pseudo stress tensor on this side. You okay. know, it, it's what would tell you the ADM Hamiltonian is equal to the integral of the Landau Lifshitz pseudo stress tensor. I mean, uh, you, you could also write it just as a, the Witten Hamiltonian and then ADM energy. I mean, we can use this to prove positive of energy, right? I mean, namely uh, the surface term is equal to right-hand side is just the Witten Hamiltonian. So even non-perturbatively, I mean, uh, this, is, uh, this is true. Sure, yes. Okay, I, 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 should, I should say I, sh I should be more familiar with this, but this is just some straightforward thing, but yes, perhaps you're right, you can do this. Uh, but you know, it's not surprising that you, could, you can do this at higher orders, right? You would add non-linear terms, it would be true. Okay, good. So, so now I want to give you, I want to tell you what the results are, and then I'll take you roughly through the argument, very quickly through the arguments we have in flat space. I won't have time to discuss our work in this it, although I'm very happy to discuss that until infinity if you have questions about it. Okay. Okay. So let me let me tell you what the results are. I'll just state for you what the precise results are. Here are the results in asymptotically flat space. If you take a non-gravitational theory, you can look at the asymptotic algebra at scry plus. The asymptotic algebra at scry plus comprises different operators which are labeled by this value of the retarded time that runs from minus infinity here to plus infinity on top. And you can look at some algebra. We are somewhat mathematically naive, so we don't look at bounded elements. You just take some, some polynomial algebra okay, of, these, of these operators. And the claim is, and of course, you know, this is operators at different values of, of, of the retarded time are, are different, they're independent. Uh, and the claim is in gravity, any operator on null infinity can be approximated arbitrarily well from the algebra of the time band 
near the past boundary of future null infinity, which is this red time band. I've drawn it as a little time band, but in fact, it's a semi-infinite interval that goes from minus infinity to minus one over epsilon in retarded time. Uh, similarly, you could have said the same thing for scry minus, that the algebra on scry minus, any element of this algebra, can be approximated arbitrarily well by an element near its future boundary in a theory of gravity. And I will sketch for you later uh, how we get this result. Uh, how, yes. how can that be? Because if I, if I just draw a region of compact support way to the future of your yes. red band, yes. and I'm just looking at how much is the flux of um, yes. new tensor across yes. that. Yes, I'll uh, answer that explicitly. Okay, good. I'll answer that explicitly also in a perturbative thing. Roughly the reason is because there are still constraints. When I talk about this algebra, I include also the Bondi mass here. So I'm not only looking at the algebra of news operators. I want to include also algebra. You see, that was also important in what I said in EDS. So I want to look at the full constrained algebra, which includes also the Bondi mass, which is related by constraints to what happens at top. So if you, you're right, if you look at only the news algebra, I would say that's throwing out some gravitational degrees of freedom, which are what are imposing the constraints. OK, in a, in a non, uh, so here, here's the argument in ADS. Uh, if one looks at a non-gravitational theory, there's an asymptotic algebra one can define, which lives on the entire boundary, so comprises uh, uh, operators that live at different values of the time. The boundary is now time-like. Uh, and, the and the result is that in a theory of gravity, any of these operators can be approximated arbitrarily well from operators on this time band, which I already showed you. Uh, I showed you a perturbative version. I'll give you a more precise version. Uh, what's the argument in Decider? In some sense, this is the, the prettiest uh, result. And the, the result is as follows. Okay? Uh, this is an asymptotically Decider spacetime. And we can think of a set of cosmological correlators which one defines on the asymptotic future boundary. This is what, you know, when we talk about inflation, we think we are measuring some version of these guys. And, and when, when one thinks of these cosmological correlators, in a non-gravitational theory, uh, this boundary is now a spatial boundary. One has to give, a com to give a complete set of observables. One has to give these cosmological correlators for all values of these boundary coordinates. Uh, the claim is that in gravity, if you give me these, these cosmological correlators in a small part, any small region of the future slice, uh, that is sufficient uh, using the constraints of gravity to get these correlators everywhere. Uh, this question, yes. In the previous, uh, in the previous slide with uh, Minkowski, Asymptotically yes. Minkowski yes, yes, yes. case. Yes. I mean, so is the claim that all the information on that red or the orange circle is enough? I mean, yes, how, does it, how does it sit with what Kasha told us yesterday or if yesterday about the time slice axiom? Where, I mean, the idea that you have the domain of dependence, because this is obviously yeah. not the domain of dependence. Yeah. Uh, it's not enough to specify That's enough it. information. So, I mean, the, so is there I, some I, in quick intuitive way I wasn't, to understand? I wasn't, there, I wasn't there yesterday, so I can't answer specifically, but the time slice axiom <laughs> is something that applies in a, in a, in a non-gravitational theory. And that tells you that you know, in a non-gravitational theory, if you give me the base of a diamond, I can generate the diamond itself. What's happening here is somewhat different. These are constraints that are applying on a Cauchy slice. One way to think of it is to draw a slice that cuts this, a spatial slice. And the thing is, and the claim is the constraints relate what's inside the spatial slice to what's on the boundary of the spatial slice. Think of null infinity itself as the as a limit of a set of Cauchy slices that you've pushed towards infinity. And then the claim is that you know, the constraints are relating what's happening in the bulk to what's happening at, at infinity. There is no analog of this in a non-gravitational theory. This doesn't exist. If you like here, uh, yeah, just one second, please. Uh, you could apply the time, you know, if you assumed ADS-CFT, if you assumed ADS-CFT, then you could have applied the time slice axiom on the boundary. And you could have said, look, a time slice on the boundary fixes what's happening on the whole boundary. Right? And you see, that tells you it also fixes what's happening in the whole bulk. But you see, ADS-CFT you know, would make no sense if I said the bulk was non-gravitational and the boundary was non-gravitational. Because clearly, in a non-gravitational theory in the bulk, there's more information in the bulk here than there is on the time slice of a boundary. Question, yes. Sorry, I'm a bit confused when you said that there is, or, or uh, maybe I don't understand your, your, your yeah. statement. But uh, what does it mean that there is no such thing in non-gravitational theories? Because if I think of QED, right? In QED, if I have like asymptotic degrees of freedom, I have Gauss's laws, I have Gauss's constraint. So obviously, I have all this data null infinity, uh. right? So I thought, like in in my head, obviously for the infrared degrees of freedom, 
uh, gravity is very similar to QED. So, so you must be making some subtle point here I'm missing. No, it's not a subtle point. It's the same point we discussed some time back. Uh -huh. It's the fact that in, a Q, in QED, and I'll discuss it more, there is such a thing as local gauge invariant operator. So the Gauss law Correct. doesn't tell you much because you still have the usual split property, which is you can take a Cauchy slice, put some negative charge here, put some compensating physical positive charge outside, and from infinity you would be able to tell nothing about it. So you can shield the charge completely, not only in QED, but in any gauge theory, because you can always write down local gauge invariant operators, and such operators do not exist in gravity. That's where these, these things come from. So QED is so, so another, yeah. Yeah, in, in QED you can obviously have localized charge. Well, no, you cannot have localized. You can have charges that are localized in string like No, you don't, need, you don't need to have a string that goes out to infinity. You can have something. Okay, we should we should maybe. No, but this oh, is just two a opposite charges. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's it. Good. You just okay. have two opposite charges. So that's how you get trace of f squared is is a gauge invariant local operator, and, and that's how you can use that to, to localize information in in some place yes. which you can't do in gravity. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, pardon me. Question. Yes. Perhaps we leave this for the discussion session. Yes. But uh, basic question. So yes. there are results on gluing initial data yes. by Khrushchev and also by Arad. Arad uh, Aretakis, who looked at compact initial data uh, or initial data in compact domains and taking two do domains and then extending initial data in from those domains all the way to infinity. Is this a classical result? This is a classic. Yes. So in a classically, of course it's true. You see, I classically, Birkhoff's theorem tells you I can just take two spherically symmetric shells of matter. I can redistribute the mass inside. And of course, everything outside looks exactly like the Swatch shell metric. So if I were to make this statement in classical gravity, it's clear you know, my jet lag would be much worse than it is, right? So I should not be making such a, the classical theory is different in terms of how it localizes information. It's, it's, a, it's a combination, as I said in the beginning, of a quantum effect, which is the uncertainty principle, the fact that energy eigenstates are not localized, and the constraints that you get from gravity. So it's important that one has to implement the constraints quantum mechanically. When I solve the wheeler devitt equation, I did implement the constraints quantum mechanically, and I'll say here again where the quantum aspect is important. So of course in the classical theory, in classical gravity, it's certainly true that you can have uh, configurations that differ inside a bounded region and that coincide outside the bounded region, which is related to what you said. D does that answer the question? So, so the classical intuition is, is misleading, and one cannot lift this. If you look at full solutions of the wheeler devitt equation, and they coincide near infinity, they must coincide everywhere in the bulk. That's the result I just showed you in ADS, and I'll give you another, uh, several other arguments. So maybe two questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think this will be quick. So you're saying that this is true for any gauge theory. What is true for any gauge theory? Uh, the fact that. This result is not true. In not, any no, case. not this. The, the fact that you don't, um, that you cannot localize all the information about the bulk on the boundary, right? No, you can localize all the information in a gauge theory. Right, right, right. So, uh, but now, I mean, we can write gravity as a... As a churn simons theory? Uh, uh, well, I was thinking as in Ashtika variables or the real version, you can write it in connection dynamic formalism. But th there's really a physical difference here, you know, which no, is so, the so, presence, yeah. So, I mean, there the basic variables become a gauge connection and, it, and, and yeah. you still have constraints, however. Yeah. It, so so is, it, is it the fact that you have constraints it, that... It, it's, it's not so much the, 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 fact, you know, the variables that you use to describe things, but it's the fact that the energy has to be positive that's important. That prevents you from writing down local you know, degrees of freedom. And that's, imp that's true whatever variables you write gravity, and that's a physical statement. Yeah. Very similar question. Which yeah. Is, yeah, I, the gravity is different because one is asking that there is only one kind of charge. You don't have positive and negative charge. And if you allowed matter, for example, with negative charges, then you could do all those yes, things, yes, right? And you could right. also put some that's ring right. and. That's right. Uh, if you allowed matter. So, so I think somehow the positive, if the is fact that in nature, gravitational charge, which is mass, is only of one sign, is critical here. Yes. And then then there is also the you know the, the 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 constraint itself and the constraint exists in connection variables also so exactly thank, thank you much yes. yeah yeah just last uh, for now yeah. you, you okay, okay. <laughs> the answer already there is only one charge so okay. uh, other that uh, if you put a constraint you have to take adm uh, hamiltonian in your algebra so 
uh, we'll see this again. Uh, you'll see why positivity is important. Let me give you one cartoon, and then I'll give you a more, more formal argument. Okay? So you could have said these results all look different, right? How are they same? I'm going to give you a cartoon. Just keep this in the back of your mind. It's just a cartoon. The cartoon is, you know, in every case, in both ADS and in flat space, the statement is the complement of a bounded region has all information about the state. In ADS and flat space, the complement of a bounded region on a Cauchy slice goes off to infinity. And therefore, if infinity has all region about the state, this is enough. Uh, but in De Sitter space, notice the purple region is the complement of a bounded region. But the blue region is also the complement of the purple region. And this comes from the fact that the topology of the spatial slices in De Sitter is different. And because the topology is compact, every open set is a complement of a bounded region. OK, this is just one way to uni a cartoon that unifies, or a slogan that unifies everything I said. OK, let me now give you a more precise oh, argument. Yes. Is that a Euclidean picture, or is it the boundary? This is a, all, I'm always drawing pictures of Cauchy slices. So always these are always, always okay. I mean, not all. Sometimes I draw also space time. But this picture is a picture of a Cauchy slice. So m most of the pictures where I draw this are always pictures of, of space-like slices. Of course, the space-time picture of a causal complement is much more complicated. Yes, yes, that, this is the space-time picture of De Sitter. But no, no, see, of, uh, of, of the causal complement. Yes, yes, the space-time picture of the causal complicated. complement would also yeah. be. But you see, it's, it's obviously true that the full spatial slice at future infinity has all information about the state, because that's, how you, that's where you specify the state. That would be true in a quantum field theory. And what I'm saying here is you can squeeze it down to this region. Yeah. So you can't use, you can't use Poincare facts. That's right. Well, you can use a point, you know, you can provided you put the right boundary conditions. If you puncture De Sitter, it's a different thing. But if you, in fact, in our, in our analysis, we often use planar coordinates. The question is, do you pick out the point at infinity as a special point, or do you put the natural boundary conditions? If you put the natural boundary conditions, it becomes the same as, as global De Sitter. OK, we can discuss in more detail. OK, now you could have asked me the following question. You see, in flat space, we don't really know what the UV complete theory of gravity is. So how, how could you prove, how could you make these statements beyond perturbation theory? And I just want to sketch the fact that these statements rely on some weak assumptions that we have to make about the full theory. One of them is that the asymptotic algebra is well defined in the full theory, which comes from the perspective that even in quantum gravity, you should keep the asymptotics fixed. The second is that the vacua are identifiable by charges at the boundary, which in the case of flat space, are charges at the past boundary of future null infinity. This requires very importantly, uh, uh, sorry, uh, identify, this requires very importantly the positivity of energy. And of course, the fact that the Hamiltonian is bounded below in the full theory. Okay? So these are important. And this is also why there's a distinction between gravity and gauge theories. OK, let me tell you how these three assumptions, which are natural assumptions, but which we can't prove in the full theory, uh, lead you to a version of this result that I've been talking about in flat space. OK, so the first assumption I said was that the asymptotic algebra makes sense in the full UV theory. If so, it makes sense to talk about the Hilbert space that one gets by doing asymptotic quantization, which is a Hilbert space that one gets by acting with elements of this asymptotic algebra on the vacuum. And then I'm going to define a subset of this asymptotic algebra, which is the algebra near the past boundary of future null infinity, which is just a span of these operators, but with the retarded time restricted to being between minus infinity and minus 1 over epsilon. The second assumption I made was that the Hamiltonian is bounded below. And if the Hamiltonian is bounded below, that leads uh, to the following result, uh, which is that any state in this, big hill, in this Hilbert space I got, one could get by approximate arbitrarily well by acting with an element of this subalgebra. Notice this result, which is in fact a weak uh, ver version of what's called the riesz leader theorem. Does, is also true in a quantum field theory, because it only really requires the fact that the Hamiltonian is bounded below. What is special in a theory of gravity is that one can identify the vacuum by a boundary operator. Okay? So the following operator exists at infinity, which is the projector on the vacuum. Why does it exist at infinity? Because the Hamiltonian exists at infinity. And the rules of quantum mechanics are if you measure the Hamiltonian, then what you're really measuring by the Born rule are the probabilities of getting you know, its different eigenstates. And each probability is given by taking the expectation value of this projector. So this projector is an observable in this boundary algebra. And this is really a unique property of gravity. The fact that there exists an operator at infinity that can project you down to one state is true in a theory of gravity. It is not true in a gauge theory. Because you know, if you project onto states of zero charge, that's an infinite dimensional manifold of states. 
So this is really a unique property of reference. Just quickly, what is algebra in the asymptotically flat case? What, what, do, what are we including in it? This algebra here just includes, uh, this just comes from including the Bondi mass at, my, at u tends to minus infinity. So if you include the spectral projectors, this is one of its spectral projectors. I'm cheating a little bit because I haven't included here the super translation charges. In our paper, we are very careful to include also the different super translation charges. Uh, here, I just ignore the degeneracy of the vacuum to simplify the presentation and just project it onto states of yeah, zero bondy mass. Yeah. That was my first question. Position. But what about angular momentum information? Uh, no. Angular momentum, we don't, we, we, I mean, we don't need to project onto the vacuum, right? We just project onto zero energy. So you project onto zero energy, that's enough. And then that's it's automatically it. angular that's momentum. Zero. OK, so now, how does that re lead to this result? Well, you know, any element, any operator in this Hilbert space, I can write, I can expand in this basis of states. As I said, every element in this basis I can generate by the action of this element of this asymptotic algebra on the vacuum. This is also, the, this was based on the second assumption about the positivity of the Hamiltonian. What's special about gravity is I can replace the projector on the vacuum uh, with an element of the boundary algebra. And now I really have a linear combination of a product of elements of the boundary algebra. This was a quick proof, uh, but I just wanted to sketch for you how this already shows you that any operator that maps this Hilbert space back to itself can be approximated arbitrarily well by an operator near the past boundary of future null infinity. Okay, okay so now, it's yes. Saying past boundary, but it's really infinite. It's a semi-infinite interval near the past boundary of, of future null. Thank you for that correction. Correct. It's really the interval of retarded time from minus infinity to minus one over epsilon, which is, you can say near the past boundary, but as I correctly points out, it's really a semi-infinite interval. Okay. Uh, now, you know, I've given you various arguments. I've told you what the result of holography of information is. And some of you might still be skeptical, right? You might say, I gave you some physical argument, which was kind of a cartoon, and then I gave you some formal abstract argument, you know, and may maybe, you know, neither of those were very persuasive. So the, now what I want to do is try and show you how you can check this in some very simple examples. Right? Simple example is the following. Uh, here are our friendly astrophysicists who have been given powers to detect uh, fluctuations of the metric, quantum fluctuations of the metric. And here's a bomb that goes off in the middle of space. Uh, and it goes and it hits null infinity at a later time. Okay? So it hits null infinity near the retarded interval 0 to 1. I'm going to model this state. I'm making things simple for myself. This state is modeled by taking with some field at null infinity, maybe some massless field, integrating it with some smearing function f, and just acting with this unitary operator on the vacuum. Now, I've been spending a long time, half an hour, telling you that, you know, I can determine the state, everything from this past boundary. So you could say, well, okay, here's a challenge. Uh, you know, get these, these our, our friends here to make observations in this red region and determine the form of this function f. Okay. Uh, now, to make things simple, I've, you know, they know the state is of this form, and they can also work perturbatively in this parameter lambda. Okay? This is a simple perturbative check. What do they need to do? Well, what they need to do is measure the correlation of the Bondi mass at minus infinity and this field that was used to create this excitation. If you do that, you can just compute what that is. It's a simple two-point computation. If you do that computation, you will fi find the following answer up to order lambda squared. You will find, even though the, the, the excitation itself had support you know, only here, in fact, this was the configuration we were discussing earlier, it's some light ray that comes and hits in the middle of null infinity, this correlator is non-zero even when you put this insertion in this region here. Okay? And this is the value of the correlator. You see, and this, if you just take this and you can measure it at different values in u in the region minus infinity to minus 1 over epsilon, you can extract the different powers in u, and that gives you all the moment of this f. And once you know all the moments of f, you can reconstruct f to as good an accuracy as you like. So this is just a very simple perturbative check if you're skeptical, that shows you how these observers can use information here to measure what's happening here. Let me use this, this toy model to just make, some more, uh, just make some more physical comments. The first point is a question that was already asked, which is, you know, wh how, why doesn't this work in a gauge theory? Well, of course, this idea could not work without gravity. Uh, in a non-gravitational gauge theory, you have local gauge invariant bulk operators. So if I stopped allowing these people to measure the Bondi mass, and they had to only measure you know, things which were non-gravitational, they would have no hope of distinguishing between the vacuum and this unitary operator that acts in the vacuum, 
because this unitary operator you can think of as acting here, it commutes with everything here. So every measurement these people make in a non-gravitational theory in this state is the same as it is in the vacuum. Okay, now you might say, well, what about locality? What happened to locality, right? How did this work? So the point I want to make in this toy model is that this was a linearized calculation, right? It was a very simple calculation. So it can't be there's something complicated and non-local that's happening. In fact, I was cheating a little bit in the figures I was drawing. I was cheating because I showed you this bomb that went off in the middle of space, but of course we know there's no such thing in a theory of gravity. So really you should trace the state back to where it came from on scry minus. And what this is really telling you is that this state that was thrown in from infinity, there were traces of the state that remained out at infinity that one could not erase. You know, every question you have about causality, you could have asked in the classical theory about the Gauss law. How do we know the mass that's inside, right? What, what if someone just changed the mass? And of course the answer is you cannot just change the mass by some local process, you have to send it in from outside. In the classical theory, of course, all we know is the mass. In the quantum theory, I'm saying we know more. But in terms of thinking about questions of locality, if they're confusing, you should always just think of the fact that you have to always send in information from infinity and what I'm emphasizing here is that you can't erase traces at infinity, which you can do uh, you know, in the absence of gravity. Question, yes. Yeah, but of course, there is no single background causal structure there for you to talk about, right? Uh, you're going to be talking eventually about, I mean, your claim is that it's for all non perturbative gravity as well. So th that was the argument I gave you five minutes ago, which was this abstract I algebraic argument. But, but this kind of a thing where you are relying on single background causality structures, right? It, I mean, this is a perturbative check just to show you that it's not just a formal argument, an algebraic argument, which I tried to give you. you see, so I, I, this argument I was making here was a formal argument which relied on some very specific assumptions about the UV theory. Right, I right. This but only I, relied I on the asymptotic structure of the algebra, not on any bulk causal Right, structure. but your claim is that the asymptotic structure is all that's important, even in the full theory, That's right. right. This, this was the so, only so, claim so I used so in proving this result. I used the asymptotic structure in step one. I used the fact that the Hamiltonian was bounded below and the fact that there was a projector. I'm, I'm sorry it went a little fast. Yeah, but that, that was the, 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 the UV argument, the full argument. Now I'm just trying to say, well, you know, you might have thought that was very formal and I, it's not fair to expect you to check all the details here. So here's a simple check in which I'm assuming a background flat space time and just showing you how physical, this is something that has physical manifestations in these simple class of states. Okay, good. So uh, let me now, you know, there's one question which of course you might have. Hey, how am I doing on time? I look like 10, 15. Okay, that's very good. Okay, so now there's one question that, you know, some of you might have which is, you know, how do we get back the usual QFT limit? Right? How, this is, I've been talking about these unusual effects in gravity. Of course, one way to get back the QFT limit is just you know, send uh, a G, you know, G Newton to zero. But in fact, there's a better way you can think of it even in the presence of gravity. And that way is the following. You see, the example I just gave you was some very simple state and I showed you how a two point function could be used to distinguish that. But in fact, if you take a sufficiently complicated state, which is, and you have to distinguish it from infinity, then you can show that you know, distinguishing the state from infinity requires a precision of order e to the minus s, where s is the density of states around that state, okay? So in particular, if you coarse grain observables, and you say, well, you know, the observers at infinity do not really have the ability to measure observables to arbitrary precision, and you introduce a classical observer, by means of which you just introduce a heavy state so that the density of states around it becomes, becomes high, then you can recover ordinary physics in that by which I mean ordinary localization of information to good approximation, you know, to this accuracy e to the minus s. Okay? So it's something, you know, if you, if you take the right limits uh, and the right limits involve, you know, in introducing a classical background uh, and then you can, and, and coarse graining your observables a little bit, if you do that, then you recover the way uh, things we usually think things work. Okay, good. So now, uh, what I've told you so far is that, you know, we have this set of results that we call the holography of information. I showed you some arguments we had to prove them uh, in flat space and, and anti de Sitter space. I indicated how we could do this in de Sitter space. I've given you now a perturbative check of this argument. I told you how you could check this in flat space and perturbation theory. And I told you how you could take the QFT limit. Uh, so in the last uh, 15 minutes that I have, I want to discuss now 
uh, the significance of these observations for black holes. Okay, so of course, uh, we are familiar with the information paradox, and let me remind you quickly. So Hawking found that you know, after you form a black hole, uh, there's pair creation at the horizon, leads to quantum effects, and the picture, the cartoon picture, you should think of it as well, here's a black hole, here's some matter that's falling in, and this pair creation is happening at the horizon, far away from the matter, and it seems to be uncorrelated with the matter that falls in, and as a result, uh, you get Hawking radiation that's uncorrelated with the details of the initial state. That leads to the information paradox, which is of course that if you take one star uh, and it forms a black hole and you take a second star, it forms a second black hole, they're distinct black holes, but they have the same temperature. Then, you know, they would both evaporate to give you the same radiation, but the radiation is uncorrelated with the initial state and so the time evolution arrows cannot be reversed. Uh, and this would be in contradiction with unitarity because unitarity tells us time evolution can always be reversed. Okay, so this is just uh, the simplest phrasing of the information paradox. Okay. Now, of course, these arguments uh, you can frame slightly more precisely in terms of the von Neumann entropy of this, this region at null infinity. In fact, even though we draw things this way, if you really think of the Penrose diagram of an evaporating black hole, it's the same as it would be uh, in, it's the same as the Penrose diagram I was drawing before, which is the Penrose diagram of Minkowski space because the black hole forms and then it evaporates. So it doesn't really change the asymptotic structure. So Hawking said that, you know, you should think of the entropy or people who came after Hawking said, think of the von Neumann entropy of this region of null infinity that goes from U to, to minus infinity. And, you know, these arguments would imply that as the radiation comes out, the derivative of this von Neumann entropy is positive. And this is, of course, a paradox since unitarity implies that the entropy on scry plus should be the same as the entropy on scry minus. If you started with a pure state, you should end up with a pure state. Okay, so now the, 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 the slogan is that, uh, you know, holography of information implies that information about the black hole microstate is always available outside with the right measurements, uh, which is what I've been trying to tell you uh, is true once you look at a theory of gravity and combine it with quantum me mechanical effects. There's a more formal way of saying this, which is that we look at, at the von Neumann entropy of this segment. And you know, as I told you, the von Neumann entropy is trace of rho log rho minus of trace of rho log rho. If you think the von Neumann entropy is ill-defined, I could frame this in terms of the relative entropy. But you look at minus trace of rho log rho, and the way you define the von Neumann entropy is you pick rho from an element of this algebra here. But I've just told you in, in the first part of this talk that any element of this algebra here could be approximated arbitrarily well by an element which was close to the past boundary of future null infinity, by which I mean the semi-infinite interval I was talking about. And if that is the case, that tells you that, you know, trace of rho log rho cannot change because you can always pick as a representative of the density matrix an element of the algebra here. Okay? So that leads you to the conclusion that the von Neumann entropy, in fact, is a constant on future null infinity, and it doesn't change, doesn't increase as time goes along. You might say, well, this contradicts the suggestion that the entropy should rise monotonically. And so, you know, why is it that we find a different result uh, from the result that one would get by following Hawking's analysis? So Hawking found the entropy rises monotonically. We're saying the entropy is a constant based on these results we have about the asymptotic algebra. And where does the difference come from? I think we can pinpoint where the difference comes from. And this is a question of, you know, where is the error in Hawking's argument? Uh, let me first tell you actually where the error in Hawking's argument is not. Even though many people think, and in, we also thought that this was the error in Hawking's argument. You see, Hawking in the actual computation that Hawking did, what he actually computed was low point correlators. He computed the expectation value for the number operator in future null infinity, and he, follow, he found that it followed a certain Boltzmann distribution. Now, you could have used this to conclude that the final state was a thermal state. But this would not have been correct because thermal states can be exponentially close to pure states. This is just a, a true result in statistical mechanics. If you take, take the microcanonical ensemble, that's the same as taking a typical pure state with energy eigenstates in the same band up to corrections that are suppressed by an exponential in the, in the entropy of the system. In the case of black holes, you know, Hawking's calculation was not non-perturbative. So based on this argument, you know, Hawking could not have concluded really that the final state was mixed. Okay? And so uh, even though people think this is a mistake in Hawking's argument, this was not actually what Hawking's argument was. 
Hawking's argument was based on what he called the principle of ignorance. In fact, if one looks at the paper on the breakdown of predictability and gravitational collapse, uh, the point he wants to emphasize the most is what he calls the principle of ignorance, uh, which in fact is sometimes overlooked in later uh, discussions, summaries of his argument. And I'll read out, it's a little small. What Hawking said is, you know, you should introduce a hidden surface about every, each of the black holes, by which he meant, you know, you look at the part of the Cauchy slice, of, you take a nice slice in modern language through the black hole and look at the part of the nice slice that's behind the horizon, and you sh the principle of ignorance then, this is his statement, is tells us that all field configurations on the part of the Cauchy slice behind the horizon are equally probable provided they are compatible with the conservation of mass and angular momentum and other charges that you can measure at infinity. So here he's using the classical intuition. He is recognizing that some information is available outside, but he's saying subject to that because of the causal structure of the space time, you really should trace over the interior. And in fact, he goes on to say, you know, let H1 be the Hilbert space on the slice inside or on the initial surface by which he means cry minus. Let H2 be the Hilbert space of the slice inside. H3 be the Hilbert space of the slice outside. And then he says the basic assumption of quantum theory is that there's a tensor factorization and the outside observer should trace over the space inside. But you see, this is precisely what I've, what I've tried to argue is not true in a theory of gravity. So in particular, there's an assumption that Hawking makes, which is that the Hilbert space factorizes up to a few global constraints, which are imposed by the no hair theorem. These constraints are correct in the classical theory, but this is not the correct picture in the quantum theory. So if somebody asks us, you know, where is the error in Hawking's argument? Why is, there, why is Hawking's argument not correct? I would have pointed to this paragraph and said, in this paragraph, there's an error in Hawking's argument where he assumes the factorization of the Hilbert space and that gravity localizes information like ordinary theories so do. Just to clarify, yes. I, I completely agree with what you said. I mean, that is the error in the uh, argument. I mean, at least that's one of the errors in the argument. Um, but is, it doesn't mean that what you said before is not true. I mean, it is true that the, even if you assume that the thermal, there is a thermal state, yes. uh, it is exponentially, I mean, it's e to the minus s yes. close to a pure state. Yes. So that, it's just that people might think that no, no, you're, you're withdrawing that. No, 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 I'm not withdrawing that. That's certainly true. I just meant that, you know, Hawking had a more sophisticated argument, which was that he said, you know, even if it's not exactly the state I computed, it's still a mixed state because you should trace over the part of the Hilbert space. So, of course, it's true that, you know, a thermal state is exponentially close to a pure state. That is true. But Hawking was saying, even if you say there are small corrections, those small corrections will not fix the problem because you should really trace. And if you trace over part of the Hilbert space, then you'll get a mixed state. Whether that mixed state is exactly what he computed or something different doesn't matter for his point that, that break, you know, predictability breaks down. Okay, good. So uh, let me emphasize once more. You know, when we say that information is available, uh, you know, at outside or at infinity, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that it jumps from inside. Sorry, it should be information available at infinity, not at the horizon. Uh, I, I apologize for this. It doesn't mean that it jumps from inside to outside. Okay? Once again, it just means that one cannot erase traces of information from outside, as I emphasized. It's not that we are postulating some dynamics that says, you know, things somehow jump or there's some, uh, that, that's not what is required. It's really the failure of the split property in gravity. And so this resolution doesn't require non-local dynamics. It doesn't require us to postulate any, any exotic dynamics. It just requires the unusual localization of information, which follows from a careful consideration of the constraints and not by postulating anything exotic or new. Okay, let me, uh, uh, in fact, I'm almost done. So uh, uh, surprisingly done almost on time. Let me just say a few things related to other work uh, in, uh, on, on the information paradox. I should emphasize that there's been a lot of recent work on the computation of the so-called page curve uh, in, in, in the string theory community. Uh, in fact, there is no contradiction between what I'm saying and these computations of the page curve. And that's because the way these compute so the page curve is the statement that the information in the black hole is, is lost first, and then it emerges gradually with, with the radiation. Now, you would have said, well, you know, that's not quite what I said, which is that I said the information is always available outside. And so it seems that there would be a contradiction. But in fact, if one looks at these precise computations that have been done, the way they're done is one takes a black hole in ADS. This is my cartoon. This is the black hole. This blue region is ADS. And then one switches off gravity beyond the, beyond the infinity of ADS. So one glues ADS to flat space. Okay? So, that's, so this is the red boundary. And then this pink region is a non-gravitational bath. 
So this is a slightly non-standard model of gravity where gravity kind of switches off beyond some point. And then the page curve that is computed is the page curve of information transfer across some imaginary interface, which is this dashed line here, okay? So these models always involve a non-gravitational bath. And in this bath, you know, the Hilbert space does factorize. So this is how you can, you can think of this. In fact, you can forget about the gravitational region and replace it with some degrees of freedom on the boundary of ADS. So you can think of the whole system as a non-gravitational system. And the page curve that's been computed is a page curve of information transfer between this part and this part. And of course, you know, in non-gravitational systems, uh, there is a page curve and which can be computed. These are very nice computations because the way the computation is done is by invoking the gravitational theory. So it's really nice that one can do this calculation by using the gravitational theory. And all I would object to is not something, you know, not anything mathematical in the calculations, but the fact that I would object to the terminology that this is computing the page curve of Hawking radiation or computing how information comes out. It's computing really the page curve of information transfer in the non-gravitational bath. In fact, I think this, 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 this picture that I gave you of the holography of information helps to answer some of the criticism that has been made of these page curve computations. And the criticism that has been made by Samir Mathur and Emil Martinek and others is that, you know, this page curve computation suggests that information jumps from the black hole into the bath. But in fact, that's not how you should think of it. The way you should think of it is, remember I told you, first just think of the theory of gravity with some black hole. And the way, as I told you, you know, the information about everything that's inside the black hole is already available at the boundary of this gravitational theory. And then you couple the theory to a bath and information, you know, just flows locally from the boundary of this theory into the non-gravitational bath. So in fact, these, these, these observations about the holography of information help to resolve some of the criticisms that have been made of these page curve computations and point out that they also do not require information to jump from inside the black hole into the bath. Okay. Well, the information is always present at the boundary here. So it doesn't, it's not that it, it vanished from the boundary and then appeared here. So, you know, if you think of it this way, it doesn't require that information has to, has to jump or, you know, was not available and then suddenly became available. That, that's all I want to say. Uh, it's true that information about what's inside is also available outside. Yeah. But, but, okay. Yeah, if you want to Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, so let me summarize. In fact, I'm done, done on time. Uh, so, uh, you know, the main point of this talk was that standard theories of gravity uh, store quantum information very differently uh, from non-gravitational or local quantum field theories. Uh, this is uh, one picture we have in flat space where information on all of null infinity is available near its past boundary. Uh, this is some non-perturbative result eventually that relies on weak assumptions about the ultraviolet complete theory. Uh, I pointed out what those were. But for simple states, for simple states, you can verify this in perturbation theory. So it's not just some abstract argument with no consequences at low energies. It does have consequences that you can verify. I think this sheds light on why gravitational theories are holographic. I should say, you know, this doesn't help us determine what the holographic dual is. It doesn't help us rewrite the degrees of, you know, the bulk dynamics in terms of some other boundary degrees of freedom, but just, you know, explains why it is that such a rewriting might be possible. Okay, accounting for this unusual localization of information, I think it helps to resolve several paradoxes, not just the paradox framed by Hawking, but also other paradoxes that followed it. Conversely, if one forgets about this property of gravity and insists that the Hilbert space should factorize uh, the way it does in non-gravitational theories, uh, then this leads often to paradoxes. Uh, there have been recent computations of a page curve. Uh, these involve always a non-gravitational bath. In such a setting, the Hilbert space does factorize, and so this is a different setting from what we are doing. Uh, and in fact, uh, these, this picture that I presented helps to explain you know, why these computations also work the way they do. Okay, so thank you. I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. Okay, many questions and the order is all. Uh, okay, we uh, go from the row. Okay, maybe we just go in. Yeah, I mean, if you just go back to this argument about the page curve or something, hmm. I, I never understood what the point of this calculation was because it has nothing to do with the physical, physical process, right? Uh, well, uh, I, I mean, uh, it's true that I mean, it's like saying, oh, but I must have page curve. I must have page curve. And how, how, how do I make sense of it? I make sense of it by Im, 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 imposing an artificial past bath 
outside the entire physical space time. And then I can perhaps okay. say something. I mean, it seems completely. OK, I, I, I'll agree with you. I don't, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I agree with you partly. I think what's, what's nice about the computations is that you can compute this entanglement entropy in the non-gravitational bath using the gravitational theory. So it's a little like, you know, how sometimes in, in gravity you can, you can define a conductivity on the boundary. And then you compute the conductivity into using some Kubo's formula and using some gravitational computation. So it's a non-gravitational computation. I agree it's not what we intuitively think of as a page curve, where the information is coming out uh, from a black hole. But it's a page curve of, of the non-gravitational bath, and we can compute it using a gravitational computation. So that's what is nice. But beyond that, I, I sympathize with your perspective, and I'm not the right yeah, person so to do I, justice to these calculations. I, I don't even want to be unfair to the right, authors no, of this. I agree. I, yeah. So I mean, the point is that from gravitational perspective, I mean, yes. you, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at, I don't want to use gravity to understand something which is non-gravitational. I want to understand gravity by itself. And from that perspective, I don't learn anything, I feel. Oh, okay, I, I would sympathize, but I, I'm not the best person to answer this question. <laughs> but I, 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 of course, sympathize with your perspective. But uh, I just make a small comment. Yeah. Actually, Marolf Maxfield have a proposal which doesn't involve bath, but it has complex uh, later at Christ, so we should, maybe, but we should take okay. it up yeah, there. I, I had a lot of correspondence with Marolf, but I'll tell you about that. Okay, but this is, uh, of course, orthogonal entirely to what I wanted to emphasize, yeah. This diagram you have on the left. Yes. Uh, yes. This is how ADS CFT was discovered, by taking the decoupling limit. Uh, yes. Uh, so what is your comment on that? There's no comment on that. That's fine. You can take a decoupling limit where the dynamics decouples. The, so fact, that, the fact that, you know, there's a D brain, yeah. and, and, there's, and, you know, there's some dynamics in the bulk which decouples from some dynamics at infinity, doesn't preclude the fact that if you were to make observations at infinity, those observations would determine what's happening inside. So you know the fact that there's a decoupling limit is not. If does there not is a decoupling, then there is a way to introduce small coupling also, leaky boundary conditions, uh, and that sorry, will you can. That's what they do here. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the calculations. The, these systems have a non-gravitational bath. There is a leaky boundary condition. I'm just telling you conceptually what they are calculating. See conceptually, the, 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 see this is the ADS system. It has leaky boundary conditions. So you have ADS coupled to a bath, right? Now, but you see, because this is ADS goes out to infinity, you can replace this with its CFT dual. So this description on the right is now a fully non-gravitational system. What is the page curve being computed? It's a page curve of one part of the non-gravitational bath with the other part. There might have been a potential contradiction with what I said, because I kept trying to tell you why the Hilbert space doesn't factorize. But this factorization is not carried out in the gravitational region. It's carried out in the non-gravitational region. In the non-gravitational region where gravity is off, the Hilbert space does factorize. So you do this calculation of this with leaky boundary conditions. You do this calculation, and you use the Ryutakinagi formula to do the calculation. So that's fine. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with the calculation. I'm only objecting to the terminology that this is the page curve of Hawking radiation. I'm not objecting to anything actually in the calculation. Okay. That's fine. Uh, yeah. So your examples have all involved space times that have nice boundaries yes. in which there's some fixed structure. Yes. Do you think that there is any hope of extending uh, this kind of analysis to, say, a spatially compact universe that doesn't have a nice fixed asymptotic infinity like to uh, sit or? Uh, oh, a spatially compact universe that doesn't even have you mean one where the Penrose diagram might be singularity, like an FRW, uh, well, something that starts with, ends with a big crunch? Just that doesn't have yeah. fixed boundary it, conditions. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, point, and I, I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, one hope might be that maybe even in such universes, well, uh, we, we would be, I would be completely speculating. We have, I have nothing precise to say about uh, such a setup. It's true that in whatever we do, we somehow rely on, on an asymptotic analysis. Uh, because you know that's what we have control over, even when gravity is, and so an, an asymptotic analysis is very useful. If you take away that crutch from us, it would be much harder for us to make those arguments. Uh, you see, the physics of what we want to emphasize is roughly what's available in a boundary region can be in a bounded region can be obtained from outside. Now that's a cartoon, and to make that precise, we really always have to appeal to asymptotic arguments or to perturbative arguments. Uh, if you take away the asymptotic crutch from us, it's much harder for us to make those arguments. It would be nice. I wish we could make this precise, but right now I have nothing to say beyond pure speculation. Maybe I can tell you in private what the speculations are, but I have nothing very precise to say. Uh, all these considerations that you mentioned, they also apply then for, is it just vacuum gravity or is it gravity plus any matter? Oh yeah, gravity plus any matter. Okay. There, there was no, 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 no restriction on the matter. Oh, for positive energy. Positive energy, thank you. Yes, yes. positive no, but, energy is, was but, important. Uh, 
uh, for what? The flat oh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, yes, Ash Alok is very right. In, so, you know, in the flat space, the results I presented were really results on null infinity. They said everything in null infinity could be squeezed down to its past boundary. Now, but null infinity, in fact, is not a complete description of the algebra because you also need to add future infinity or you also need to add past infinity. In fact, massive particles are well described on future infinity. So we, uh, you know, what I said in flat space, and I should have emphasized that, thank you, uh, does not yet incorporate massive particles, which we'd still like to understand. We have some tentative proposals of how you might understand them as spatial infinity. Uh, but uh, uh, what I said right now is null infinity, which did not include the point of future infinity. This is a very general question. Uh, so my colleague from York, Bernard Kay, has this uh, idea for years of matter, gravity, entanglement as an explanation for uh, the, the black hole information puzzle. So are you, first question, are you aware of that? Do, do you know that work? Uh, no, I don't have anything very precise to say, but. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah, because I thought it might be somewhat connected because, uh, well, he's essentially saying that this relative uh, entropy of say matter, gravity, entanglement um, is the sort of way of capturing the entanglement in full quantum gravity theory. I mean, that's, that's just a proposal, but I thought it would like, connect with what you're saying here. Uh, I, I don't want to say anything wrong, so I'm not sure. Okay, no, uh, that's Because that's I'm also sure. not, uh, not aware yeah. of these proposals, so I don't, uh, you know, let me just say, I did describe at some point in the beginning some entanglement between the matter and the gravitational yeah. sector, which was imposed by the constraints. Mm -hmm. That was really entanglement in a larger unphysical Hilbert space. Mm. So if you think of an unphysical Hilbert space of matter degrees of freedom and gravitational mm -hmm. degrees of freedom, then the constraints pick out for you an entangled mm -hmm. surface yeah. where, uh, which is what satisfies the constraints. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if that is what yeah, no, you're put to I think you should have a look because there might be some connection okay. there. Uh, Thank perhaps, you. Yeah. Uh, uh, we'll just go and see. Okay, so um, just want to follow up on Mark's question because I was having a similar thought that, so if you put matter fields then are you saying that all the information about matter fields in the bulk is also encoded on the boundary? Yes, yes. In fact, in the perturbative example I gave, I had a matter field, uh, which was a massless matter field in flat space. In ADS, we don't need the massless restriction. In flat space, we need the massless restriction because uh, this was, for instance, a matter field. This was not the news operator. You take, let's take massless matter in flat space. This is an excitation of some, one of these matter fields on top of the vacuum. Now the correlator and measuring at infinity is not a correlator of just the gravitational field. Importantly, it's a correlator of the gravitational field and this matter field. So when you, the boundary algebra also has to of course include insertions of this matter field. Right? So, so it, these correlators that will have all information. So, so gravity somehow serves as a carrier of information. Well, uh, so correlators between energy and other observables mm -hmm. uh, help to determine what's happening inside, which is also what you would get if you thought, think back to the original physical intuition I gave of the uncertainty principle and the Gauss law. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, what happens is you have these wave functionals which are delocalized, which are energy wave functionals, you entangle them with energy, and then you superpose them, and you fail to get destructive interference outside. But to see that, you have to measure also the matter field operators and, grav and the energy operators. Not just one. You know, a simple example of how energy cannot know everything is, <coughs> there are arguments that, assume there are two theories, there are two matter fields which are related by a global symmetry. Maybe gravity doesn't have such fields, but assume there are two, two fields which are related by global symmetry. Uh, you see, just measuring the gravitational field outside could never distinguish between two excitations of such fields. So you have to measure the gravitational field and correlators of these other matter fields, and that algebra at infinity does know, but you, you just measure it here. You measure these things here, and that knows what's happening inside. So, so the matter field is out there? The matter field uh, is, uh, that I'm measuring here, this U is here. So the, core, the state F is excited by, by, this is the state F, which is the matter field out here. The two-point function I'm measuring is a Bondi mass and an insertion of the matter field, but in this red region, where U is in, in minus infinity to minus one over epsilon. Like, what is the the integration over x is, this, is the fact that this state here had an integral over x. It was a smeared, it was a, a light ray which had some profile, and the profile function was determined by f. So this function x is retarded time, but this has compact support between zero to one. So now I measure a correlator that's actually at minus infinity, but in the state, even though the state looks like it's localized here, this correlator is non-zero, and this integral is over zero to one, but this u here that appears is between minus infinity to minus one over epsilon. Okay, uh, so you're arguing that the information is localized at the horizon. Yeah. 
Uh, not at the horizon, at, yeah. at infinity. Uh, at infinity. So it's always at infinity. So that doesn't change at all the classical character of the horizon. So an observer would have the same experience yeah. as with a classical black hole. Correct. Uh, it does not change the fact that the horizon is, is information, you know, the horizon is, I mean, it's not like the fuzzball proposal in that I'm not trying to argue that there's something at the horizon. Uh, the horizon is not very important for these arguments because these arguments are made roughly on a Cauchy slice. So the presence of a horizon is not very important to make these arguments. You see, even here you could have said these observers have an effective horizon, which is a little diamond you might have made here. And so they're already looking past the horizon in a sense. I'm not sure what, what your question was. But if your question was, uh, are we saying that something different happens at the horizon, like the fuzzball proposal answer is no. Uh, if the, okay. And yeah, that, that was mainly okay. my question. That's right. There's yeah. not, it's, yeah, it's we're not, not because saying, it's localized that they any, any That's right. So we're not, yeah. and you know, and, and certainly if you look at two point functions or the metric or other simple coarse grained observers, they would look the same at, you know, the horizon is, is an ill defined quantity once you include quantum effect. But you know, if you, if you have some approximate description of what that is, and approximate coarse grained observables we expect would look the same as they do in the classical theory. Yeah. I think I must have missed something, but it sounds like there's some kind of copying of information going on, but there can't be because hey. that's not possible. So Thank you. how can the information be both Thanks. at the horizon and also in the middle. Thank you. So, so, so what's, what's the, thank you for that question. It's a good question. It's the fact that there's really a redundancy in the description. You know, the constraints relate some operators here to some operators here. So if you measure the information here, it ceases to exist I inside. So, you know, the constraints relate, so uh, maybe it's clearer in this argument. You know, this is really an operator equivalent. So there's some observable you can measure. And that observe, you, so what's happening is that you, you would have thought that there were independent local operators in this region and independent local operators outside. And measuring those operators doesn't change what's happening here. But the constraint tells you that that's not the structure of the algebra. Rather, it relates what you thought of as operators in this region to some operators elsewhere. And so there is, it's not like it's violating the no cloning theorem, but rather it's relating one set of operators to another set of operators. You have to identify those operators. I think she has a, a follow-up question, yeah. Can you then ex sort of talk us through what happens if the external measurements are made and there's someone, as Eleni says, who's actually inside the black hole? Right. What hap I mean, what, whether or not the, the measurement of at infinity is made yes. Yes. cannot surely influence what the, the measurements inside the, the, the observations being made by the observer inside Sorry, can or cannot do. Why, why cannot it? Cannot relies on some assumption that the, that the observations inside that there's some microcausality and the operators inside are independent of the operators outside. Let me give you a very simple example of this. Let's say you, you measure the energy. You know, just imagine we have empty space and I measure the energy which I can measure at infinity. If I measure the energy, then I, you know, I here am a superposition of different energy eigenstates, and by measuring the energy, I already collapse to one of those. That affects what I'm doing here. So if I could really make that measurement out at infinity, which I point out is some coordinated measurement that you have to make on all of infinity. So it's a very complicated operation. But if you can do that very complicated operation, then it does affect what's happening in the bulk. And in fact, this is exactly also how things work in ADS-CFT. So it shouldn't be surprising because in ADS-CFT, you know, you make a measurement at infinity and you can measure what's, you, you do determine what's happening inside. I think she has a follow-up. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we should save this for the discussion yeah, for the session. discussion, maybe. Yeah. You, so, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a, yeah. Is there Just like to come back on it, but. Yeah, but please do, but, okay. Oh. But we have a, we have a discussion. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We have a, we have okay. a hard cut off right Fine, now. okay. So let's thank you once again. And Thanks. Okay, fine. How much time? <laughs> 20 minutes. 20 minutes.